Constellation is sponsored by Vessi and their high-quality, waterproof, and versatile footwear for the active among us. With around a dozen individual styles for men, women, and children alike, Vessi has you covered from head to toe with dry, cool, stylish comfort. Ready to embark on the ultimate summer adventure? Visit Vessi.com slash Constellation today. That's V-E-S-S-I dot com slash C-O-N-S-T-E-L-L-A-T-I-O-N to find the perfect blend of style and practicality in shoes made for your life. When you do, you'll enjoy an instant 15% discount on your first order at checkout. Again, head to Vessi.com slash Constellation for waterproof, high-quality, versatile footwear. Constellation is sponsored by Raycon's exceptional everyday earbuds, which I unironically use every day. Go to buyraycon.com slash Constellation today. That's B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N dot com slash C-O-N-S-T-E-L-L-A-T-I-O-N to get 20% off your Raycon order right now with free shipping. That's right. You'll get 20% off and free shipping at buyraycon.com slash constellation. Again, for Raycon's exceptional, affordable, and high quality everyday earbuds, head to buyraycon.com slash constellation today. Constellation, Last Stand Media's conversational podcast is brought to you by you. If you want to learn how to support our podcast network, head to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Oh, hi. You weren't expecting that. Welcome back to Constellation, Last Stand Media's conversational podcast. Aren't they all, though? Yeah. Well, we'll workshop that and other things. I am your host, Dagan. Some people call me Maurice Moriarty. And today, Dad has left us the keys to the vintage Ferrari, and I will be damned if we aren't taking this puppy for a joyride. But first, I'd like to introduce you to my partners in crime, my co-conspirators. Guys, we're blowing off school. We're hitting the town in style. First and foremost, it was all her idea. Mama Micah, how are you today? I'm very well, thanks. You certainly caught me off guard with the greeting. That was great. Yeah, I was surprised. Uh, I thought of you, Dagan, because every day I get emails from this website called Taste of Home, and they send you a, a recipe of the day. The recipe of the day, though, Dagan, it wasn't meatloaf. It was ham loaf. Oh, my. And so it's taking ham and ground pork and you put it in a food processor to mix it together with like milk and breadcrumbs. You're basing you're making a meatloaf, but out of ham. Different and I meat. had to ask, is this worse, Dagan, or better? It's just a loaf of meat. I'm not, it could be like top sir. Like this could be made of like top filet. It's just the fact that it's grinded up. It's a giant hamburger. I guess a hamburger is not so disgusting on a small scale, but <laughs> the giant, there's just something about the giant hamburger and then not shrouded by the bun or the toppings, it's just out there, just this big chunk of quivering meat. <laughs> it's just <laughs> like, I'm not sure the meat matters. I think it sounds like it would taste good. I just don't want to look at it. You know, it's no, the it presentation. I, I'm a meatloaf person, and I have to say this ham loaf email didn't look great. No. And I love meatloaf, but I was like, this, even for me, ham's like one of my like top five favorite foods. But I was like, this is not looking great. This is not something I'd serve to people. I, I mean, it just, you'd bring that out on the platter, they'd be like, what'd you find this thing? Like, no thanks. <laughs> I feel like all that stuff was like invented in the 50s and it's Absolutely. pretty incredible right like what was acceptable and it was just like as long as it was inventive and something new it was it was completely kind of acceptable in that era which is really strange but i like the fact that you found there's like there's a limit even for mama micah like th this <laughs> is a bridge too far even for me like this is this is this is going too far you know um but again, I think that stuff tastes fine. Like my mom, I always feel bad talking shit on meatloaf because I primarily, of course, grew up eating my mom's meatloaf and she made it pretty frequently. And it's not that it, it didn't taste fine. Like she was a good cook, tasted fine probably. It was just looking at that mound of meat on the plate. There's no way to make that look <laughs> appetizing for me. I think I can't get past that, you know, with the meatloaf, but 
Yeah. So that's uh, that. You got to send me that, Mike. I'm, I'm interested. I just want to see what <laughs> what I'm already assuming is pretty pretty offensive appearance. No, I'll I'll send that over, but I'm I'll send it to Helene. And then if you guys are having a tiff someday, you're going to come home and it's like, it's ham loaf night. I'll let her, you know, (laughs) be the judge with that. That's going to (laughs) happen soon. I've been getting so on this woman's nerves lately. It's like, you know, you could see when you've been married for so long, it's just, it it ebbs and flows, but for, it's like, I'm in that. And you know, it's, it's completely my fault. I'm a pain in the neck, you know, but yeah, we're in that mode of like every little thing I do is aggravating to her and it's understandable. So I can't really argue about it but i just i'm just trying to get pet like what do i do i don't know is it is it the is it flowers do i just resort to the old school thing box of chalk i don't know i don't know but we'll see i'll keep you guys posted on the marriage <laughs> 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 i'm sure she's glad she's not she's relieved of me for the next four hours let's put it that way let's put it that way my friends next listen he helps to find duke each and every week with that signature smile the dulcet tones of that one-of-a-kind voice and that essential New York swagger, Lord Cognito. Welcome back to Constellation, my friend. Good to be back. Good to be back. It's funny um, seeing all of you. Mike, I didn't get a chance to really talk to you much at the live event. <laughs> I know. I, just, I realized, I was like, I remember you, you know, you're kind of doing your thing with the merch and stuff. You're on the other side. And outside of a few pictures that we took together with a lot of the community, I was like, I didn't get a chance. Dang it, we had our moment. I felt we did. We had a good moment. Gene, we had a few moments, obviously. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We did. We did. <laughs> yeah, man. Gene had I me probably spent the, the most time with you, uh, actually, yes. at the live show, if anything. Yeah, we had the most time together. So that was dope. That was good to be here. Obviously, I love Steli and the conversations that naturally flow. As a result of it, the topics are looking really good. I'm yeah. excited. So, yeah, good to be part of this. And, and for the record, y'all can't keep me and Micah apart. Y'all been trying to shut us mm. down. And it's the first one we got together as LSM fam putting us together. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. There's something special. There's just something special brewing about this group. I don't know what it is. It's just, it's all love. It's, it's, all all, it's love. always all love, but it's like all love, all caps. Yes. This one. You know what I mean? It really is. And listen. Finally, we've all heard that expression, a man who needs no introduction. But how often do you really mean it with every fiber of your being? Ladies and gents, a guy for which a man who needs no introduction just doesn't quite cut it, honestly. The legend. Gene Park, everybody. Pagan, you're 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 starting to sound like cog in, in in his introductions right because lord carnito <laughs> and our podcast like he he announces his guests with the fervor of a pro wrestler uh, uh, announcer right the best um, i'm modeling myself after the best yeah 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 yeah. so, so, so you, you got like a more low-key version go, uh, going on right now but yeah good to see everyone here this is a great set of topics uh i'm actually pretty excited to talk about all four topics uh, it's pretty. It's actually pretty interesting. Um, and yeah, it was. Good, it's good to see everybody. I I actually didn't get a chance to spend a lot of time with people at the live show. Actually, mm. you know, the, the Dustin and Ben probably the most. Uh, but you know, probably Ben because he he was the guy who was kind of shepherding the whole thing, and none of us really knew what the hell was going on. So I was just like, Ben, what's going on? You know. <laughs> and Micah, I keep forgetting to grab a T-shirt. I, I it's it's like it's like I don't work at this company. <laughs> Oh, I mean, just send me an email. And we'll I know, I know, but, but I'm never sending you an email. I'm never visiting Richmond. I'm, I'm never <laughs> grabbing a shirt when I'm there physically seeing you. It sucks. And like, it also sucks, as, uh, and I said in the Discord, I actually didn't get to take a lot of pictures with everyone. So thanks for thanks for all the listeners sharing in the New York Discord channel. A lot of great mm. photos. Um, mm. And I'm looking forward to the official photos coming out too. That should be yes. fun. Yeah, be, yeah they be, should I'll, be beautiful. I'll, I'm waiting to say. I'm waiting for my post to say to to post those because I'm, I'm I want us to look in the best possible light instead of these these blurry greasy photos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they'll do for now until the until the real ones come in. And what you know what there, Gene? You make a good point about this live show. I've done a few. There was a slight chaotic energy to this one mm-hmm. that was fun. But very different than the two or three that I already did, which was which was kind of cool. And I think a lot of that was because we were foisting this surprise on the on the sacred dudes, right? Mm-hmm. Like they didn't really know it was in store. Yeah. So there was that element of a little bit of improv to it, which I thought yeah, was kind of yeah, yeah. neat. 
Yeah, exactly. Right? So I think it speaks to the talents of the boys. And mm. I guess maybe all of us, I guess. Let's give us a little credit. Speak to the talents of all of us. To, and, you guys you know, killed Especially it. Brad, too. I mean, you know. Colin yeah. yeah, Brad did good. But yeah. uh, Brad is a natural entertainer. So Yes, I, he is. I, I, I was really, really impressed with everything the, despite the fact that it, everything really was we were just flying by the seat of the pants nothing was scripted mm-hmm. other than the fact they were having sacred jeopardy and we we made up those questions that's about it mm-hmm. you know yeah and you guys all killed it in that spirit really honestly it couldn't have it couldn't have been any better i that you said it i mean everybody is such a pure entertainer i always talk about cog and i talk about chris and kyle too like he's just he just snaps into this other mode of Mm -hmm. you know like consummate professional and Mm -hmm. thoroughly entertaining and there's an appeal there and a likability to everybody but yeah the fact that it wasn't scripted the fact that it was a little bit of that going by the seat of your pants it was so much it was so much fun and it just it seems so real and the fact that everybody could everybody there could handle that Brad was like, I, I was stunned for, you know what the thing is about Brad? And I'll say this about Micah too, Gene, Chris, the, re, the younger cats, right? Maddie, same. They're so, they're already so in tune to that professionalism and everything they bring, the humor and the expertise and the likability. It's, it's like insane. Like I definitely didn't have that at that age, you know? And um, yeah, it's, it was, uh, I was proud. I was it's proud probably, of each and every. It's probably a byproduct of the fact that so many of us are, are, are growing up to be to have to perform on social media. You know, uh, you know, at what? my That's age, you know, you call me young, thank you, Dagan. But yeah, even at my, <laughs> even at my my fairly old age, right? Uh, I still grew up in 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 the age of social media, where I'm like performing for photos, and you know, like I perform for Instagram. You know, my life. Is not quite what it looked like on Instagram, you know. Um, so there's always, you know, Andy Warhol was 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 wrong. We're we're all getting way more than 15 minutes of fame, you know. But the spirit of what he said was correct, you know. That's a great point and performative, but all all you guys to a person performative but real. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? There's nothing put on. Yeah. There's yeah, no yeah. airs. There's nothing really. fake about it. Yeah, I think know? I think that's why we're all together because because if we were fake, then we probably wouldn't we probably wouldn't work yeah. quite sure. as, as the last stand media operation you know because you all trust us out there so absolutely yeah. so Kyle, yep. <laughs> it's unbelievable kyle's put together quite the squad i would say the a team but it's more people Vult- the voltron force but but you know it just has to be more people oceans it's oceans 11 right i don't know if there's 11 of us but it's like an oceans thing everybody's got their own mm-hmm. thing everybody's a little different but cohesive as a team mm-hmm. And as a family, yeah, I mean, it's pretty special, man. I mean, it's a lot of, uh, it sounds like I'm doing a lot of lip service right now, but when you see everybody together in the same room and the audience's yeah. appreciation, that's yeah, when it comes gonna, full circle and it, yeah, it gonna, really registers. You guys are going to love the live video, go. for sure. Yeah, yeah. it's just, yeah, it's just live good video shit. Be fun. But you're right, yeah. that day went so fast. I didn't get to spend nearly enough time with everybody. Name a person. Mm-hmm. I didn't, it's like I would have liked to spend another hour with insert person here. That's the yeah, thing. Yeah, I, those days I still haven't so really spent a lot of time with Colin, so it's like, I, like I was just thinking last night. I was like, you know what? I should just stop by Richmond and just like spend time with Colin and Mike. Just absolutely, like, really, just, you just should have a sit Colin. down, you know, just smoke a bowl and just just hang out, you know, eat some sandwiches. Hell yeah, you know? dog! Right? Get some angel dust, you know, really get nasty <laughs> with it. <laughs> Are you, are you gonna be like tra- training day on me and Denzel? <laughs> Come on, Rook! <laughs> oh my God, that's all training day. Mike is looking at me like Gene. I didn't know you like to get wet. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you like to get wet, Gene. Fuck! <laughs> there we go. I wasn't you know what, a training day reference. I only know this from memes. I've never seen it. But I'm very familiar because I've seen many memes about training that. Day? Scene. Oh, you should watch so, Training Day, man. This is what oh, I love about the internet, though, because like yeah. I'm up to speed. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, it. no. You're you're a meme lord, but you should watch Training Day. <laughs> training Day is a good movie. Yeah, you guys, it's so good, good my God. Yeah. yeah, it's a mm-hmm. it's a classic. It's the one that Denzel won Best Actor for. You know. Mm-hmm. Oh, dude. I I don't know if I I've, I've probably only seen like one Denzel Washington movie. Which one? I'd have to. Oh. Was he in Remember the Titans? Yes. 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 That's the one. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the only one I've ever that's seen. Watch Training Day. This is, a, this is a different side of him that, you, that you'll see. Ooh. He's fantastic. I, also, I think he was in Deja Vu. 
which was a mm-hmm. movie. Of, I don't even know if that's a well-remembered movie. I saw part of it in theaters, got really spooked. My mom took me out of the theater. And like, it was one of those, it was one of those days where like, we thought I could watch the PG-13 movie. I wasn't ready. <laughs> My mom ended up taking me out of the theater because I was having a time. I got to uh, see, I don't I, know this the whole thing. Oh, I think that's what it's called. And I think he's in it, but I, I watched right. like the first half hour, got real scared. Didn't, you know, noped out of that. I think we went to see something else was playing. It was like some Christmas movie playing instead. And we went to just, we just were like the theater guy was like, it's okay. And just let us in because we already paid for tickets. Nice. And he just let us go into the other theater instead. Okay. You might not be ready for training day. Thanks. <laughs> that's that's what I was about to say. Yeah. He's pretty Dr. scary. Dr. 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 Dre is in it too, so. Mm-hmm. Oh really? Yeah, well, now really. I definitely want to yeah, see Dr. it. Dre, I'm an adult now. Doctor Dre yeah, and pretty... Snoop Dogg are both in it. So. Yes, that's yes. right. Wow. Yeah. Snoop wow. Dogg in a wheelchair. Wheelchair yeah, Snoop, Snoop Dogg. Dogg. And <laughs> well, I wasn't start expecting with Man that. on Fire, yeah. Micah. You go Man on Fire. Man he's kind of scary great. in that, but he's a good guy. Yeah. Then you go. Then you take it up to uh, to the next level of Denzel, which is Training Day. And mm. yeah, Do you want to feel bad for Ethan Hawke? Watch Training Day. Yeah. You, that'll make you feel bad for Ethan Hawke all day. King Kong ain't got Gosh. nothing on us. Oh, me. <laughs> mm-hmm. There we go. Man, I, I, man that, I used to say that to people, you know? Like, like that's, how, that's how big my ego can be sometimes, you know? Like, I used to oh, say you were that, saying like, it unironically. Say, uh, unironically to people. I would get so <laughs> drunk and so full of myself and just feel myself so much, and I'll be like, King Kong ain't got shit on me. For what? I don't that know. Is- why? why? Why was I saying it? I don't know. You know? I love it. I love it. I love. I love. G- I love. Not only do I love that you s- used to say that, but I love that you're you're admitting it right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's Gene. That's yeah. that's the legend. Yeah, Gene Park, ladies I, and gentlemen. I am now, in listen. all of my own ego sometimes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Constellation is sponsored by Vessi and their high quality, waterproof, and versatile footwear for the active among us. Learn more now at vessicom slash constellation. That's V E S S I, and get fifteen percent off your first order. So we joke around on our various shows quite often about how I'm a shut-in, but that's not really true. Okay, so I don't socialize much, guilty as charged, but I'm actually outside all the time, working in the yard, walking the dogs, roaming around the neighborhood with my wife, bumming around our pool, and so on, and this has always been the case. I love being outdoors, in the woods or on the beach or just here in the suburbs, and good footwear is always key. Vessi's waterproof shoes are great for people like me, and with summer around the corner, I'm going to be out and about more than ever. I can't wait to try my Vessi Everyday Classic or Weekend-style sneakers while mowing the lawn, cleaning the pool, weeding the garden. You know, situations where you want to stay dry, cool, and comfortable. But I also think back to my years in California, where I often hiked around San Mateo State Park or traveled up to Tahoe to take in the sights. Vessi's Stormburst Low Tops likely would be ideal for those situations if only I had known then what I know now. And if I had them during my childhood and teen days back on Long Island, well, I admit beach and boat days would have been markedly different. But alas, now we know. With around a dozen individual styles for men, women, and children alike, and with other items available too, like socks, hats, gloves, backpacks, jackets, and so on, Vessi has you covered from head to toe with dry, cool, stylish comfort. Ready to embark on the ultimate summer adventure? Visit Vessi.com slash Constellation today. That's V-E-S-S-I dot com slash C-O-N-S-T-E-L-L-A-T-I-O-N to find the perfect blend of style and practicality in shoes made for your life. When you do, you'll enjoy an instant 15% discount on your first order at checkout. Again, head to Vessi.com slash Constellation for waterproof, high-quality, versatile footwear. Constellation is sponsored by Raycon's exceptional everyday earbuds, which I unironically use every day. Learn more now at buyraycon.com slash Constellation for 20% off your order and free shipping. So I was looking for a new pair of earbuds to wear, and I needed something special. That's because I have a bunch of piercings in my ears, and uncustomizable, one-size-fits-all products are simply not going to work for me. But then Raycon's Everyday Earbuds came into my life, and they were exactly what I was looking for. With gel tips that conform to many kinds of ears, my earring conundrum was quickly overcome. But then I started falling in love with other aspects of Raycon's design. There are customizable sound profiles, tap functionality, solid noise isolation, and a useful awareness mode. And the buds are kept in a stylish, tiny black case. Battery life is rock solid at 8 hours of use, with 32 hours of juice in total. And perhaps the most attractive thing of all with my Raycon Everyday Earbuds is that they're about half the price of other premium brands. You can't really argue with all that now, can you? 
Whether I'm bopping around the house or the yard, walking the dogs or working, my Raycon Everyday Earbuds have provided welcome sonic accompaniment that I am more than happy to recommend to all of you, our dear listeners. I use them every day. Price, functionality, comfort, Raycon has it all. So why not grab a pair of Everyday Earbuds for yourself so you can see what all the rage is? Go to buyraycon.com slash constellation today. That's B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N dot com slash C-O-N-S-T-E-L-L-A-T-I-O-N to get 20% off your Raycon order right now with free shipping. That's right. You'll get 20% off and free shipping at buyraycon.com slash constellation. Again, for Raycon's exceptional, affordable, and high quality everyday earbuds, head to buyraycon.com slash constellation today. We all got to have a little bit of that ego. You know what I mean? Sometimes, you know, with Gene, I'll say, I know I'm biased, but I think it's well-deserved. I think you're entitled. I think you're entitled. I sure feel now like- Now listen, <laughs> Cog, I want to, I was, I was wondering where to start because everybody's topic is so fun this week, but I, I want to start with Cog because Cog might have, uh, might have to vacate the premises early. Duty calls, he may have to leave midstream. So I want to make sure we cover Cog's topic. I know I have a lot to say about this one. So, Cog, I turn it over to you to kick, you know, kick over the first topic and, and start the show for us and um, take it away when you're ready. Yeah, this one is near and dear to me because it's actually very recent. You know, obviously talked about going four days traveling the packs and then, you know, right into the live show for Sega 300. Then after that, I'm playing tourism for Addict and his girlfriend showing mm. them New York. So all this running around wore me down <laughs> and I started to get a little bit of the flu. Mm. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, all right, you feel a little sore throat coming. You feel a little fever, a little chills, something coming on. And I just started to think about like sickness rituals and things that we do when we feel something coming on or just our routines that give us comfort. You know, for me, I have a couple like there's like the tried and true like if I got the chills, I feel a fever coming on. I'll bundle up. I'll get the hoodie. I'll get the sweats. Um, you know, from like a food standpoint, it's like the chicken noodle soup, the the cream of chicken, that kind of thing. Old school. My mom used to forgive me Vicks vapor rub. Oh. <laughs> that was like a a, a go to move, especially for the sinus. And you put a little hair under the nose and all this other stuff, and by the neck and the throat. So I used to do that. And then um, another one that's really good for me. What upset stomach was the old school ginger ale. That old mm. that's when soda was very big in the house. Like I, she didn't like me to have it, but that was when soda was okay. It was like, oh, you could get something carbonated, settle your stomach. So those were a couple for mine, you know, that I carry for mom now that I'm, you know, to myself, to my own place and things like that. But I was curious about you. So I just want to start with Mike. I'm curious about Micah's sickness rituals and things she does to provide comfort during these dark times i don't know if i'm ready for, i don't know if i'm ready for this this is some, some weird, some weird i know mike is some, some off the wall shit man yeah i want to know what mike it, it, the socks have anything to do with it. brace yourselves everybody brace yourselves right now. let's go mike yeah. what, what we doing when we, when we sick well, I got to start with, of course, the Black Mom classic of, oh, you have like the slightest rumble in your tummy, have some ginger ale, it's got to be Canada Dry, and go lay down. It's the combination. You got to go lay down. Yeah, it, but that I don't get sick very often. And I don't mean that as a flex. I'm very lucky, knock mm. on wood. But in my life, I typically, as an adult, get sick maybe every three to four years. And so this is timely, though, because I was recently sick for the first time in several years. And it, immediately you get the tickle in the throat, hot cup of tea. That's like number one. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I got to try and fight this off. We're going to have a hot cup of tea in my mind. It's going to prevent everything. It doesn't. But it's very soothing. Honey, number one. Mm -hmm. I love honey to the point that I have to tell myself not to just eat it because it's just so delicious. So I would just be sucking it straight out of the bottle like a bear. <laughs> and so I have, I put some honey in the tea. I always have a spoonful for myself. It's, you know, it coats your throat a little bit. It's soothing, but th that's where it always starts. If I feel worse than that, then we have like a major problem because that's very rare. And when I got sick at like the end of February, Colin and I both were sick and it was like, all right, I don't have anything in the house for like medicine, cough syrup, nothing because we're so rarely ill. So all we had, like we both had fevers and all I had was a leave 
which works, but uh, much slower than Tylenol. But yeah. I always have a leave on hand because that's like the best for back pain, right? For yes, me. Yes. And so I'm like, okay, we're screwed. I ended up like door dashing some ibuprofen instead and like just getting something that would work a little bit faster. But it, it always starts with tea. All right. I follow the rules. You guys, you might expect some crazy stuff here, but I follow mm. the rules of congestion, you, no dairy, no Ooh. tomato products. All right. I'm, I'm by the book with that stuff. Like okay. that was always my mom's approach was like not making it worse. So some of the okay. stuff being outdated, like, oh, you're not supposed to have dairy when you have a fever. I don't think that's true anymore, but you shouldn't have dairy when you're congested. So I always follow that rule. No dairy, no tomatoes, you know, um, orange juice, you know, is good for some things, but some people might make them feel more congested. Some people it helps type deal. Mm. I, I'm just, I try to follow the rules, but you, when you're chilly, like fever, chills, yeah. it is, it's like bundle, bundle up, up socks, you know, all the whole deal, but they're not wet socks. Even, <laughs> even at my sickest, I don't think, it, but I got to tell you, I took my dog to the vet on Wednesday and immediately like stepped in a puddle that was like way deeper than I thought it was. And the socks immediately saturated. I had to deal with it. Mm. I had to just deal with it. I'm at the vet's office for an hour. My <laughs> socks are soaked, but I was very zen about it. You know, in the moment, mm. it brought me great peace and calm. But yeah, being sick, I try to avoid taking like cough medicine because I hate how NyQuil makes me feel. For example, mm. I my parents never had to worry about me doing drugs because I didn't like them. So mm. like they'd give me NyQuil and I was like, I don't like that. It makes me sleepy. They gave me Percocet when I got my wisdom teeth out and I didn't like it. I was like, wow. no, I don't like how this makes mm. me feel. I took one of them and I threw the rest away. Wow. <laughs> Did you really? And I was like, I don't like this wow. one bit. These are Ugh. gross. So my parents really didn't worry much about me because I was just such a wuss. I didn't like anything. But I don't keep hardly anything in the house, really. And I started to panic when Colin and I were like, we're very sick. You know, I was the first time in years I had had like an actual fever, the chills, the whole nine yards. And I was like, oh my God, we weren't prepared by any means for this. <laughs> but yeah, those those basics of soup. Of course, we ate a lot of soup mm -hmm. those couple days. Thank God we just gone to like BJ's and bought a case of Campbell's chicken noodle soup mm -hmm. because I was way too uh, tired to make anything. But the, you mentioned the Vicks Vapo Rub. My favorite was the Vicks Vapo Inhaler, mm -hmm. which I bought one for the first time in years. And man, that's the good stuff. And if you guys aren't familiar, it's basically like a cotton ball you soaked with menthol in this tube that you stick in your nose and inhale. And it is delightful. It just really opens oh, wow. up the airways. It's such a nostalgic scent because we had it when I was a kid. They're really expensive now, though. They're oh, like yeah. $10 for a two pack. Oh, I mean, they weren't that much back mm. then, but that is my sickness absolute must have is the mm. Vicks Vapo inhaler yes. because you just, it's not medicated. You can use as much as you want. All right. Mm -hmm. that, that's my absolute favorite thing. It's just, oh, it's, it oh, smells yeah. so good. It's yeah. Really for your body, right? Oh, it's yeah. like, I remember that first time that my, pa I, I wasn't a big Vapo rub guy, but I remember my mom or my grandma putting it on me when I was a kid and being like, oh, this is like Wrigley spearmint gum, but for like the outside of your body. Yes. Like I didn't, I didn't dig it. Like it just felt weird. <laughs> and then I remember when I started smoking in my early twenties and the menthol cigarettes were in the offing, you know, trying one of those and just automatically reminding me of that. And it'd be completely put off by menthol oh you never like menthol like, interesting not a big menthol guy interesting. oh no i loved the vapo rub my mom though would put it on our feet and then put our socks on did mm. that actually do anything oh, i don't know that's interesting that sounds like that it feels so the, good though actually though that, that, that was like a good her, idea <laughs> yeah her like old timey you know ideas of like oh no this is what we did when i was a kid and you put the mm. vapo rub on the bottom of your feet <laughs> mm. and then put socks on the only like the real pro to that was that it wasn't so greasy, like on your chest, for example, because mm -hmm. vapor rub works really good. But then like you put your shirt back on or the blanket and it's all gross, mm -hmm. you know, you're sticking to everything. <laughs> so it's Blimey. like you either wear like the vapor rub, like mustache, which yep. was acceptable. Or my mom would be like, you put it on the bottom of your feet. We never did, though. Are you guys familiar with the home remedy of putting onions in your socks? When I've you're heard sick? of this. I have a friend who swears by it, what but it I have do? never tried it. It's like a talk thing to absorb the toxins away. Is That's that... what they say. Okay. You know, and they're like, put the onions in your socks yeah. at night and in the morning, you'll feel better. I would never waste an onion on such an endeavor, but 
it intrigues me, but I have never tried this. It just... <laughs> It, it sounds too far, right? It, it sounds like actual witchcraft. And if it does work, I'd be afraid of it. Like, well, if I like it that worked, you're citing I'd be onion afraid. conservation. Yeah. Well, yeah. You're citing, it's very Micah to cite, like, I don't want to waste an onion, but most people would be like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to reek. You know, I don't want the bed to reek. <laughs> I don't want to waste, I don't want to waste that good Vidalia on my. <laughs> I mean, so we go through a lot of onions in this house. Mm. I chopped up three of them last night for dinner. So we, we're onion people. But there was also a point in time <laughs> in which Colin and I discovered the everything bagel seasoning that you can just buy in a jar. Oh, that's good stuff. Oh, well, and yeah. for a while, he was putting it on like on everything. OK, but there was one day that he worked out in the gym. And then he left the gym and we were just like, it smells like everything bagel seasoning in there. Like it's, you're sweating it out. And he stopped eating the seasoning oh, after that. Cool. He was like, I can't smell like this. I didn't know. I was like, well, you don't smell like it all the time. I don't think. It just but comes out of your pores. Yeah. yeah. It became a self-conscious point of like, well, we can't be going to CVS and this man just reeks of a bagel shop. So <laughs> we stopped buying it after that and we don't use it very much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny to me about this before I t kick it over to Gene? I think both of you guys mentioned the mm. orange juice thing, yeah. which was always funny to me. Like people like get sick with the flu, pound orange juice. It's like it's too late. The vitamin C is supposed to be prohibitive. What, you know what I mean? You should have drank the orange juice two weeks ago. You wouldn't be in this situation. You know what I mean? <laughs> like it's just like, but, it, but it, it's like, it's kind of like the soup thing. It's just a comfort thing at that mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. And the vitamin C and can't hurt. Can't hurt. It, it is orange juice is supposed to help with thinning mucus if you okay. are really congested but it makes it worse if you have a runny nose is where people say oh orange juice makes me feel worse that's where it's kind of like you gotta know how sick you are what type of sickness you got because aside from it just being comforting and it's just maybe like when your senses are a little bit dull like i hate losing my sense of taste with a cold but it's like oh. orange juice you can you can fucking taste that oh. <laughs> all right like yeah. you maybe you can't taste peanut butter the way you could before but orange juice there's no there's no ignoring orange juice that's a like good that point. flavor is up front and very present yeah yeah that's a that yeah for, oh for sure it's distinctive nothing else like it micah now you snuck one thing in i can't i can't let this one go you mentioned briefly tomato not a good idea yes. tell, tell me about this so i mean i'm no expert but if you Google like foods to avoid when sick tomatoes usually come up i think it's the histamine response is what you're not supposed to eat tomatoes because it can make you more congested, increase like mucus production, whatever. So that's just a default of avoiding pasta sauce, all those type of things oh. when sick. Because actually the day that Colin came down with the cold or whatever we had, I was planning on making, you know, sausage and red sauce. And I was like, pivot, we're not having that. We'll have that in a couple of days instead because it's just going to make you feel worse, you know, on, on top of it just being really heavy food for when you're sick. But every I was like, everything on Google says avoid tomatoes and anything tomato producty. So that's one that we pivot away from. But I mean, we, we eat a lot of pasta sauce around here. Yeah, I mean, so that, That's not easy to give up. Yeah, that's a that's a hard one. The tomato, fresh tomato. Yeah, you could go without it. But the oh, yeah, never, pasta sauce, never yeah. eat a fresh tomato. Who wants that? <laughs> That's like Helene. It completely skeeves her out. Mushrooms and fresh tomatoes. She just won't. She, she can't do Interesting. it. Interesting. I hate and fresh tomatoes, but but I love mushrooms though. Mush. So. Me too. Yeah. Same. Mushrooms. Yeah. I can deal with. I don't know why. Yeah. Me too. I mean, they're all. Gene, what do you I can I can get why they're gross, but yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. They have that slimy bit. Like the outside of the tomato is fine, but it has that slimy sort of gel inside. I hate, I, yeah, it's just not it's good. Just, 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 I hate jelly in general. So just like the gel, gelatinous <laughs> feeling of <laughs> tomato, I can't deal with. Tomatoes <laughs> crushed up, even diced or whatever. I, I love it. Diced tomatoes, yeah, fine, love them. Yeah. But like like a, a tom tomato slice. Ugh. Ugh, exactly. Same. Yeah, that's the line for me. Ugh. I like fresh salsa or like fresh mm. pico. pico. So, like when I make when yeah. I make salsa at home, it skeeves me out a little bit. Like there is a point when I'm making salsa of like don't think about it, don't think about it because <laughs> so and then funny. I put it in the fridge for a couple hours to cool down. And I I can eat it later, but the immediacy of like smelling the tomatoes as I'm chopping them, I'm like it's they're yucky. Yeah, there's something <laughs> very gross to me about fresh tomatoes. I will eat them in certain context. But never a tomato slice on a burger. That's that's a hundred percent. I hate that. All it right. always ruins a. I feel like it ruins the burger and a sandwich. You know. Um, Interesting. 
Very but, interesting. But yeah, but 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 sprinkle it with tomato tomato uh, uh, dices or whatever diced tomato. Then yeah, yeah, I'll eat it, no problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. it's glorious. it's a good point. Like the tomato byproduct is glorious. The tomato itself kind of gross. And you know what the thing is, kind of gross. But also, am I mistaken in that the tomato is a byproduct of like a nightshade? It's like a nightshade plant, which is a highly poisonous plant. Yeah, yeah. you know, other varieties say. That's true. So there had to. You ever think of that like? How much danger was in the offing as humankind sort of seeked out what was edible and what wasn't? Like uh, there was a lot of people oh, yeah. that risked life and limb oh, for yeah. Oh, you know yeah, yeah. We, to get we, what we, we got today. The, we stand on the shoulders of people who just ate shit off the ground. So. Oh, that's a fact. Oh, yeah, that's a fact. <laughs> yeah, I one of my favorite tweets was something like before people understood allergies. It must have been really freaky to be working at a peanut farm and suddenly someone just drops dead, <laughs> you know, and just and just think about, like, yeah, we hired this new guy today. He just fucking died like that. Yeah. It gets me every time because it's true of before understanding really what a peanut allergy was. Mm-hmm. Just think about it. Some guys ate a peanut and just just died. And they're like, whoa, Ugh. like, are these safe or not? You know, it's not like the mushrooms where we've kind of figured out over time that some of those might kill people. It's like it's a peanut. Yeah. And that, this is, that's wild. So you can you can start to. You can start to understand why people believed in like evil spirits, you know, just just, yeah. just, just taking lives because like, dude, the guy was just working on peanut and he just fell, fell down and died. You know? like, <laughs> I guess he was a sinner, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, weird. it's so Most cute. Witch, like, it seems you know? so harmless, you know. It's like adorable. This little thing. It seems harmless and kind of delicious. Like, why is it murdering people? That it's so, you know, so strange. <laughs> yeah, and then like thinking like you know, some people got lucky and some people didn't, but. Think about every single. Po- just think about mushrooms. Just just mushrooms. Think, think about right? think about think about milk. Actually, mm. uh, it reminds me of the, the one of my one. favorite Calvin and Hobbes strips is when Calvin was was asking Hobbes, "Who was the guy who looked at a milk's a cow's udder and was like, I should, I should, I should squeeze this and drink, drink, <laughs> drink whatever.' Drink out of it. it. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Good and point. see what happens. It's a, it is a really great, but th- those people were freaks. Our ancestors were absolute. <laughs> they freaks. did it all. They were freaks. They risked it That's all. It. <laughs> Gene, talk to me about you know getting sick, the flu, home remedies, comfort. What do you what do you like to do when you're feeling under the weather? Uh, well, as someone who's been very very sick recently, uh, I'll, I'll try to forgo any rituals uh, that that I had during that. I feel like that that is a that, that is certainly an extreme circumstance. But when I get just like sick or whatever, like I had COVID uh, last year uh, or mm. last year, last month, right? Um, I had COVID and it thankfully didn't uh, didn't really tank me. I actually had COVID while and I played um, Hell Divers two with Brad and Dustin, and it was really they were both making fun of me because I sounded so fucked up uh, playing it because like cool stuff will happen. And I'll just be like, "Oh, that's so cool!" <laughs> but, but like, and they were like, "You sound like you were dying." I was like, "Yeah, I was actually kind of dying." And I was like, "Yeah, I need to log off now." And then, and then I went, went to bed and and tried not to die. Um, and then Ooh. I took Paxlovid, um, which is a, which is a drug uh, that that's given to to high uh, high risk uh, uh, COVID patients. So of course I'm one. So I was I was able to get a prescription right away. Took it and got immediately better, like then the next day. And then people always say that that there's a there's a bounce back, um, a kind of a return of the pet, of the COVID after you take the Paxlovid, but didn't didn't return for me. I was just totally fine right afterwards, and I've been fine since. So um, that was a little scary because then when I got COVID, that's when I that's when I discovered cancer. So it was a little triggering for me. Oh right, right. But uh, yeah, my ritual though is to get a bowl of pho. That's it. I just go to I just go to a Vietnamese restaurant and I just want a bowl yeah. of pho. Uh, it's got that chicken, it's good. got soup, yeah. it's got bean sprouts in it, it's got vegetables. Okay. Um, it's hot. Uh, nice. Every time I I have a bowl of pho, I I, I can feel my my health meter regenerate. You know, uh, mm. you definitely. You, you you feel it. You're like, you know, like you can feel you can feel the the the, the ticks going back up. Like I'm like I'm in Ninja Gaiden, you know. Yeah, your energy <laughs> bar is going. I just right got back. one or two ticks back up, and I okay. I was like, okay, I can I can make it through the day, you know. Nice. Um, that's about it, really. I I I just I just kind of uh, drink a lot of water, uh, you know, sometimes some vitamin C. Uh, you know, I even drink milk, you know, because uh, I love milk and to talk about cows. You know, I'm one of those weird people that actually just drink and just straight up drink milk sometimes. You know, 
Mm. Um, <laughs> it's weird. It's it's really God weird. I, I get it. I don't understand why I, I still do it sometimes. But I, I like milk, you know. Mm. <laughs> um, oh. But yeah, or, like or, like orange juice too, and just just fun. Just 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 yeah, just making sure I have some of that and and some greens. You know, uh, I, I don't really have too much trouble eating vegetables but you know sometimes i have to remind myself to make sure to eat vegetables and then when i'm sick i'm just like oh yeah i'm just gonna i'm just gonna tank some greens right now you know because this is what you're supposed to do yes um yep i did grow up in guam and uh it was interesting growing up in guam because you, you guys are talking about like black super superstition so you know we got pacific islander superstition and we're talking about again people dropping dead in the peanut peanut fields right so in guam we have something called the tata mona which are vampires, basically. Um, and uh, if you get sick for whatever reason, then then we basically blame it on the vampire um, because you were probably doing something stupid, and you probably did uh, did something stupid to deserve it. Or were you were you peeing like in public on public property? Uh. Then the vampire got you, you know. Oh, and, and now and and now look at you all laid out in bed, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you had this coming. Totally it, was, it, was, it was brutal. It, it, it was it was getting sick was definitely a way of of guilting you into it, right? But then they, but then they would also have our village doctors, uh, which we would call the surahano, you know, or the surahana mm-hmm. if they're a female. Um, and uh, I grew up uh, just having all kinds of like ointments, like like on my body, like coconut oil and lime and stuff like that uh, to make me feel better. I don't know if it made me. I, I, I was I was a sick sick kid when I was little, actually. When I was growing up, I was always going to a doctor. I was really, really sick for some reason. And then it kind of stopped. Uh, I think around like age eight or whatever, I just kind of got better suddenly. Okay. And I don't know. I don't know what was wrong with me at the beginning of my life. Uh, I certainly know what was wrong with me at the end of it, you know. But uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it. You guys talk about Vicks inhalers uh, reminds me though, because I have never really used Vicks inhalers for any legitimate purpose. But uh, for for people who 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 do cocaine and who do Molly, uh, Vix inhalers are a very very great enhancer for 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 those feelings. Um, <laughs> so you would go you would go into your local like Circle K or whatever, get mm. a Vix inhaler when you're high, and you just sniff that, and then you're like, ah, I'm ready again, you know. Um, it's crazy. So you all wonder why I got cancer. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say now, Gene. I just heard this recently. And I didn't know. Like I knew I started. Don't try that at home, kids, Molly. by the way. So. <laughs> disclaimer. Yeah, disclaimer. Yeah, disclaimer. I'm, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard I started hearing a Molly. I, I'm old, so I never heard that before. Mm-hmm. And then I heard recently that Molly is just another word for ecstasy. Is mm-hmm. that correct? Yep, that is. For, okay. for, for MDMA. So oh, I it's actually, didn't, that's I actually didn't call it a, a, a Molly growing up in the 2003 to 2006 when I was doing it. Okay. Um, it was just E or ecstasy or just pills or whatever like that. So why did they change the name? I don't know. Was I, it like a proprietary thing, like Xerox? Like you can't got to stop. We trademarked that. You got to call it something. Well, I, I think Molly the, sounds so old school. I think it sounds kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. Don't do it, kids. I'm just saying the name sounds cool. Why? I'm so naive when it comes to drugs. I don't. I, I heard that. I heard the kids are calling it Molly now, and I was like, in oh, the 90s, it was ecstasy because it's molecular. That's why. Oh, Ooh. so it is a different. It's short, it's short for molecule because because Molly is just like a bunch of molecule 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 drugs smashed together. You know, that's that's how I got introduced to meth. You know, because because meth was because because meth was being mixed into the Molly. You know, is that right? See, I mm-hmm. I, didn't, I didn't know any of this stuff. Yeah, it's dangerous. So, yeah, yeah, it's wild. Very dangerous. There's, I realize how like my life comp- Gene is the bowl of pho. And I am the boiled chicken, all right? Just the plain <laughs> boiled chicken. Because in my life, I have never been in proximity to anyone who even knew where to get meth. Now, I'm, mm. no, you know, we smoked a lot of weed, okay? Sure. And like, I, I had friends who did oh, coke. I never partook. Oh but I God. have never I known anyone like who would even know where to get meth. No. Oh, I'm not you ready for, for a stony You don't want like it. We're not ready? Yeah. Oh, my God. I think that'd be fun, uh, I, I don't really smoke much these days, but I remember it was like the first time I got high. And I, my legs, I was like, I can't feel my legs. And like, I, I could, but I couldn't figure out how to walk. And my friend had this big pickup truck, like an F-150. And he's like, are you all right? I was like, yeah, I'm good. And he opens the door. I just fell out. No. Just hit the ground. Oh, just, yeah. And then I was like crawling into the house. I was like, I'm all right. I'm all right. I just, I don't know what happened, That's but so I funny. was so convinced I couldn't feel my legs. I was having a great time though. <laughs> but oh yeah, I mean, those, those were the days. And that was also... 
before I developed like chronic acid reflux and maybe it's why I did because we would go I would go to Burger King get a Whopper then we'd go to McDonald's and get a quarter pounder no cheese all right and like this is me just eating all this food like it's nothing going to Dunkin afterwards get a couple of donuts this is back to back McDonald's Burger King and then I developed chronic acid reflux and now uh, here I am today so Mm. maybe that's what happened to me I don't know I can't I can't prove that. We all got our vices. But I'm pretty sure I fucked it all up. We all got our vices. Back to back fast food sandwiches might have been worse than the drugs for sure. Like that's, you know, I love, don't get me wrong. I love it. Also, Mike, it sounds like training day happened to you literally. Like, yeah, it sounds like it may have happened. Yeah. yeah, I didn't know you like to get wet. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, yo, you want to be a funny. sheep or a wolf? All right, Mike, I'm not going to spoil. Not going to spoil any of the spoiling. Oh, Mike, <laughs> she got to watch this movie. She got to watch this she, movie. She got to watch this movie. We, we yeah, got to have a knockback on on trading day and We're falling have down and falling down starting yes. for Russell too. So, oh absolutely. yeah, falling yeah. that keeps coming up. Or maybe we'll have a double bill and we'll do all, the the three people I'm looking at. Me and Kyle will do a five person knockback. Yeah, yeah, double yeah, bill yeah. Do we do we know if Colin has watched Training Day? So, oh, I have no idea. Oh, he's got to watch it. Uh, he, he I don't think he's seen it. He I want to see he hasn't. Yeah. I want to say he hasn't. Yeah. Anyways. No, that'll be. <laughs> Listen, you guys are reminding me of this thing. Speaking about how aggravated Helene is with me lately, like probably late into my, I didn't really get sick that much growing up. The one thing I remember from being little that was like the go-to remedy was Dimatap. Do you guys remember Dimatap? I do. It was a purple medicine. Yeah with that telltale artificial grape flavor Mm. that curses everything grape flavor from there on out. Because anything artificially grape flavored, probably 80% of that stuff tastes like whatever they put into Dimatap. It doesn't taste anything like actual grapes. But as a kid, that's what you identify as, as grape. Then you eat a grape and it's like, this couldn't be further than a grape, but that's grape. And this whole thing of growing up in the 80s, with all the artificial artificial flavoring, but that was the one thing. Dimatap was like the go to remedy, and the taste of that you you get it, it becomes habit. You know, and every time you get sick, which was every time you got a fever, right? Every time you had anything upwards of a hundred and two fever, it was lay in bed or lay in front of the TV, blanket, Afghan, and Dimatap, and the ginger ale, which had to be. My family was always big on. The flat ginger ale couldn't be Ooh, had to be carbon. It couldn't be carbonated. Interesting, right? right? You had to leave the cap loose, so it would get a little, fl- which was kind of gross, actually. No, that sounds great. <laughs> Mike is all about flat soda and no I ice. Do love Mike, my flat you'd be soda. in no oh, like room hell yeah. temp. Yeah, that was the big. It was the room temp flat ginger ale and the Dima tap. But when I got older, I developed this habit that again perplexes. Helene a lot, but now this is probably late into my 20s when it started to happen. So I was already an adult, but like when I really had to start becoming an adult, like when we were buying our first house, I remember the first time this happened to me was a couple of days before we got married. So this was 2002, the spring, and it was probably, it was probably like two or three days out. I had just talked about this on a recent episode of the show the enormous amount of planning Helene did for our wedding. Like she planned every aspect of this thing a year out. So everything, the flowers and the music and the venue and the food and the photographer and the favors and everything was kind of lovingly curated, like every single detail leading up to that day. And there was just something about, it wasn't getting married. Like Helene and I had already been together almost seven years. It was the fact of, I think worrying about what if it rains or what if that day just goes wrong, the things that are out of your control. And when I get that stressed out, I kind of sort of, it resolves in just getting these flu-like symptoms. The stress actually just kind of breaks me down and I start to get sick. And I remember two days out, I was like completely zapped of energy, kind of bedridden, super achy, little feverish, cold sweats. And then I realized, dude, like your body, you're so stressed out that your body is shutting down. And this is just my reaction to stress. And it started to happen 
it started to happen to me with every sort of stressful first time life event. When I, when Aline was in labor with my daughter who just turned 17, so 17 years ago, she had a very easy labor with our second kid with Graydon, but Lilia, the labor lasted like the better part of 24 hours. And for whatever reason, I got super stressed out and I shut down and I got into that sort of flu-like stressed out mode again. And I was in the hospital room with Helene right after she del finally delivered Lilia. And I was on like a little pullout couch in there, just couldn't move. I was in more shape than, Lil than Helene, who had just given birth. And the nurses would come wow. in and be like, dude, like, what are you doing? Like, buck up. Like, you, you would think you just gave birth, that type of thing. <laughs> and from that moment out, I realized like a, any kind of stressful, really stressful thing could even be starting a new job. I would just kind of break it. I would just get into this mode of like the stress would just lead to the flu. Mm. And I would realize like it's your body saying like you just have to go dormant. Like you just have to rest. You mm. have to lay down. And I remember that's when my dad taught me if you're feeling like that, whether it's like a an all out flu or whether your body's just giving in to stress or whatever, just drink an enormous amount of water. Mm. And you'll flush out all the toxins and whatever is wrong. Like drink more water than you could possibly even stand. Like mm. really like overhydrate. And basically you'll pee it out. And I remember leading up to the wedding because that was the thing. It was like worrying about the wedding. What if this day goes wrong? What if for some reason, despite all this planning and all this hard work, right? Something goes awry, it rains, it pours, people aren't going to have a good time. And then on top, what, what ended up happening, ironically, right, was like I was sick. Now I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to be sick for my wedding day. So my dad was like, just drink water. Like there's not really nothing else you could do. Rest, kind of listen to your body. You know what I mean? Rest and, and sort of relax. Breathe because you're obviously stressed out and just drink. And you know what? The day before the wedding, I felt better just drinking for like 24, 36 hours. Peeing. Dude, I can't even tell you. I peed 30 times in a day. Like it was ridiculous. But I think it worked. I think it just kind of helped flush out whatever was wrong. Just kind of reset, mm -hmm. right? Just kind of resets. Like Gene was saying earlier, you feel that life gauge, you know, that depleted life gauge sort of growing. The mm -hmm. bars are ticking up, you know, that type of thing. But it is, it is funny because it's usually, I feel like it's usually stress with me. You know, that just has this physical toll. Like the mental stress, the emotional, whatever I'm going through emotionally just has this physical component to it and yeah it's it's kind of aggravating but it does happen to me like and then i realize as i'm sick laying on the couch cold sweats and everything i'm like yeah because you're worried you know what i mean the worry just manifests itself and takes a physical makes you know takes a physical impact on me mm -hmm. so which is really aggravating for my wife because every time something stressful happens it's like she has to handle everything for two or three days you know I mean? <laughs> well i have to baby myself back to health but it is funny. That's just the kind of the way it is, you know, and I, I often feel like I'm not sure if I've had COVID or not. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I'm not, I really don't know. I can't, I can't answer that. I feel like I've gotten that sort of stress sick a few times since the offing of COVID. So I could have had it, but it's usually with me, it's usually starts with just worrying and then the worrying just intensifies. And then, yeah, just my body finally says, dude, just shut down. When I yeah, the last time it happened to me was like a two or three day period. I felt so sick, man. And I just laid in my office on my couch and watched Game of Thrones from beginning to end and watched the entire thing. I had never seen wow. it. I was a few years late and watched <laughs> the entire thing until, and that's how I, which was really stressful actually. When I got to things like the Red, red, the red, red Wedding and stuff like that, it was like, you know what I mean? It was not the best thing for a sick person. But that's how long it took me to get better. And I think I watched it. I marathoned it, you know, over like 48 hours or, or maybe it was even three days. So yeah, that's my, that's my thing. But it's so funny. I hate being sick, but I do feel like my body's telling me like, dude, you have to just reset. Yep. You know what I mean? Like you can't, if I try to push through it yeah. and like make dinner and go food shopping and shuttle the kids around and keep working, you know, burning it at both ends with the work and the animating and stuff. It's just, I won't get better. You know, my body, it, my body just says, dude, you're just, that's it. You're on hiatus. You know what I mean? Like, 
<laughs> that's it. You gotta, you gotta just come back. You know, it, it calls the shots because I yeah. won't. It's what it's like what Gene said about vegetables before. I do wonder if I just take those preventative measures, right? A little less fast food, a little more kale in my diet, you know, a little more broccoli rob, a really nice salad, if I, a little more rest, right? A little more sleep, a little less worrying. Mm-hmm. How would that, you know what I mean? How would that affect? Obviously, it couldn't hurt, right? But I wonder if I was better at that. It's almost like being hungover. It's like, oh my God, mm-hmm. like I had such a good time drinking last night, but I never want to feel this way again. You know, that morning after you're like, you swear (laughs) that you're going to do things differently. And then you don't, you forget about that feeling over the course of a week or two, go right back, slip back, right back into those bad habits. Right. It's Mm -hmm. almost like that. If I could just kind of embrace real change for me, it's eating, I think a little less so these days and just getting sleep, like not going to bed at three in the morning Mm -hmm. every single night. But you know, it's got, you got to practice what you preach, but I feel like that's the thing. Like I could do that. My body puts up with it for a while. And then it's just, then it just steps in and it's like, all right, you gotta, we're, we're gonna, we're, we're, we're stepping in here, you know, or I would probably just do the same thing until I die, you know, where your body has to intervene. That's kind of, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be happening like that. Right. You that's know? what happened to me. My body intervened, you know, basically. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess it does. I mean, I guess it's a defensive thing. I guess, you know, you're, it's so interesting, right? Because you're, I guess it really kind of means that your brain is somewhat independent of the rest of your body, right? <laughs> Which oh, is kind of- I mean, being lactose intolerant, okay. Let me just say that my brain knows you shouldn't eat that cheesecake. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. Don't do it. But much like a hangover, which I've never had a hangover, but my lactose intolerance, I'm going to liken it to that. I know I shouldn't do it <laughs> and I'm, I'll feel terrible later. But two weeks go by and it's like, that wasn't so bad. Even though I had told myself, you're never going to eat cheesecake mm. again. You know, don't ever touch that Going devil's crazy with fruit. the cheese. Yeah. But <laughs> and then you, two weeks later, you're at a restaurant. You see the dessert menu, you Oof. know, yada, yada, yada. I have diarrhea. And you just end up now you have to deal with that. So, but your brain, your brain convinces you, you know, it's going to be fine. Yeah. Or mm-hmm. it's not so bad. Oh, and yeah. then when you're living it. And you're like, oh, why did I do that? Never again. Two weeks later, your brain says, that wasn't so bad. No, do it all, do it all over again. Order a Frosty when you go to Wendy's. Why the fuck not? Yeah, look, I, I used to wear a cigarette, man. After, after everything I've been through, mm. I'm still like, you know what? I can't actually wait until I get to my deathbed because it, that, that's when I can actually smoke a cigarette guilt-free without anything. I'm like, I'm literally on my way out. So, so let me just enjoy this last smoke like, 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 <laughs> solid, like solid snake, you know? Solid snake. Exactly, you know? Isn't that mm-hmm. funny? Yeah, your and your and your your brain will tell you like, oh, it's, it's human. Worth it. It's human because it's because human. because we because the, the the most human thing is that we know what makes us feel good. We know that this we enjoy this spiritually, mentally. You know, we know that that that, that eating a cheesecake is good, no matter what. I know that 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 eating smoking a cigarette will make me feel great right now. You know. Yeah, smoking cigarettes, I, I really miss it. I have to tell yeah, you, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, my one vice too, that man. I really miss. Yeah. Yeah. It's still del- it's it's delicious. There's just something it's just I love the taste of it. Not now, not menthol. Not menthol. Oh menthol. Oh my god. But menthol my parliament's my, recess my, filter, so I actually, I I actually hated menthol growing up. Uh because I used mm. to smoke Marlboro Reds. I used to, I started hard, you know. That's hardcore. So my, yeah, so my voice was like was like this for a little bit, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> I sounded like Cog, you know. <laughs> use me, use me. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then, and then, I really, really got addicted to menthol uh, in the last like ten years. But when I was smoking, I was like, I can't smoke anything but menthol at that point. Yeah, it was, it you get weird. used to it. People swear by the menthol. People mm-hmm. really love the taste. You know, I get it. Like I used to smoke, which was really offensive to a lot of people around me. I smoked clove cigarettes for a while. Uh, yeah, oh, that's offensive. God. And it, yeah. that was a lot. Yeah. That was a lot. And I realize now in retrospect, yeah, I understand why people hated that. Oh, I got, I got into menthol because my black roommates got into menthol. And that's why mm-hmm. that, that, that old Dave Chappelle skit about, about uh, who knows black people. And then the question is, why do black people smoke menthol all the time? And then the, the correct answer is, I don't know. 
<laughs> it's like I don't know either, but but the, but but they they turned me on to American Spirits and I smoked it and I was like, oh my god, this is a lot better actually. Um, mm. And then I just I just kept on going, you know. Yeah, that's what our yeah. dad smoked. Yeah, those are those and those were good. They they did have like that toasted, like they felt a little more. I don't know. How, Clothes how to are say toasty. It. Clothes are toasty. Yeah. Toasty. I do like the way they sound. Like like they burn. They, shh, you know, I, I you do hear like the sizzle. Part. Yeah. Anyways, we're driving ourselves crazy, Dagan, right now. So. I know. Yeah. Oh, dude. It's <laughs> so, not it's good. So bad. It's I not mean, healthy. <laughs> kudos to us for control, though. Yeah. Right? I know. I'm about to go downstairs, take a bite out of a block of cheese or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want, eat, man. Yeah, man, I want some edge. cheese right now, too, man. Jesus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Your brain's telling you it's worth it. I know, my guy. I, 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 I really, I sympathize. It's, it's tough. We all have that thing. And, you know, I wonder, too, like with that, with – Gene and I with the Siggies, or you with the dairy, Micah and Cog. What, what's your advice, Cog? Give me the one thing that you like purposely deprive yourself of, even though because it's not good for you, maybe mm. even though you love it. There's so many <laughs> to, to, to <laughs> narrow it down to one. Oh my lord! Um, I've been you know I've been really good about like the fast foods and the the the, the 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 like the sodas and the ice creams and things like that but mm. yeah i mean there's like they're very specific things i know like i don't know if you guys have chick-fil-a do you guys but oh sure. mm. yeah they have this frosted lemonade that mm. is yes. it's good die for it's good. <laughs> that thing's amazing when i go to chicago there's um oh what's the name of that place is it luminati's and they have a um it's almost like a chocolate cake in a like a like a shake but it's oh, literally dude. a chocolate cake. Oh. It's amazing. That sounds it's delicious. Good, yeah, that so it's so like good. certain things like that. Damn, and then, that. Um, oh, you got oh, a sweet tooth, Cog. All right. All right. I see sweet you. Sweet tooth. Huge right. sweet tooth. Mm. Like I just took um, Attic to, we have Dallas BBQs in, in New York. They have a, sure. a bunch of those. And <laughs> they have Texas sized margaritas. Yeah, they right? do. That's a, margaritas are a big vice of mine. So Texas sized margaritas. And then, so it's, literally a bowl of sugar that you're literally drinking with with tequila and then i have the nerve to they have this long tube which you put the extra shot in so we would have contests though you, it's not done until you put the extra shot oh. inside. The, the, oh so we, that was the pregame place we would Sounds go good. back in the day so yeah it, it was bad man so yeah definitely sweet tooth anything sugary I have to be careful because, yeah, I, there's times I'm like, look, I had a, a rough week. Okay, I, I deserve this. <laughs> yeah, man, you gotta <laughs> treat yourself. Yeah. Oh, I mean, 100%. my I always have candy on my desk for when I'm fulfilling orders, and usually I don't. It's it really is like when I get really stressed, it's like I'm gonna have a fun dip right now. All Ooh. right, for, if you're not, if you don't remember fun dip, that's Good like shit. the white piece of chalk that you yes. lick and you dip it in the powder, mm -hmm. like. I just have this thing of when I get really stressed out at work, and I think it started when I worked at the university in the mm. IT department, I always had a bowl of candy on my desk. You get really stressed out, have a candy. Mm -hmm. I would limit myself to three pieces per day, mm. all right, because oh. I didn't want to go too nuts with it. Okay. But I still do that now, even if we're really busy and I have a lot of orders to fulfill. It's like, how about a piece of candy? How it about is. a fun dip? It you know, is. and it's just like, that's my that's my number one thing when I'm stressed is like, how about some candy? Mm -hmm. I <laughs> loved that as a kid. That was my go-to ice cream man thing for years. Like over ice cream, over, I would just let, let the Mr. Softy come and go. I'd wait for that ice cream truck with the candy and I'd go for the... We called it Lick a Maid back in mm. the day. I don't know why. Oh. Maybe that was the brand. I don't. Mm. I don't know. But I know. Yeah, it's that little tombstone shaped piece of candy that you lick and then you dip in the sugar. It's colored sugar. That's all it is. It's right. Fantastic. It's just colored powdered sugar. Delicious. So good. Oh my god! If I did that now, I'd just go into diabetic shock and just die. <laughs> I would just die. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know what I mean. And mm. that's why we're where we are right now, ladies exactly. and gents. That was, uh, yeah, shout out Dallas Barbecue. That was the first time I ate, you know, I worked, I mean, what, 20 years in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. That was a go-to lunch spot, especially yeah. the one over by Central Park. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I ever saw enormous cocktails Bruh. with a Corona sticking out of it. Yeah, literally. Yeah, a Corona sticking upside down out of the cocktail. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. sometimes a patrol bottle. Now they have a patrol bottle. Oh, that's oh it. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's insane. I had that two weeks ago. Goodness. 
God. All right. Now we need to go to Dallas Barbecue. Yes, we do. Um, Cog, what do you think, man? Did we uh, yeah. did we do your topic justice? Yeah, y'all nailed it. Y'all nailed it. And right. I, I want to shout out Michael also for the, um, I forgot because my mom was big on the tea, honey and lemon. So mm. the honey yes. was very big. Yeah. And the lemon. I forgot about that one too. So yeah, you guys knocked it out the park. I am satiated. Honey and lemon is, yeah, that was tight. I think there were a series of Jamaican women that cared for my grandma as she got a lot older. Mm -hmm. And they had a home remedy that was honey and hot lime, actually. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty pungent, Mm -hmm. but I have to say, super effective. Very effective. Right? Clear your sinuses, Mm -hmm. really what your throat's hurting. Sore throat, yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was unbelievably effective. Oh, yeah. Them West you Indian know? women, they got that. Oh, yeah, they know about that. <laughs> they just know, <laughs> man. Yes, yes big like, time. Dwayne Reed, you don't need it. Like, you don't just, need that. just these people know mm-hmm. it's so simple. It's a few basic ingredients and so utterly effective. Yep. You know, that, like the wisdom. Yep. Yes. Unbelievable. Okay. Super. Cog, I got one more thing I just thought of. You got it. It, when you grow up in a black household, mm. laughter is not the best medicine. Because if you start feeling better, if you stayed home oh, from church or you no. stayed home from school, you, <laughs> hours later, your mom hears a single giggle. It'll be, I better not hear any laughing. Yep. Oh, that's hilarious. That's that was the number fact. one of like, you stayed home sick from school. It could be 8 p.m. You're feeling mm. better. And it's, I better not hear any laughing. Yep, that was yep. the number one of like, nope. No, nope. you, you are sick until you wake up the next day. Yes. Then you're allowed to say, I think I feel better now, mom. Like <laughs> That's a fact. She's, yo, you preaching, preaching. I bet I can't you smile and play the video games. Or <laughs> like, yeah, you have too much of a good time when you're sick. Oh, no, you was not sick then. So clearly you could have went to church. You could have went to the hall. Oh, you could have, oh, trust me. I know about yeah. this. <laughs> you're allowed to watch Maury. You're allowed to watch Price is Right, but I better not see a smile or yeah. hear a tee hee. None of that. <laughs> That's a fact. <laughs> That's definitely part of the culture. Don't look entertained <laughs> at all. At all. No. Right. No, it's the most boring thing you've ever seen in your life. Bob mm-hmm. Barker's on. You want to just crack just the smallest smile you hold it in. Mm-hmm. You hold it in. Oh, that because is you hard. are on your deathbed. You guys must be good actors, right? There's a lot of acting in that. You had to you were on the mend a lot sooner than you wanted to let on. Yeah, you gotta right? play the role. You guys might you might you might be actor studio bound. <laughs> you know what I mean? You have to put it over on your mom's tough moms like that. Yeah. 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 See, my mom was easy to fool. Uh, sorry, mom. I know you're probably listening, but you were, it was, it was almost too easy. You know, it's like, she could have watched a series of any eighties teen comedy movies and no, known all my tricks, you know, thermometer on the thermostat, like on the, on the baseboard, like, you know, fake, fake barf in the toilet bowl, like the whole, I did it all. All she had to do is watch a couple of these movies. She would have been up to speed. Yeah. <laughs> So I didn't have that going. All right, dude, that was a fun one. Now yeah. I, I'm curious where I'm going to go next, Mike. I think I'm going to go to you. I really like your topic. I was just thinking about this recently, mm. and um, I think we'll all have a lot to say about this one. So, Mike, take it away. Yeah. So I want to talk about print magazines. Mm. This has been on my mind because I have been a longtime subscriber of Food Network magazine, and I recently switched off of it. Uh, to America's Test Kitchen. They have an app. They have this whole recipe database. They also have a few magazines. I signed up for Cooks Illustrated. Uh, But it's because Food Network Magazine, it was no longer offering me what I wanted. You know, it was, they had some interesting recipes, but it was getting very bougie to the point that like you open up the magazine and it's advertisements for, you know, $1,500 bar stools, things like that. And I'm like, this isn't, what I want, you know, I'm, I'm totally cool that if they give you cookware recommendations, appliances, all that type of stuff, but you're advertising me a $1,500 chair in a food <laughs> magazine. And I was just like, I don't, this isn't what I'm after. The recipes were just getting out of control in terms of exotic ingredients, things you can't just find at a grocery store. It was getting to that point of it's fine to have a couple fancy recipes in here, but I'm not looking to have, oh, I have to order all this stuff online to try and make half of these recipes, right? So I ended up switching over. And then I kind of realized, you know, you're signing up for this service. And it's like, do you want the print magazine or the digital one? And I selected print because I still really enjoy getting magazines in the mail. It's very nostalgic for me. Um, 
I had put, you know, in the email to you guys, when I was a kid, my parents always got like National Geographic, Time, Reader's Digest. My favorite magazine that my mom would get was Family Circle, which I was very oh. sad to recently learn they don't make that anymore. That magazine's gone. Is it gone? But as a, oh, wow. Yeah. And as a kid, that. I loved it because they had all these recipes. I loved to bake as a kid. So it's just print magazines are really nostalgic. When I think of even magazines for for kids, I used to get National Geographic Kids Magazine. I used to get the Highlights magazines, like what you get in the dentist office, those like activity books where they have fun facts and everything. So it was a really big part of my childhood, always seeing these magazines in the house, you know, the magazine stash in the bathroom, which is really gross now that I think about it. I'm like, <laughs> why do we have this it. basket so full of magazines and everyone's using them and we're touching them, haven't yeah. seen that? Right. We're like, all our, we're have... all putting our poo poo and pee pee in article, <laughs> part, articles all over the pages, <laughs> right? <laughs> Part varying particles. Yeah, you know? yeah. all kinds of particles like, of stuff on all over the books. Because, <laughs> you know, National Geographic, sometimes they were a little saucy. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, let's go see this tribe of women who don't wear shirts. Like, all right, let's see what that's all about. It but, worked for me back I, then, too, honestly. You know, <laughs> when you're when you're when you're when you're 12 years old, that'll work. It's enough. Yeah, it's <laughs> like enough. Yeah, it'll do. You know, it's an upgrade <laughs> from the JC Penny catalog, right? But I I even remember being afraid of some of the magazines. There was one year that Spirited Away, I believe, was on the cover of Time magazine. Scared the shit out of me. Oh, wow. And I'd flip it over every time my dad left it on the coffee table. I'd flip it over. Oh, because the No Face was on the the cover, right? No Face. Yes. That was a great cover. I mean, those commercials... I never saw the movie because it scared me. The commercial scared me so much as a child. It's scary. It's scary as hell. (laughs) It is. It is. I was actually at the premiere in LA for it. Oh really? Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, they had a whole museum exhibit oh, of, of Miyazaki's like like animation cells and everything too. It was gorgeous. Oh, that that's movie. fantastic. It was at the El Capitan Theater at Dagon too. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Super cool. But, Anyways. But yeah, so print magazines were just a huge part of my life and also an exposure to culture. I remember at one point I have an older cousin who is Colin's age. And when I was in elementary school, he came to live with us for a little while. And I remember him getting, I think it was Jet Magazine. Jet. It was like the, the black people yeah, magazine, like pop go. culture. And it was all about like black actors oh, and, yeah. you know, pop Hell star yeah. R&B. And mm. I remember seeing that and being like, oh, I didn't know this existed because I'm from the countryside of Western Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And here he's getting his jet magazines delivered to our house. And it was just a cool thing to see like, oh, there's more than just cooking magazines and dad's nature magazines. Like there's a a whole world out here of this is about entertainment versus just being about indigenous tribes of various places and learning about fish and, and all that other shit. So it was just one of those things that And that was another one to be a little sad to hear. It was discontinued in print. It's now online only. Mm. Uh, You know, being a form of being a fan of Game Informer uh, back in the day and getting my subscription through GameStop and getting my print magazines. So they're they're still they're they're doing print right now. Yes. I so I that's part of what inspired this Mm. topic, because I was already thinking about it, getting my own print magazines in the mail this week and then seeing that tweet. And was like, oh man, I used to love Game Informer. Mm-hmm. I just there is something just special about print magazines. But I want to start with Eugene. Uh, obviously, actually, <laughs> someone who you know, print would be. I feel important to you, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, I actually have my very, very first copy of Nintendo Power, and I can get it uh, later it's after I finish know. talking. Oh, but, but that's it awesome. is literally yeah. right oh. next door. It is the first. So, so I was part of the Nintendo fan club. And I actually got the last issue of the Nintendo Fan Club magazine before oh. it became Nintendo Power with that iconic Super Mario Brothers 2 cover. So I, I was OG. I was like literally Ooh. like in the door in Nintendo Power That's like already. Dope. Like 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 because I was a fan club member, I got that first issue right away. You know? So that was probably like the first magazine experience. Um mm-hmm. But yeah, I'm so glad that you brought this topic up, Micah, because magazines is the reason why I got into journalism in the first place. Nice. I did nice. not want to become a video game journalist. I didn't want to become a crime journalist. I don't want to become a military journalist. I don't want to become an education journalist. I don't want to become a business journalist. I've, I've been all those things except for a music journalist. I wanted mm. to cover music. I wanted to, be, I wanted to be in Rolling Stone. I wanted to be in Ooh. Spin Magazine. I wanted to work in Vibe Magazine, any of those places, Ooh. you know? 
I wanted to be uh, uh, going on tour with Wu Tang Clan all over the place, right. and, and I yeah. wanted to be like the premier Wu Tang Clan reporter. You know, um, my my dream in high school was to become a be, become a Rolling Stone reporter and and live like Cameron Crowe, you know, and almost famous. You know, hell yeah! Uh, I want I want to be the reporter that that's with the rock stars of the era. You know, uh, that that knows the rock stars, and the rock stars know me, right? Gene, I could see you doing that. Honestly, yeah. no, no, no. I'm, I'm already doing it with, with, with video Ooh. games right now. With video games, he's doing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Now. I'm already doing it he with video games it. right now because because I consider video games the new rock and roll, right? So the fact that I can just like dap up Todd Howard or Rod Ferguson or or Phil Spencer or you know like like like, like even Naoki Hamaguchi of Final Fantasy Seven, you know, like or Sam, like I'm just like in the hang with Sam Lake right now, you know, like totally. all that stuff. Like I'm living the dream right now. You know, it, it's it, it 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 became something else. And I, I adapted to it, right? So I'm really, really happy with what I am. But I still lo- would love to cover music. You know, even mm. literally just this week, I asked my editor, hey, I, I know I cover video games, but I would really, really like to write something about the Kendrick Lamar and, and J. Cole and, and, and Drake Beef right now. And they're like, oh, we, you know, we, we got someone working on it. I was like, God damn it, you know. But <sighs> because I'm always, always trying to cover music. But let's go back to magazines. Mm. I have been a reader of so many different types of magazines. All, all the video game magazines, of course. EGM, Game Fan, Octal. Game Ooh. Pro, Game That's Pro cool. with, with the with the face with the faces, the, the face rating system, five point yeah. reviews, and everything. Yes. There, right? Classic. Game Fan was the magazine that that had that had probably the biggest JRPG focus. Uh, that day we covered like Final Fantasy three. They had like the biggest coverage of Final Fantasy three at the time. EGM was the was the magazine that had kind of like the, the the mainstream focus. You know, I remember, I still remember like when I first saw the 10, 10, 10, 10 review of Halo One in EGM. Mm. And I was like, yeah. word that that video game Halo is that good? It's got all ten, four tens in EGM. I guess I gotta buy an Xbox then. This this new thing from Microsoft, and mm-hmm. the rest is history, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but besides from video game magazines, I used to I was big into comics, right? So I was huge into Wizard magazine, right? Wizard, Wizard magazine. That. What you know about yes. Wizard magazine? You know, what you they, know they, about Wizard. They had the yes. prices of of every comic book, but that but that mm-hmm. Wizard magazine, the writers were so funny that I I believe so much of my humor, and the tone and 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 tenor of my voice and my sarcasm stems from the writing of Wizard magazine. Um, but there's Wizard magazine, and then of course the music magazines, Rolling Stone, Spin, Vibe magazine, right? But I also love Circus Magazine. If you, if you guys know about that, Dagan, you, do you know about Circus? Rock sure. Magazine? Yeah. Oh, yeah, Circus. man. You know, they they covered all the indie punk, the, the punk scene. You know, the, the indie scene, the rock scene, the metal scene, and everything. Um, I used to, and speaking of metal, I used to to love heavy metal magazine and art there. You know, and all the titties there. You know, <laughs> uh, heavy magazine, heavy metal magazine was basically like a graphic novel magazine with, uh, that that had fantasy stories. Conan O'Brien, or no, not Conan O'Brien. Conan the Barbarian. Oh, Mary. Uh, yes, the, that's the, right. The, you know, and, and the old Frank Frazetta art, you know, rest, rest in peace, Frank, Frank Frazetta. You know, he so, always had the sexiest monsters and, and girls uh, g- girls on there. It was crazy. Like, and they're, they're, I used to listen to, I used to read uh, the motorcycle magazines, Easy Rider magazine, because they had titties in them too, you know? And then you should start out right in the rack at the grocery store. So you should just go right up to the magazine rack and say, well, let me just get some titties right now for free, man. Right at the checkout. Gene, I got to send it to you. I think I have a circus, an old circus magazine with Lita Ford on the cover. Oh, that's fantastic. It's so like 88, like it's all purple and gray. Like the whole magazine is just a time capsule back to like the late 80s. Yeah. Hair metal and all that. Yeah, Yeah. So cool. And it, oh, oh, actually, actually, you know what? I lied. Nintendo Power is not my first experience with a magazine. Ooh. My first experience with a magazine is actually GQ Gentleman's Quarterly. Nice. My dad would force – my dad did not make me read Berenstain Bears and all that shit when I was a kid. He made me read GQ. He said, son, if you want to become a man, a real man, you need to read this shit right here. You need I to figure it. out what kind of cologne you need right now. And they Ooh. got free cologne in these pages, you know? So so I was like like eight years old, like rubbing the rubbing his shit. I was like, ah, it smells good, you know? Yeah, like, like I think the girls like this, yeah. you know? The GQ. Yeah. So so like I was reading GQ. That's why I like I I've been into fashion, you know. I'm I'm big into fashion because because th- th- that stuff indoctrinated me, you know. Yeah, your um, dad was making you metro like way before it was very, cool very me. early. Very, so very like, early on. Like like he like my dad was way ahead of the game in terms in terms of making sure that, that his son was that. like, you know. 
uh, uh, sartorially correct, uh, to, to, to say the least, right? Um, but yeah, your dad could have founded Maxim magazine. I yeah, mean, yeah, like, yeah. Well, that, Ma- that was Maxim was another Maxim. one too, you right. know? Yeah, I used to sure. love uh, the, the, the internet magazines. When magazines used to cover the internet, <laughs> which is a crazy thing. Remember remember when print used to cover the internet, you know? Uh, there was Seriously. Yahoo magazine, so they, they, they would show us like the latest feature of yeah, features of Yahoo and everything like that. Unbelievable. Um, God, I could go on for but there, there are so many magazines that, that, that I used to read all the time, you know? Um, I still... Uh, I still read magazines now. Uh, I'm still a subscriber to Washingtonian Magazine. Uh, that's the cool. city magazine here in Washington, D.C. And they've written about me a couple of times, which is nice, too. Nice, um, nice. But uh, I, I still subscribe. You know, this, 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 the magazines these days, though, they're not what, they're not what they used to be. But mm. I was actually thinking about uh, subscribing to Game Informer because that, that is a cool mm. – that would be a cool thing to have. They have beautiful covers, you know. Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, and and their coverage is good, you know, because they are the GameStop magazine. They do get pretty good access, which is good, you know. That's fine. Uh, sometimes we just need this stuff, you know. Oh yeah. Um, what other magazines were there? Circus magazine, Heavy Metal magazine, uh, Sp- you know, Sports Illustrated. Rest in peace. Sure, you know? Sports Illustrated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that I used to read a lot of Sports Illustrated too. I was huge into sports and basketball at the time, and the Olympics. Mm-hmm. Every time the Olympics happened, I was obsessed with the Olympics. I love the Sports Illustrated Olympics coverage. I used to collect those all the time. Um, Gene, as a writer, were you ever attracted to the large circulation, just like news magazines, like Time, oh, stuff like no. that? Fuck that! You never, you never. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. That, I, mean, I mean, to be fair, like Time and Newsweek, uh, that, that I did read them a lot too. I, I actually read a lot of shit ton of Time magazine, right? Um, but I was never interested in writing that kind of. I, I again, I never wanted to get into political journalism. I didn't want to get into like mm. investigative journalism. I didn't want to get into serious journalism. I wanted to get into entertainment journalism, which is what I'm doing now, right? But I never wanted to do any kind of politics or anything like that. Time Magazine and Newsweek are right now like a shell of their former selves. Um, it's it's pretty crazy to yeah. see. Um, but it is funny. You know, there is a notion that Time, you know, people still think Donald Trump still thinks that Time Magazine is a big deal, right? Because he gets so mad that, that he's not the, the Time person of the year, but it really doesn't matter. You know, who no, nobody gives a shit, right? But uh, there's still there's still people alive, including myself, who remember the prestige of, of places like Time Magazine. If I was on the cover of the Rolling Stone right now, yes, uh, the, the, the idea of me being on the cover of the Rolling Stone, which the I- iconic song said, uh, it has been diminished, but I would still be like, "Holy shit, I am on the cover of the Rolling Stone." You know, that would still be cool for me. But I've been again; I'm 40 years old. If I was 20, I wouldn't give a shit. That's for damn sure. You know, and right. I, I sure as hell wouldn't tell any 25 year old, "Look at me, I'm on the cover of the, the Rolling Stone." That wouldn't matter to them either. You know, so. Gene, I like what you're saying though, because you are kind of the Lester Bangs of video game journalism. You know what I mean? So you took all your desires and all your inspiration for music journalism, just kind of segued it right into video games, mm-hmm. man. I mean, you're living it. You know, the first time, I, I never told this story on air, I don't think. Hmm. The first time I recorded Punching Up With Gene, right after that episode, remember we ended late, I got in the car and I drove down to the, the Wawa and I put on NPR and who the hell's talking on NPR about, I think it was Tears of the Kingdom. Yeah. Was Gene. I was like, holy uh, shit, I just got done talking to this guy in the, on the pod, and now is. he's on NPR. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it was Fresh Air or something like that. It was like mm-hmm. a big show, like mm-hmm. a nationally syndicated show. Yeah. And I, yeah, dude, it was just like your journalism chops. That's why, though, I ask about something like Time Magazine, like a an old magazine dating back that has to play to a broad base, mm-hmm. right? As someone who's not a journalism, I wonder about the quality of the writing. Was there ever a time where like the best- journalism the best journalists out there worked for those big yeah 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 heavy Look, circulation it, mags and all that yeah even at the washington post i mean time and newsweek right now are have basically become seo farms you know they, they are they are basically engaging in the same kind of content that ign and like game rent and screen8.com are doing sure but that's sure. it's that's that's how much media has homogenized now at this point but at the Washington Post, I can tell you that we are we have a very very high standard of writing. You can make fun of me and, and find shitty writing or whatever. But I will say that that, that at least in the hiring process, they are looking for for good writers. I have tried to get some of my really good friends who are excellent excellent reporters to get hired at the Washington Post. Um, they are much much better reporters than I am. They're they, they have great resources. They break news all the time. They have yeah. in, they're investigative chops. The Washington Post didn't hire them. You know why? 
because their writing sucked. Oh. They, 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 they are breaking stories. They're finding the scoops. But, you, but we also want excellent, excellent writers. We want, we want the words to sing off the page, you know? Sure. Uh, and that's why I couldn't even become a reporter. I was, I was a, remember, I'm a social media editor for the first six years when I was working at the Washington Post, you know? Um, and, I, and I've been a reporter for all my life, right? But the Washington Post never really, really tried me as a, as a writer. You know, they, they knew my chops as a social media editor, you know? Um, so as I, was, as I was doing my regular job, I started writing on the side, you know? Um, because I knew I had to do that. I needed, I needed to make sure that the editors knew how to edit me. They knew that, that they, they had to know that editing me wasn't going to be a problem. They had to know Ooh. that they, they liked my writing. And they did. And I, I brought in yes. readers. And that's how I, I was able to kind of slide into just becoming the video games critic with the Washington Post because, because I worked hard for it, you know? But sure. Yeah, these magazines, though, it's, it's, it's tough. I, the, 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 we, we, have, we had our own Washington Post magazine. We shut that down. The magazine business is not what it used to be, you know. No, uh, dude. Well, not ever. You know, yeah. uh, look, look, look at what everything's going on. Condé Nast, you know, uh, Vanity Fair magazine, and and all, sure. all these places. Uh, they're, they're they're doing terrible. The Atlantic magazine actually just announced uh, yesterday that they hit one million subscribers and are finally profitable. So if we need a million wow. subscribers to be profitable, bro, holy shit, we, this industry is fucked, man. Because a million subscribers is impossible for literally every single company except for a place like the Atlantic, which I'm surprised they got, right? Yeah. For, for the, the, and they're only just profitable now. And then think about us here at LSM. We got, what, almost 14,000 14, subscribers. We're profitable from day one, baby. You know? That's incredible. So yeah, when you look at that juxtaposition, that's that's insane. It's I insane mean, for the scale of it. So, really that, is. so that's, that's where magazines are at. It, 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 they're just in trouble. They're expensive to 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 run. Uh, to to have yeah. writers like me uh, just spending months on like one article, you know, like like that's not re- really feasible. Um, so I don't like it. Definitely goes to like more enthusiast folks. So ultimately, yeah. it goes back to people who are looking for recipes, who are looking for stuff to do, or you know. Like Vibe Magazine, Vibe Magazine. Like, like, what is Vibe Magazine now? You know, I don't know. I literally don't know. I don't know. You know, there's XXL. They're a Twitter account now, basically, right? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. That's true. Online, social, XXL hip hop. You know, that, that, that's hip-hop. what it yeah. is. You know? That's a fact. World Star Hip Hop uh, re- replaced both of them. You know, both of them. Yeah, that's yeah. a fact. Yeah, all that. It's incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's incredible that's hung on this long. Yeah. Um, no, that is very true because, yeah, when you think about it, I subscribe to a magazine that's very specific mm-hmm. and tailored to a, a certain hobby or interest because some of the more generalist magazines, there's not enough in it that I'm like, this is worth the nine ninety five mm-hmm. this magazine costs. Something sure. like Good Housekeeping mm-hmm. might have four pages that I'm actually interested in. Mm-hmm. The rest of it will be like just a whole bunch of stuff that I am just totally tuned out of. Mm-hmm. I don't want your fake plants mm-hmm. to decorate my house with whatever else you're advertising, you know, Oh, it's sponsored by, you know, visit South Carolina. Great. There's like 20 pages dedicated to restaurants in South Carolina that I will never visit. And it just gets to a point where you're, you want to still support these companies and the legacy they have, but it's too generalist mm-hmm. to, for me to like be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to keep paying for this. Yeah. Cause we got gifted a good housekeeping subscription from Collins real estate agent. Uh, when you buy a house from this man, he gives you a, a subscription to good housekeeping for a while. And I'm looking through these magazines and it's just one of those things. There's so little in it that I felt was relevant to my life. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's an age group thing. Maybe good housekeeping is for women like 50 and up. I don't know. But I really was looking at this like, I can't believe people pay for these mm-hmm. only because it is so random what you'll get. Mm-hmm. Not to say it's not a quality product, but to say you have no idea what's going to be in it mm-hmm. and it could be just anything. Mm-hmm. And that's why I like I do like magazines that are more specific. Mm-hmm. You know, at least they cater to a certain hobby or interest. So you have a ballpark idea mm-hmm. of what you're getting for your money versus something like, you know, good housekeeping or it's like it could be anything. You know, today's mm-hmm. theme could be gardening, today's theme could be Easter decorations. It could be literally anything and what you paid, you know, $10 for you don't even know till you till you open it. Yeah, um, it's a shot in the dark. It's too broad. Yeah, yeah. You, know, exactly. you, you almost have to specialize. And there's there's probably almost some sort of flop sweat in like, all right, we have to cast a wide net. This way we get a little bit of everybody. But it probably would be wiser to just specialize. Yeah. Like yeah. a magazine with just home decor, a magazine. And there th- th- those things do exist. Well, but you know, just cooking, but you know, the things that were just 
that are way too broad. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, you know, they're, they're kind of going the way of the dodo because, you know, it's with online and digital and sort of having all the stuff at your fingertips without, you know, doing it the old fashioned way. It's just not convenient. Well, it's kind of you know? what, how LSM started too, right? Uh, uh, Colin sure. could have started Last Sam Media and Sacred Simple as, as just a general video game podcast, right? But he yeah. decided to stick what he knew, PlayStation. PlayStation is his passion. And look where we're at now. You know, it was able to work. He was able to make it work for him, you know. If it was a general yeah, podcast true. like everyone else, and he's going to be he's going to be doing kind of funny all over again, you know. And will that mm. work? I don't know. He's going to compete with his own product that, that he just left, you know. Yeah, but it is true. It, it, there are similarities there, Gene, with like starting narrow and then kind of branching out. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah. you know, what Micah said about magazines in the beginning when she kicked it off is so, it's something I think about a lot. Like I still subscribe to a couple of magazines because there's nothing cooler than just shelling out like 30 or 40 bucks for a year's worth of magazines. Maybe they come bi-monthly, maybe they come monthly and you kind of forget about it. And then you get a little gift or two in the mail, they a little cool. surprise in the mail. They're, they're designed the well, you know? So like, like they put effort into it, you know? And it feels good to hold, you know? I like smiling. Hell yeah, too. dude. That tactile I, I, I love the smell the pages. of print, you know? Let me get my magazines real quick, but keep talking. <laughs> oh, I, 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 yo, dude, I can't wait to see. Yeah, magazines, it's, it's funny that you guys are saying that, too. Like, I remember being a little older, like probably the late 90s to the early aughts as Borders Bookstores and Tower Books, RIP, and a lot of Barnes and Nobles, like the big box store, Walden Books in the mall, like they started closing down and thinking about, you know, the advent then of like ebooks and e-readers and stuff and really thinking for a couple of years there, like everything's going away. Like there's not going to be magazines. It's kind of incredible that they survived for this long, if you think about it, right? And you go on the, you go on the newsstand, like I'm, I, oh, let me see what Gene's got. Nintendo oh, dude, that's Fun so Club This news. is pre-1988. Wow. 1988, wow. bro. Classic. So cool. That's and OG. Here is the ad to subscribe Ooh, to Nintendo Power. Nintendo there Power. it is. Yep. Fire. They're like, we're so becoming Nintendo good. Power. I love that you still have that. Still and then dude, that is so how cool. I got this issue. There it is. There it is. So have, this is the original issue I had when I was like seven years old, six years old, oh, six years old, seven, seven years old. Yeah. Sick. The, the, the back cover is I'm, it's iconic. All up. It's all ripped up. That iconic Classic. claymation cover. Gene, Ooh. you know what's crazy? Like, Contra. since I started really getting into vintage collecting, and, dude, yeah. it's so sick. That magazine has shot up in price continuously. Like, that that magazine's worth it. This one, too. Ooh. Castlevania. Worth a small fortune. Ooh. Issue number two with the bloody head, you know? So bloody controversial. Head. Sick. Yeah. Scared the hell out of Colin when he was little. That was the beginning <laughs> of his fascination. <laughs> With Castlevania for sure, mm -hmm. track and field two, so my, good. My, That's my, issue my three, right? On there, you know, dude. Crazy. Look how look how like incredible and look how much effort went into these magazines. Every cover is different. Zelda two. This is a live, live action, action like, cover. Shoot, you know, you so. know, so ambitious, so ambitious. Like so much better than it needed to be. Like we would have mm -hmm. loved it no matter what it looked like, but the art direction and the effort that went into these things, sick. That's why they're so Ninja meaningful. Guy Den. Oh, <laughs> so sick. I love that cover so much. Yeah. There's the castle in the back. Yeah, so for video folks, I'm showing off like the first, literally the first five issues of Nintendo Power, basically. The power. You know? Incredible, yeah. dude. Yeah, and it was important. And we looked forward to that stuff and there was no internet. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So it was everything Nintendo Power, waiting for the tips, waiting for the tricks. What oh, games yeah. are coming out? Tips and tricks. Tri tips and tricks in magazine, dude. I love that. I love that magazine too. Yeah. It was everything. I mean- that was like our magazines were everything. I mean, I love I. If you told me like in twenty, you know, like two thousand one, that magazines would still even be around in twenty twenty four, I'd probably tell you you're, you're bugging. Like but by twenty ten, they're gonna evaporate. Mike, but Michael Gray made such a an eloquent point though. They really are. They really were the gateway to culture, right? Like sure, like, early easy yeah. writer magazine. You know, I would not have known more, so much about motorcycle like culture if I wasn't like like looking at the titties right there. You know, and then just like, <laughs> absorbing it like by osmosis. You know, like like, but, like no, like, there was something. No matter culture, what you, you were know? interested in, there was a magazine or two or three, four. I mean, I came up in an era. I started skating in nineteen skateboarding in nineteen eighty seven. At that time, there were five. Over the course of my teenage years, there were four, five, six mainstream thrasher. large circulation mag skateboard magazines on the newsstands thrasher yeah baby thrasher trans world trans slap 
We had skateboarder for a while. We had Big Brother. So like there, there was Big even brother, for something oh skateboarding, God. just for enough, something niche like skateboarding, there were so many choices, and not even subscriptions. Like some of these magazines were so largely circulated that you could get them on like generic newsstands a lot. High times, you know I mean? so, high times too for weed. Remember, high times, dude. And, that was like a sought after magazine. And let's not you know? let, let, let's let's not count out the porn magazines. Come on, Playboy, Penthouse, <laughs> Hustler, they're all the way real now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. They're, 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 no, but that's they're, 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 that was the heavy metal. But yeah, the shout out to <laughs> shout out to the OG OG uh, OG uh, porn magazines or whatever. Uh, Oh yeah, I, I've told the story before, but I almost got a job at Foxy Magazine. Actually, um, I don't know that one. Yeah, uh, it was actually one of the first jobs I, I got. I, I got kind of uh, kind of not not really offered, but like I was like, "Hey, you should work here." And I was like, "Oh, cool!" It, it was actually to write the the descriptions of the movies in the back of the DVD cases. Oh wow! Which which would have been a cool job, not probably not a job that would have last for lasted very long. But I, I would just be watching movies and summarizing them for the back of the DVD. The just doing the blurbs. Yeah, just doing the blurbs. That's yeah, kind of you know? funny, man. Yeah, that would have been a good job. But I was like, you know what? I'm not, I'm not really sure if I, I'm ready for to have porn on my resume quite yet. Straight out of college, you know, just like I'm, not I'm, as the first thing. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah, kind of the thing. That it would have been the first thing, but but yeah, I actually had some restraint. I was like, I don't know if I want porn on my resume, like like the first thing on the resume, you know, the very first thing, you know, twenty one years old, fresh out of college, you know. <laughs> you leave it off the resume, but it's a good it's a good job just to have the stories. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, just to yeah. have the stories. I, I thought about on. it. I thought I really wanted to do it just for the bit, but whatever. You know, yeah, just to be able to say I did that. You know, and and also look at the check out the back of this VHS. I wrote this blur. Exactly, you know? exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. And you know what else I miss about magazines? I'm not even sure if this culture still exists to some degree, but like the zines and the DIY mags and stuff like mm-hmm. that, like the the like sort of the homemade, whether that was a punk rock thing or a local skate magazine, the things you could get on the newsstand that people just threw together. Mm-hmm. With like xerography and staples, you know, it was like so cool. You could just get a taste of like, and who knows, some of those things, some of the magazines, the mainstream magazines started as those little, you know, thousand print, tiny little runs done from somebody's home office or somebody's kitchen table, you know, that type of thing. Love all that stuff. But, you know, the other thing too, I don't know if you guys remember this magazine. I had just, it was probably started in the early 90s and ended sometime by the mid 90s. There was a British Super Nintendo magazine called Super Play, and it was really beautiful. I'm not sure if it was monthly or bi-monthly. It was one of those things where you couldn't just get it. Obviously, it was British. Obviously, it was dealing with Japanese. It was dealing really with Super Famicom, interestingly enough. And it was hard to get on your general newsstands. But if you were in the city, like if, if I could get into Canal Street, you know, at like a Japanese spot, or if I could get into Philly at like a Tower Books, you could find it. And it was just really beautiful, really beautifully crafted, gorgeous quality. The art director had a really, mm. um, a really specific anime art style that he illustrated everything to. It was gorgeous. It was kind of like an anime Super Nintendo magazine, very expensive. I remember it was like 10 bucks even in the mid 90s. But I would pick it up. There was Tower Books next to my school. And for the art magazines, Super Play I would put in this category. But like when I used to get Juxtapose Magazine or High Fructose, the art magazines, for me, I like to have those just for reference. Like, oh, let me just pick up this magazine, flip through it and get inspired by something. You know, there's a there's an artist in there that they're showcasing or whatever. That was the same thing with more so than with the video game magazines, which I like to read. As Gene was saying, the old music magazines, the skateboarding magazines, you you know, you want to peruse through and read about what's going on in skating, or maybe they went on a trip to Barcelona, or you want to read somebody's interview, plus look at the pictures. With the art magazines, it was like just having that to pick up. I still appreciate that. Like sometimes you don't want to Google everything. You just want to pick up a magazine and just get inspired by something or, or rediscover something you haven't seen in a while. There's something special about magazines that that they have that it's not the internet's way too curated it's not random you know what i mean so you can't there's there's something really kind of magical about just picking up a magazine or going through your old stack of magazines like oh shit you know check this guy out oh i remember this band i remember this movie i remember this specific article 
It's pretty neat, man. I mean, I took my son to, he's been bugging. He's like a big, I call him a tech bro. He's like super into computers. He wants to build a computer right now. So Cog, you could speak to this. So I finally took him to a micro center. We had never been to a micro center before. Oh yeah, I know about those. Right. So Mm -hmm. there's not that many around. So it's like, think about, it's like Best Buy, but much more, Mm -hmm. let's put it this way. You could go food shopping at a 7-Eleven or you could go, you could go food shopping at a Wegmans. You know what I mean? Going food shop, going computer shopping at Best Buy is like going to 7-Eleven. Going to micro centers is like going to Wegmans. You got everything, right? So he was like in his glory. I'm so bored. Like I'm not a tech guy at all. So I went right over to the magazine rack and found they had a magazine that was just, I wish I remember the title of it, but it was just visual development art for video games. Like that was the entire thing. Like either working illustrators or aspiring illustrators that are working in or trying to work in video games. Flipping through this magazine the whole time. And I was like, wow, I can't believe such a specific magazine in print still exists. Yeah. Must be very a very expensive endeavor. I think that's why the cover prices are so costly because they have to justify still doing it, you know, still yeah. working in print medium and the rarity of paper and the way COVID kind of sent, you know, kind of it kind of pushed back publishing, especially with comic books and stuff mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. Everything exactly. went on, on on a delay and a backlog. But I love the fact, this is such a great topic, Micah, because I love the fact that we're still talking about magazines and they still exist today in some form, even though it's largely diminished from what we once knew. And I worry about, I, I worry and I think about their staying power, like how it's hard not to think that sort of it's the beginning of the end in some way, even though we're still seeing it, there's still new magazines coming out, which is interesting. But it's hard to think that it's going to last. Um, what do you guys think about that? I mean, what do you, what do you, what do you, what's your outlook if you had to predict how much longer are we going to have these things? Yeah, I don't think much longer, sadly. You know, obviously we come from that era and um, mm. everything is just so online based. And, you know, I know comic books, we, we talked about briefly, you know, I, I remember seeing the Marvel subscription and it's like, you can have the entire catalog and, you know, all this <laughs> kind of stuff. And Oh, it's crazy. Know, yeah. You would yeah, just all so, kinds of comics, you know? Oh, big time, big yeah. time. You mentioned Wizard, and I'll also jump in, but to your initial question, yeah, I think that the days are really numbered. Um, it, it's, 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 a, it's a forgotten era, you know, yeah. and, and people really want quick access now. You know, they want to be able to jump on that computer, you know, Google search and get what they want immediately. And then I just think people are less social. You know, we, we don't go out as much. And like, and, and then the business of it, just as simple as that, the business of the justifying the cost to do print media, you know, for that thing. And I'll just jump into to, to my suggestions because this was a good topic, uh, Michael. Um, for me, definitely game magazines probably were the start of it. Mm. Um, a lot of you mentioned a lot, like Electronic Gaming Monthly was huge for me, huge for me. Those covers, that was the days of like, you know, the box art you would buy a game because of the box. <laughs> you didn't know what the game was, but you, you know, you kind of, you kind of got, you know, enthralled by that kind of stuff, but game pro um, gene, you mentioned a fantastic point with game informer. I think, I don't know how that deal came about where if you became a game stop member, you became subscribed to the magazine. Mm-hmm. And every time you extended your membership, you would ex- extend that new thing. That, that to me, was ingenious as far as getting subscription, you know, and I became really infatuated with Game Informer. G- G- Game Informer, little known fact, but for at least for a while, the New York mm-hmm. Times, Game Informer had more subscribers than the New York Times. Wow. You know? I believe it. Holy yeah, I believe shit. It. It, just, the New York Times man. is the number one sus- subscribe media organization in, in the United States right now, you know? I would love to know the business structure of that deal, how they were able to penetrate GameStop and make mm. them the default magazine mm. for being a member, right? That to me just bolstered their, their user base. And I was always a part of it <laughs> every time. So you got I that. Inf- I think Game Informer is owned by GameStop. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 is yeah, that right? Owned. I didn't know that. Yeah, it was owned by Funko Land. Funko, oh, yes, yeah. the old so, school so Funko. When, yeah, so when Funko Land got, got absorbed into GameStop, then that's what happened. So shout Yeah, man, that Funko. was a big deal. Oh, um, I want to shout out. Funko Land was where I got all my games, man. Oh, yeah. yeah. I Funko. wish I did. I wish I got them at those prices back then. 
<laughs> five that, cents for a Nintendo game. It's like <laughs> get those bad trading values. <laughs> oh my god, those are the days. Yep. Ooh, that was the era of getting ripped off. My yep, change your whole life away for, for some credit. <laughs> no, that, that's that's still how it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I actually got a bunch of games that I've actually I've, I've actually been meaning to go to GameStop right now to trade in a bunch of mm-hmm. games. You know, it's just easier that way, you know, instead of you know, yeah, I, I lose 50 bucks, but, you know. Whatever. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Whatever. But it's so, convenient, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that part there. And then um, what I was going to say, I want to shout out a good friend, uh, Ryan McCaffrey. Um, OXM was big for me. Um, mm. Getting the disc and the demo disc mm. and being able to play sometimes new releases on your Xbox and mm-hmm. things of that nature because of the, because of the magazine. It, it, the disc was included. I thought that was cool. Um, man, Gene, you named a lot. Um, obviously in black culture, the word up, the jets, the mm. source magazine, source. The source magazine, of course, you know, as a hip hop connoisseur, that was our Bible. That was like, wow, what, who is Nas? What is this Illmatic album? What five mics in the source? This mm-hmm. is like the mm-hmm. perfect album. Tribe Called Quest got five mics mm-hmm. for beat, beat rock. Like it made you now, I have to know about this artist in this group. I have to find out. Mm-hmm. So that was, you know, before things got corrupted later on, <laughs> With crazy, with them. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. but but at the time it was sacred it, it also like unsigned hype who's oh who's bob deep what what is this like you, you would learn about these new groups and these new artists because of it so the source was huge for me um it's funny for fashion later was probably east bay i don't know if you guys heard of east bay and yeah. like so east bay went, it was just literally sneakers and like you could just mm-hmm. order like Jordans and all these unique styles of Nikes yep. and Adidas and mm-hmm. and ship to your house. That was a big deal for us. Um, oh, going, wow. going way back, I mm-hmm. would say I was in, big in the WWF. The WWF magazine mm-hmm. was huge mm-hmm. for us. Hell yeah, that was so good too. Yeah, yeah, man. I was a big. Wow. I re- I remember vividly. I was such a big Ultimate Warrior fan. So at the time, it was Babyface versus Babyface. That never happened. Was Hogan versus Warrior WrestleMania six? Mm-hmm. And I told, I was like, my hero's gonna win. Like I, I was, I believe so much in Ultimate Warrior, and he did it. And I remember waking up, just going to school that next day, going to the, the newsstand, picking up the copy of the WF magazine, him holding the two titles, and you know, coming in like parading to school. Like, like, yes, I this remember is that image. Dude, they, they, they used to publish that shit so fast, man. How so did they do fast. that? Oh, How did they bro, do that back then, man? So fat. Like oh, they, the pay per view was like a few days before. I yeah, lived on Guam. The, the How did they shit? How did they get that shit all the way out, like fifty thousand miles out in the Pacific Ocean? And and I was still getting that shit like right away. Holy shit, that's crazy. quick. Bro, two titles in his hand, face paint off. I'm parading. I remember school. that image. Oh, there was a time man. where like fifty oh, percent of the kids yes. in the school had that. Dude, <laughs> so sick. So thanks. Yeah, man, that that was a big deal. Um, you mentioned also what is it? ESPN magazine. Obviously, the um, the body issue. I mean, there were certain things to look at in in the body <laughs> issue. The curvature of the Fubin forms. Very. <laughs> Are you talking swimsuit issue right now, my friend? Hey. All right. Okay. Oh, man. The swimsuit <laughs> issue is of Sports Illustrated, set. though. Sports Illustrated, man. Got, got many a young man through tough times. <laughs> is that still a thing? Do they still print those? They said that. They, 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 they still, like, they, they're, they're a whole issue now because people are, are, are mad because they're getting woke because they're, 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 they're putting thick girls on them now. <laughs> For me, I'm totally happy with that, man. I love that shit. <laughs> I love it. Ooh. They look and I got to throw. I got to throw back for you. Um, one thing I remember when my grandparents were alive is getting the TV guide. Remember the TV mm. guide? Thing? Yes. The TV guide. That, that's an error in itself, mm-hmm. right? Like, think about that. Dude. Regular TV and then cable and all that stuff comes out later. But TV guide was a big thing to learn about programming, sure. what's coming mm-hmm. on and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So it's so it's so interesting to see how 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 essential it was magazines were to the culture and to see how, you know, that fade fading away. But to your point, Mikey, yeah, my mom always had like better homes and, you know, th- those kind of things and the recipe stuff and the cooking stuff. And it's just, it, it, to me, it's sadly, it's, it's, it's from an era that's going to be forgotten, but I really cherish it. It was, it was a lot of my fondest memories and you learned a lot during that era, especially if you were something in a very specific niche or specific category mm-hmm. and you had that magazine that covered it. You really look forward to that monthly subscription getting mailed to your house and, yeah. and going to pick that thing up. That's a big deal. So mm. cool. Cog, you know, you mentioned uh, TV Guide. I think people, there were some people, like a contingent of folks who collected those like comic books. Like they had to get yes. every one of mm-hmm, them, mm-hmm. right? Which oh, is yeah. so interesting to me. And then Micah had mentioned this earlier, but a magazine like Jet, I was just looking up real quick, went away. The print version went away in 2014. So 10 years ago, still online. But the source 
The I was source. very interested in you talking about that cog because yeah. the source, and not to you know, not to be uh, not to overstate this, but that really was a trusted source of like, you know what I mean. The people that wrote for that magazine that worked for that magazine were really you could rely on them for you know what the, whatever they review they gave mm-hmm. of hip hop acts old and new. So I wanted to look them up, and something interesting because I was completely tuned out. They seem to be, they, it looks like they publish annually or it says semi-annually. So I guess they exist online, but they still publish an issue or two actually in print form oh, wow. per year, one per two per year, which I've never heard of. Mm. Very interesting. That's the frequency. And their circulation, they say, is still about 200,000. Wow. So pretty interesting. Yeah. You know what I mean? Especially because hip hop has changed, but I mean, you could argue hip hop as big as it's ever, as ever been. Mm-hmm. Right, although it's largely changed from the hip hop we grew up with, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> although you know, old, old school classic hip hop exists in some form, but it's much different now. So that's interesting that you know we're in this phase of even the print mags, the larger print mags, holding on. But you got to you got to think, right, that this is kind of the last gasp for print, which is kind of sad, you know, because that was a way to I think. Having these magazines, whether you got the subscription or you picked them up like an idiot on the newsstand like I did and didn't save money as a kid, that was the way to express your fandom of things you were really enthusiastic yes. about. Big time. Right? Whether it's music or skateboarding mm-hmm. or local or you know, you know, whatever sport you were into. I mean, there was all the I remember the big like uh, hunting magazines and <laughs> there were like martial arts magazines. I used oh, to yeah, love yeah. going to Tower Books and just seeing like, you know, oh my God, there's a magazine for that. There's a magazine for that. There was a magazine for everything. Everything. You know? So mm-hmm. it's uh, it's sad. I wonder if you look at like, what what was the, what was the, the era where it reached a crescendo? Let's say like 1990, right? Where that was, it was at its, at its greatest heights. And you look at it compared to now. I wonder what, I wonder how much it's diminished over that time. But I bet it's a lot. Yeah, you know, yeah, titles that have gone away or just went online or just completely folded, and you know what I mean. But there, there was there was a time where you could there was something for everybody. If you went to a newsstand, oh yeah, you could get newsstand. something that you were interested in. And and then, and then you had the angry store owner to get mad at you if you you read the book too long <laughs> and you didn't buy it. So come on, guys, like. <laughs> Because you know the guys at the house, you try to be in there and read the whole thing. Hell yeah. Because <laughs> you had the money for the book or whatever reason. People would do that. It was a whole newsstand magazine culture inside that shop. 100%. You know, kind of it's not a library, right? Yes, like how many correct. times do we hear that? It's not a library. Yes. Pony up the four bucks for the magazine. Right? Exactly. Dude, it's so, so cool. Um, yeah, man. And you know, it's just, it's so weird to think, like, I just look at it through skateboarding, like through the lens of skating, like we probably had six or seven magazines at one point. If you just took not just national or North American, but if you looked globally, there was a lot of mainstream magazines and we're probably down to one that's printed monthly, which is maybe two if you take it, the newer cons- uh, magazines into consideration. But again, some of these magazines that just started, have you guys noticed this too? There's a magazine that's launched within the last five years. You're paying twenty dollars for it, an issue. You know what I mean? It's that expensive. So it's you know it's gone up. I mean, talk about triple in price. It's probably gone up yeah. ten times in price yeah, since insane. we were kids. Mm-hmm. Um, so you really have to be enthusiastic because you're kind of you're kind of uh, you know what I mean. You're showing your support uh, with that wallet. You know. Oh yeah. And that's I think that's where you could see the death knell. You know, where it's like, all right, it's it's not even sustainable. Like the twenty dollars for a magazine, like you gotta really want that magazine. You know what I mean? So yeah, speaking with your wallet's one thing. But yeah, I mean, who knows? I don't know. You know, I thought I thought books were going away. Books aren't go books are as strong as they've ever been, right? So actually, who knows? Book, actually books uh had a far better growth in sales than video games did last year. Is that right? Wow. Yep. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah, that's impressive. Wow. Yeah. Video game. People keep saying that video games aren't in trouble, but video games. Video games didn't grow last year. It's exactly what Phil Spencer says. You know, mm. he's not lying when he says that. The, the, they didn't sell that well. Books sold more than video games, at least in terms wow, of like incredible. you know the percentage growth, right? Yeah. yeah. Growth. Sure. Sure. But still, 
you know, we were. No, I'm not saying books are making more money than video games, but like, yeah, you know, books books are healthier than ever now. Actually, it's amazing. Yeah, and I'm New. actually getting back into books now, actually too. You know, it's it's good. So who knows? Ma- magazines might still be around too. You know, who, who knows? Yeah, you might see a turnaround. You know what I mean? Yeah. You never really know. It is interesting that they're not sort of on a similar trajectory because you think they would be. It's kind of mysterious in a way. Especially because I, I, magazines I think, are generally I think it really just goes back well. to what Micah said, that 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 news, newspapers are in trouble right now. Micah mm. was so smart when she said this. Newspapers are in trouble right now because we're so fucking generalist. You know? Uh, we don't. We have everything, and it's like. But but if you're subscribing to something right now these days, you you subscribe because you you're subscribing for a purpose. And if if a if a magazine or a newspaper is just throwing whatever at you, then what purpose is there? What is the purpose? Why are you subscribing? You know, if you can't figure it out, then then you just stop it. You know. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Yeah. You know, Gene, you also mentioned something earlier that I wanted to speak to. I think you were saying, um, in your area, your neck of the woods, Washingtonian magazine. That's a good thing I would recommend to people too. I know I love Philadelphia magazine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as a, you know, as somebody who lives in the area, you could really stay informed about your city, about the suburbs, the people, what's going on in your town, the so restaurants. What I took, that's exactly that's so that's exactly why I took uh, my good friends and uh, content creators Wooly versus and Super Eye Patch Wolf over mm. to uh, DC's number one rated strip club, the Good Guy Club. Because I heard about it through Washingtonian Magazine, and Washingtonian Magazine told me, "Hey, the food here is pretty, actually, pretty legit. You should check it out." So I checked it out, and I was like, "Yeah, the food's good. Let's uh, let me bring, let me bring." Is some that food. what you were tweeting about? The really good food at the strip club was that the one? <laughs> yeah, 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 that was it. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good steak and eggs. I still, I still order food from there. You know, I always make sure that my Uber driver gets a, get gets a nice show. Uh, that, that, that's his tip right there. I don't, I don't leave tips. That's a tip. You know? Yeah, he just sees a little titty as he's getting my food. You know? <laughs> Congratulations. Satisfied. Steven. Man, satisfied. <laughs> Do you know if that's the same spot that Dave Chappelle mentions in his latest routine? Because he talks about when he's in town at, in DC, he always goes to, he's been going to the same spot, the same oh. strip club spot for years. You know what? And, it's not too far. Maybe that me. spot. I'm not sure. It's not too far from where he grew up. So it may be, you know? Yeah. I, I love it. Gee, it you took something I wonder, so I pure. About like, I wonder if that's where he goes to. You know, it's a good spot. They got, we went on a Sunday and there were good girls there. You know, so that's a surprise. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah, it, yeah. It, we went on a Sunday afternoon, and there were some some. some, some <laughs> oh, you would yeah. think that we would be the brunch, bro, for sure. So, oh man, yeah. yeah, yeah I was like, yeah. okay, you know, there were, usually you're getting the C-section the scars, and, you know, that's usually <laughs> what you're expected <laughs> in an afternoon strip club. <laughs> Mike can describe me way more accurately than I could have. That wild. was okay. wild accurate. <laughs> yeah, holy shit. Okay, but yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's a strip clubs might be a topic for another time. Not the purest topic. I could talk but, about that for, for, I can write a whole book. And you will be on that. I can write a whole book about it. Write a whole book about it. You will be on that. Many stories of, of, of bloody women, you know, just, just, just fighting each other, you know, just like, oh my goodness. <laughs> All right, Gene, you're hosting that episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah I should host, host that one. one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, gotta host. you gotta bring it on down. <laughs> That's a single topic episode. Single yes. topic That's episode. Clearly. Oh my God. Sunday afternoon strip club is just, it makes me so sad. It makes me sad for the clients and it makes me sad for the girls. It really. <laughs> hey, we made, we made sure they had fun. We made sure we were there to make okay, sure they all had right. fun. So, yeah. <laughs> Micah, on that note, did we, uh, did we serve your topic? Did we do it justice? No, this was fantastic. And I got to give a shout out as well as the only woman here. I got to give a shout out to Cosmopolitan mm, Magazine, yes. which for all the goofy shit that they put in there. All right. As a sheltered young woman back in the day, mm-hmm. they taught me a lot mm-hmm. about men, about intimacy. Now that they put some weird shit in there saying play his dick like a piano. They did. Mm-hmm. They, sure they sure did. did. Yeah. But you skip past that stuff because even even as a very naive youth, I said, that doesn't sound right. And it didn't. But shout out to Cosmopolitan, which was very important 
to the youth of my generation who we had a lot of the parents who were like, you're not allowed to go to sex ed. You're not allowed to do this, mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what? Cosmopolitan free online. Look at that. And you could go learn whatever you wanted. What? I'm really glad so you shout out that. to them. I'm so glad you mentioned that, Micah, <laughs> because Teen Cosmo and also Cosmopolitan was, was a great mm-hmm. uh, like like gateway into the mind of a woman, which didn't really work for me. You know, uh, the, the better uh, gateway was actually meeting women, right? But Yeah, some of their stuff is just yeah. flat out. Yeah. But, well, it's, but, uh, it's that old Dave that, joke, though. you know, how do you please your man in 50 ways by, by, by some women, you know, and it's like, <laughs> I think the guy should be writing about that. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, <laughs> literally, I remember reading an article that had said like, put a, and this is a hundred percent legit. And it was like, put a donut around his dick and eat it come on and that and i was like what the hell are you telling me like i'm not bringing a donut anywhere near the bedroom unless i'm just eating it like a normal (laughs) person like this is not happening and the lady in the article was like all i could find was donuts so i i ripped it in half and just held it and i was like what the like what is going on this explains so So much about my college years So there's a lot there's a lot in Cosmopolitan that was just like don't listen to that none of that's good advice all right you know but I, I, I mean I think I just remember why I hate tomatoes it's because my friend fucking told me that he used to fuck tomatoes all the time so <laughs> you know he was like, he was like no seem- no just 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 put a little just put a little slit yeah. into it it makes leave sense. it in the microwave for ten seconds and it's good yeah, I'm just like up. oh for fuck's warm sake up. man. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like in like I was maybe like sixth grade, so I think I think I think that might have been the reason why I don't like tomatoes. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad we figured it out. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks, Micah, especially. <laughs> I'm glad thanks, we got there. It does make another sense, therapy though. session success. Yeah, really got to the source of the problem there. <laughs> Beef, steak, tomato, Micah. I'm gonna blow your mind right now. Cosmopolitan. Right. I was just looking this up out of curiosity. First issue, March. 1886. Mm, Been in circulation for 138 years. Was it always so filthy? (laughs) I I wonder. I wonder about that. Like that pre, I think that predates donuts. (laughs) I mean, the funny thing about this too, before we cut this off, is that magazines, when there was something unexpectedly dirty Mm. in a magazine, Mm. like my mom used to get Women's Day. All right. And on the cover, it's like, here's Patricia Heaton talking about how she lost 15 pounds, whatever. And then I would be just scrolling through the magazine. Right. And you'd get to a page and it'd be like, ask the doctor. And one of them, literally, I saw this. I was like 10 years old. It changed my life. It was like, doctor, my husband's complaining about blue balls. What is that? And I remember being like, wait a minute. This is my Women's Day magazine, Patricia Heaton from Everybody Loves Raymond is on the cover oh, right. yeah, and yeah. it's talking about this. And I remember being like, I'm going to read this and I'm going to learn about the world. And so <laughs> it was just one of those unexpected things though, in what you thought was just your mom's wholesome magazine full of mac and cheese recipes and whatnot. And bam, just random ladies writing in questions. <laughs> I mean, it was just, there was something about it. There was something about the the mystery of it all. It was an education. You never knew what you'd get. Yeah. An education and miseducation. And look, if you still want raunchy food sex advice, I think it looks like still circulation of three mil and oh, it's published oh. in print form quarterly. Oh. So still sort of <laughs> giving girls weird advice. Oh my God. I mean, the weird... I, I got. I have to say. It. I have to say it. One of the weirdest ones. If anyone has ever just rubbed their teeth on your member, Cosmopolitan told them to do that. I remember reading that. I remember saying not to bite. Don't use the teeth. Why? But it just said just rub them back and forth like a corn on the cob. And I was like, that <laughs> sounds not weird. That sounds We're not well, doing that. Let's, let's <laughs> what was so If anyone ever tried that on you, it. it's Cosmopolitan. Yeah, you know what? Fuck you, Cosmopolitan. They, they tell them women some weird <laughs> shit. <laughs> I was out here. They wild it out. Damn. I don't understand <laughs> what is going on with Cosmopolitan. And this is worth a deeper dive for yes. sure. We yeah. have to see what was good. What miscreants were <laughs> filling the heads of young girls <laughs> for over for almost a century and a half, by the way. Still going. So I don't know. I don't now I don't want it to stop though. You know what I mean? I don't want it to stop. That if this is what's been going on, because we don't know, you're looking at three guys that, you know, I, I think I could speak for Gene as well. Pretty sure I could speak for me and Cog. Never opened. I had sisters. I still yeah, never opened, you know. Never one of those. Yeah. 
No. Teen Magazine. 17. That was another one. It was like just seeing what was on the cover. It was like, is that age appropriate? I'm not sure. That's You're not even legal. Why is there sex advice on the 17? I don't know. There's a lot of weird shit going on with that. Why is it okay? I don't know. I I really don't know. Micah, this might be worth a part two. You know, there's a lot going on here to uncover. We got, we'll have Gene on. He could do his journalistic thing. Yeah. You know what? We'll do... We'll do one specific to Cosmopolitan magazine, and we'll all try and find the weirdest tips <laughs> we could get from it. I think it bears some investigation. Mm. I, th- I really think I, I'm, I'm worried. <laughs> I'm worried about it. <laughs> I'm worried. My dad listens to this show, so I've already I know I've, I've already said too much. It's over. <laughs> I like it though. Hey, it's cathartic. You know what I mean? We're opening up. You know, if I could, if I could admit that I peed myself in my aunt's bathroom and then used her throw rug to clean my jeans off and then flipped it over so she wouldn't see that her pink bathroom rug was turned <laughs> blue from the denim. If I could admit that 20 years later, you know, there's a statute of limitations. Listen, this was a while ago, right? So dad, Watson, don't, don't, don't worry, my friend. You're <laughs> All right, my friends, topic number three today, kick it over to Gene Park. Gene, take it away, my friend. Yeah, real quick. Uh, you know, I've been traveling uh, for the past three months, which is crazy because I haven't traveled at all since the, the beginning of the pandemic. So to get on a train uh, to New York in January, get on a plane to Vegas, then get on a train again to, to New York City for the live show, uh, it's pretty exhausting, but also got me thinking about transportation and the various ways we have traveled their lives. I think about my first car. Um, my first car was a 2006 Toyota Corolla. Yes. Um, and uh, just a four door, just a basic car. And, you know, we used to call that, we used to call that the crazy mobile because all kinds of crazy, <laughs> crazy shit would happen in it, you know, and it was a reliable car. And the, the, the good thing about it is that it's like, it's a pretty cheap car. So you can just kind of bang it up and everything like that. And I was driving drunk the whole time uh, so so you know i was like like hitting curves and, and and all kinds of things that i shouldn't have been hitting um and then uh and then i took that car uh all the way to hawaii um and i've told the story on twitter before but uh i couldn't afford to to actually ship the car over because that would have cost like a couple thousand dollars oh, so nice. i actually had a pilot friend of mine uh he gave me a hookup he says i can take your car but I have to load it up with a bunch of fish first, so then we can we can we can count the car as a fishing like like vessel or whatever. Um, so yeah, so sure enough, we loaded the, my car up with boxes and boxes of, of fresh fish, and put it on put it on his plane. Uh, it, it was it, the, my my car was smelling for like months. Like, it was ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but sure enough, and and the car also took a long time because he needed to wait for the, the correct fish ship, shipment to to send it over. So for a while in Hawaii, I was actually without a car. Uh, and I got my car back, and it was great. Um, that that car got banged up by a couple of accidents. Not even my fault. Like like I I had the car in college in in California, and a professor banged it up into banged into me. You know, which oh is crazy. no way. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, dude, what the hell, man? <laughs> you know, that, that that was actually my first accident. And actually, my second accident was actually when I was on the way to my job interview uh, with Nintendo. <laughs> Uh, the first job I ever applied to out of college was actually with Golan Harris, which is a PR firm for Nintendo. Oh, shit. And they still are the PR firm for Nintendo. Um, huge PR firm. Uh, their, their number one client is McDonald's. Um, wow. So, yeah, I got into car accident then. I was all nervous and everything like that. Um, and then my second car was a 2012 uh, Hyundai Elantra. Um, and that was a, a two door sedan, uh, heck, all, all kind of mo- modern goodies with a back camera and like, you know, Bluetooth and everything like that looked really slick. And then I got arrested for drunk driving the, ne- the next year. So I had to equip that with a breathalyzer and everything. Oh, wow. Um, and, then, and then, and then when I moved to DC, I was like, I guess I can't take this car. Cause I, I sure as hell, I don't have any more pilot friends to, 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 to stack this car up with shit, <laughs> with fish to, to fly it from Hawaii to the East coast of, of the United States of America. Dude. So I sold the car, and then since then I haven't had a car. But yeah, just think about the, the uh, you know the, the vehicles that you that, that have taken you around uh, in your lives. Um, and I, how did you first learn for learn, first learn how to drive? You know, I keep thinking about how Mike is always driving uh, Colin around. 
But uh, I, I distinctly remember my first driving lesson. Um, and it actually ties into the, the, the martial arts story that we, we will talk about later. But the guy that I took the, my first driving exam with was actually my Taekwondo uh, uh, classmate. And he was Korean too. And like, I was going crazy on, on the gas because I thought like, this is my first lesson. So I thought, you know, it's like video games, you know, you're supposed to, you're supposed to press down as hard as you can. And that's when you go, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then, so I did that and I spun out of control. And then my, my, my Taekwondo classmate was in the background and he was like yelling at me in Korea, like, Jukure, Jukure, which is, which means you want to die? You want to die, motherfucker? You know? <laughs> You weren't wrong, G. You weren't wrong. You have to. That's how you have to do it. I, yeah, I yeah, yeah. Um, but and I actually didn't get my license until I was about twenty years old. Um, because because that, that, that I tried to get it in high school and I, it just didn't work out. And then when I finally went to college, I, I got my license and I got my car then. So, but yeah, I just want to hear about your your your, your vehicles over the years too. I love this yeah, one. I mean, I'm going to hand it over to Cog first because Cog's got to depart a yeah. little. He's got to leave us sadly a little early today. So I want to throw this over to Cog. And then yeah. for my epi- my topic later, Cog, I already mm-hmm. promised you we're going to do kind of an iteration, a part two to okay. have you back on because I definitely yeah, want your, you. Brought, as I said, you brought the shirt. Need, you clearly brought gee, the shirt. Me hype. Mm. But right now, you want to hear about the Cogmobile, you know? The cargo, <laughs> yeah, man. Funny, I have, a, I have an interesting transportation story as well. So for me, you know, living in New York City, South Bronx, New York, you don't need a vehicle. It's just real. Like, there's so much public transportation everywhere: buses, train, sure. ferry. Like it, you really, it's a luxury to have a car. It isn't expensive. So I went without a car for a long time, and then probably like mid twenties. Then I'm like, all right, I'm trying to figure mm-hmm. out the career, what's going on. And it was IT. And I remember getting certified, you know, I kept my A plus certification and in, in PC repair networking. And so I'm like, all right, I'm ready to hit, you know, the, the job market. And it was really tough. Like when I got certified, it was right around 9-11. Mm. 9-11 just happened. Oh, wow. So what was happening was a lot of senior level IT guys were taking all the entry level jobs as people were looking, looking for oh, work. Oh, sure. So, they're like, hey, entry level job, but you have no experience. So I'm like, well, how am I supposed to get experience? Yeah. <laughs> so I was just struggling to find work. <laughs> and I'm like applying now out of state, like mm. Connecticut and other places. Mm. And then they were like, well, there was one gig and they were like, if you have a driver's license in a car, you know, we can you can interview and you can apply. So I said that I did when I didn't. That's crazy. That's uh, but, crazy, man. You, yeah, that's awesome, man. I love lying, lying, lying on job applications. <laughs> Bro, I yeah. had to hustle. Nobody was hiring me. Like, I would go on so many. I would be a bridesmaid on so many interviews. Mm. And I'm like, bro, these are entry-level jobs where you're telling me I don't got no experience and I'm losing the people with 10 years experience. How am I going to get work? So it was this only job that was willing to hear me out. It was the old, um, you got, what's the guys? Uh, Philip Morris. They're called Outria now. But they, you know, cigarettes. Sure. Ball, what was it? Marlboro and what is the other thing? The candy and the beer, Miller beer and whatever. All the three things that they made, yeah, yeah. that was the company that I was doing IT for. So I go out there and I was like, okay, the job interview was like two weeks. I got to get a license in two weeks and I got to get a car mm. in two, <laughs> two to three weeks. So I found some like like Midtown driving school. We could get you a license in one week. I did double lessons. It was crazy. Like my mom thought I was nuts. So I was like, I got to get this thing. And um, the hardest part I remember was kind of like the, um, you know, parallel parking and then, you know, three point turn and stuff like that and just getting acclimated. So I worked so hard to, to get the license. I ended up getting it. And at the time, me and my mom's relationship wasn't the greatest, but she saw how hard I was mm-hmm. working and she was just like, mm-hmm. all right. I'm going to help you with that, put down on that car mm. for your insurance. Because one thing about New York, as far as the um, driver's insurance, like if you're a first time driver, your insurance is going to oh, be crazy. Sure. Mm. Through the roof. Mm. So yeah. she had a license already. She didn't drive, but it, I, being under her name would really reduce everything. Mm. So I got that. And I'll never forget, I went to a Toyota dealership. It was a 99 Toyota 4Runner. It was an uh, SUV. Nice car. Yeah, it was Hell nice. Yeah, I wanted to get the black one, but the white one had the grill on it, and it had less miles. I was like, man, this thing had the uh, brown leather interior, little sunroof. I, I, it, 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 it was nice. It was nice. So we got that joint, and I remember brand new, well, used car, and going to um, my first job interview, and I nailed the job interview, and I was working there for about three, four years. But yeah, that was my first car. Um, then after that, I kind of got into the 
the Rover scene. I was a big, you know, the, the Range nice. Rover. That, what? That, that was like the the status in the hood. If you had a Hell Range, yeah, dude. you was the dude. <laughs> so I had the I had the Forerunner for a long time, right? And it was a super reliable truck. But then once I started making a little bit more money later on, it was like time to get that Range. <laughs> So <laughs> yeah, so we we did that. I did that. But um, as far as yeah, transportation, I, I've always loved having a vehicle. I think for me, it was the freedom to go when I want, when I wanted, mm. and I just love sometimes the the mindless just driving or road trip. I, the scenic nature of it, it's it just really refreshing. And I remember you'd be surprised. I used to do road trips to DC all the time hang out in georgetown hang out in the clubs i got like i would do stuff like that i do philly or i do philly nice. all the time Megan. yep so That's like sick. i just love that idea of like yo what are we doing this week Look, let's just go or obviously jersey shore where that's big sure. for us you know what i'm saying kind of thing so i'm from new york to jersey shore so that was big and then as far as transportation in general um when I was younger, you'd be surprised. I was actually a skateboarder for a little bit. Oh, I didn't know this. Well, a little bit. Yeah, a little oh. bit. It was. I had a phase. I had a phase. The big wide boards, the, the, um, I forgot what type of wheels they used to call them, but, and like they used to have like these designs. Sure. Like, like these really, yeah, very impactful design. So I had my run. I was actually decent for, I wasn't doing no stuff like you and PJ, <laughs> but I wasn't that good. I was I wasn't good enough to go to like the ramps and all yeah, that, yeah. but local and kicking around and stuff like so that and cool. doing my little ollies and tricks and stuff here and there. Yeah, yeah, I used to do that for I a little didn't bit. Know. Now, what year? Give me an approximation for a year. I'll try to pin guess. down. This is this is eighties. This is late eighties. Whenever when Gene can help me nail the year that. When did LL Cool J's Bad album come out? So like that year that and the year, like two years before is when I was doing it. I don't know. I remember. So I would say like it had to be like eighty. Let's say maybe 84, 85. Oh, wow. You, would be, you predated me with that. Okay. Yeah, because I yeah, just so 87. 87. I had about 87. A, yeah, I had a 87. 87. Okay, there we go. I had about a two-year run where I was heavy into okay. it. Okay. I was doing a while. Then that graduated to the BMX Hell bikes. Yeah. And then that graduated to the mountain bikes. And we used to do the um this thing called the, the bike a We would go from like the we go like a five borough tour, Bronx, Central Park, oh, all the way New York. Like it was like eight nine of us kids with these mountain bikes yeah bro that was a big That's deal so, so cool. now, yeah transportation is always a thing and obviously you know the trains and um now when we talk about recently you know i'm a huge fan of the acela and amtrak and and taking that from boston when i go to pax and all the way down to dc and flying fly like crazy so yeah transportation is always always big for me as, as a whole but yeah i love this topic because Getting that car was a big deal for me. I, I do remember it was all—it was literally the birth of my IT career because I had to have all these things happen that I lied about that I didn't necessarily have I love it. <laughs> to make it happen and then show up and get this job and then nail the interview. My mom was super proud of me. She was like, okay, I know you Something. loved IT at that point. That's some serious fake it till you make it shit. Now, Cog, listen, yeah, I'm go. a huge car guy. I always wanted Let's a Range go. Rover. You got to tell me more about this Range Rover. Give me the model oh. year. What did you have? The color. And I, you know what else I want to oh. know? They're no, they're Let's beautiful go. cars. I love them. Beautiful. Notorious for electrical problems, though. Did you have yes. any problems with that? I did have the electrical problem, but I will say that, the, the, see, the key for me is that four-wheel drive and that that downhill being able to really control yeah. it. Like, it, it is so superb off the vehicle like in new york when the snow and, and especially in the Bronx, there's a lot of hills so when you have that thing i forgot what they call that traction sure. control that it whatever you're on a descent you still have control of the vehicle it's huge it's a it's a big deal but yes had, had electrical issues did here. it really yeah. they yeah, can't get that together like, man. man they make a beautiful oh, car up. but like get the electrical yeah. shit i never had a brit i never owned a british car of any kind. Mm. But Range Rovers mm. still, to me, not only are they iconic and iconically European, but they're just so yes. pretty. They're just such a yes. pretty car. That's my, they're I gorgeous. the look of it. Yeah, like the body. I got it. The body of it, it has to look. If I'm going to spend this money, it got to look oh, nice yeah, to me. So the body of those, I love the shape of them. Yeah, absolutely. That all Because I, I struggle with trying to figure out if, when I, if I do get a luxury vehicle, what would I get? And that was the only one that kind of checked every box for me and and always was the the look obviously the body but also something that really does well off-road and in snow 
Mm. And I, I I go for like when it was like I would get excited when it was like four or five inches. You're like, I'm ready for this. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready. Let's go. Who want to go to White this. Castles? Who want to go to <laughs> <laughs> like I'm that dude. I'm everybody trying to dig their car. I'm acting like it's a normal day or four wheel. <laughs> I was a little out of control. It was good. Right? I like it. Oh, it felt good. It felt Cog, good. you know what I see you in? I see you in What'd a G wagon. I just see you in a G wagon, man. Ooh. I just think that's the next step for you. I'm not trying to spend your money. The G? But right. I see you in a G wagon. I don't know what it okay. is about the G. Because, yeah. you know, it has all those things. It's it's pretty, it's very yeah. iconic looking, but also amazing. Like, did you ever see the footage of the G wagon just climbing straight up the wall? Oh, it's sick. Just go straight up it's the sick. wall. It's yeah, like it's all sick. but right. a wall. Yeah, right now, after I had a couple problems with, with the Rover, then I kind of downgrade. Right, I'm leasing right now, but I downgrade it to the, dis- the Disco Sport, Discovery Sport. I really like the Oh, car. my wife likes that car. I like the Disco Sport. It, it's really it's cool. It's a smaller it, Range Rover. It, it's a smaller yeah. range and it does everything I need to do with the same functionality. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't know where I'm going to be, you know, moving wise, city wise. So let me just lease for now. And I was doing that. And I, I love the disco sport. It's sleek, man. It's that's nice. a nice car. So that, that's what I'm calling it. All now. right, good. And I hope you don't have electric. Yeah. I, don't, I haven't heard electric. Before. No, I haven't had any issues. Oh, good, with that good. Car. That's awesome. Dude. Yeah. Oh, dude. I, 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 that, I'm, 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 I shouldn't be impressed. It's cog, but I'm impressed. I'm a little bit impressed. That that was that was fun, man. I mean, listen, um, Cog has to say goodbye to us. Uh, I'm sorry to see him go. I always love having him on Constellation. We'll do it again. He's gonna miss my topic, but I promised we're gonna bring that topic back in another. I feel like you could do this topic that I'm gonna do in a little while, three four times, easy. Yes, different yes. iterations. So, um, but I understand how it is. You got duty calls. Cog has an important job with an important company. You know. Um, it's time bigger and better things than LSM. <laughs> Listen, <That's what> <laughs> <laughs> all love, all LSM love. I appreciate it. Uh, this is this is super fun. Really like these topics as always. Steli in the building. They finally, me and Mike could get a chance Woo! to party together. That was awesome. I didn't realize that you guys were saying before yeah. the show. You very rare. This was the this is the first actual LSM, right? Or no, yeah, you guys. Yeah. Micah was on Duke. No, yeah. I no. Micah was. Iron oh, yeah, I was on Iron Lord's podcast oh, okay. once, but so okay. we've never actually yes. done a last stand episode together of any kind. We haven't linked up on the like spoiler cast or anything like there just hadn't been a time where it overlapped. And so we finally have had the same schedule and could be on the same episode. That's crazy. That wow. really is. How did that? I Now I'm wondering, too, like now the mind is is going racing. Like, I wonder if there's any other iterations of people that haven't really mixed yeah. and chris has only been on like i think once actually you and chris together all right yeah. so that's another one we have to keep in mind because yeah. that's a mm-hmm. nice every every that's the cool thing about lsm like any which way you cut it it's cool it's interesting mm-hmm. there's chemistry cool, yeah. there's personality there's a lot of you know there's variety that was the other thing too cog that i wanted to say to you before you go it was really What's nice up? i knew sav lord sav a little mm-hmm. bit we met before but the mm-hmm. other guys the other iron lords i never met so that was Ooh. nice about the New York City event, Sacred Symbols 300, yes. is meeting all the guys finally yeah, face to face and cool, being able man. to spend a little time with them. They're too amazing. What an amazing crew. Much yeah. love. Yeah, that was dope. Super yeah. dope. So, yeah, m- much love. And also, guys, look for it when the LSM 300 show goes out for everybody to check out. For those who couldn't be there, Cog and the Iron Lords open the show to give about 45 minutes to an hour, right? You guys did a nice, big, yeah. fat, meaty opener. Which I didn't get to see because we were in the green room. A lot of us didn't even get mm-hmm. to see it. So I'm looking forward yeah. to seeing that too. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. And the, and the love was felt again. Shout out to LSM community. So much love, man. It, it was hard. I got emotional. I was just like, because at the end of it, you know, you, you haven't, I haven't done a live show before, honestly. And it's kind of like our first run at it. And you never know how it's going to no. go. But um, to see the people, you know, after the show and really, you know, having a good time and appreciate what we do. And some people say, hey, I never even heard of you guys, but you guys are hilarious. Like, like I got to find out what's that's going on. That was so cool. That's great. And I, yeah, I spoke to Colin and I want and all of you just to, you know, obviously to trust us on, on your platform was meant meant a lot, you know, kind of thing. So yeah, it, it was just a magical night. Awesome. And plus, of course, being a native New Yorker in the city, I used to go past that theater so many times as a kid. And then say to say, hey, I'm going to be actually performing and doing something in any capacity there was super humbling. So it was a full circle moment for all of us. And we really yeah, appreciate no, it. Yeah, no, absolutely, dude. And well-deserved. You know what I mean? But yeah, it really came full circle. The fact that it was in New York made it extra special, of course, yeah. for what you guys. Definitely. So that was that was amazing. 
Well, listen, dude. I hate to see. I hate to see you go. I really kind of wish you could say maybe blow off the meeting. I'm not. I'm not trying to get you fired. <laughs> I want you to buy a G. I, mean, I could give you my martial arts thoughts. I don't want to mess up Dave, but I know you got a structure in the order, <laughs> which you know. <laughs> All right, and then there were three. I don't know if you guys know Agatha Christie, but ten little oh. Indians. Yeah, I used, I'm to watch, uh, I used to watch a lot of Agatha Christie uh, uh, murder mystery, the, the TV shows, actually. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. I had an English teacher, I want to say it was in 10th grade, obsessed with musical theater. I think he's still there. I got wind that Mr. Folks is still at Bellport High School. Musical theater, but also just any kind of 50s, 60s television. So introduce us to Agatha Christie vis-a-vis the books and then whatever radio plays and then eventually television. Incredible. Mm-hmm. That's when I realized Agatha Christie, like writing mystery as, as somebody who writes, I don't know how talented I am. I don't know where I am on the talent hierarchy of writing, but writing a mystery, that is impossible to me to even comprehend. Like writing an actual mystery with and setting all that up, you almost have to be a writer and also like one part police officer and one part criminal, like that's a combination of talents. That's, you know what I mean? Gene, I don't know. Does that speak to you as a writer? Like, how do you write a mystery? Actually fool people, have a resolution, have a reveal, right? Set it all up. I, I, never I don't know. A, that seems so I've complicated. I've never written a mystery before. I could not, I could not even comprehend how to write one. It's a lot. Honestly. That's uh, a lot. I, 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 I actually got my start in creative writing. Uh, and that was how I got interested in running. Because, because you know, a little known, known fact, but I'm actually named after Eugene O'Neill, the playwright. Um, so. Oh, yeah. You mentioned that before. Yeah, I yeah. I've mentioned it before. So it, it, was, it was always a bit of a creative writing bug, but I never wrote anything. I, I, I wrote superhero like stories, basically. I wrote video game stories. Sure. Yeah. That's yeah. still still that that's a good kind of segue into mystery, which I think is just a little more complicated, right? Because you have to fool people, you have to entertain Probably. people, but you also Probably. have to have the, yeah. the, them fooled, right? But you have to know. I don't know. I don't know. But listen, Micah, I want to talk to you about transportation. This is a, what I love about this topic is the way Gene set it up was was super cool. But you could take this in any myriad of directions, you know. So. Get, talk to me about transportation. I know you drive. Did you get the new car yet? That's what I wanted to ask you from the outset. Yeah, uh, no new car yet. Okay. Uh, it has just, we just haven't had time to get us mm. both down to the dealership, essentially. It really is just like, yeah, I already know what car I want to test drive and where I want to go. And just having an afternoon where Colin and I are both free to go has been impossible. And it's <laughs> it's just it's something going on every weekend, essentially. You know, it's one of those things. But transportation for me, starting out, we're going to start out as a child. When I was a child, stilts, because it counts. I loved stilts and walking around on stilts all over the house. My mom would be like, dinner's ready. I'd get on my stilts. I'd walk into the kitchen. All right. That's In where the it house. started. All oh, right. Yeah. I mean, she was pretty lenient with that. Um, But we always, my sister and I had the Razor scooters when we were kids. Those were huge. My dad, being around our same height, would always take our scooter for a turn. And, you know, he'd be going around the neighborhood with it. We had, I did try to skateboard at one point. It was when Rocket Power was a very popular TV show for children. And I had the Rocket Power skateboard. I was really bad at it. I was too afraid of falling to actually like really try type thing. So I would kind of like go up and down the sidewalk. I'd go around my driveway, but I was too scared to really try and, and do anything more than that. I was a big fan of like Tony Hawk as a kid and like Ryan Sheckler and all these cool guys. Nice. But at the end of the day, I was like, I'm too scared. You know, seeing a neighbor, you know, break his arm. I was like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do any of that. After the skateboard came the unicycle. Because one of my classmates had a unicycle and somehow I thought I'm coordinated to learn that. I was not. Uh, I tried my best, but I never learned how to unicycle. That's one of my great disappointments in life. That seems impossible to me. That seems like not even possible. This girl was so cool. Her name was Jocelyn. She was just like, just uh, this is really cool kid, right? And she would unicycle to school and her unicycle had... In like the spokes was like a red and white swirl, like a hypno- like a hypnotizing swirl. So you'd see her coming down the street with it. And like, I just remember thinking, oh man, I want to try that, right? My mom ordered me a unicycle from 
it might have been like the Discovery Kids catalog. You know, it's one of those weird toy catalogs. You know, you can buy a telescope, you can buy a rock and mineral set, you can buy a fucking unicycle. She still brings it up, though. Is one of my one of my most hated things about like parents. They still bring up the when you were 10 years old and you said you wanted to try something and then you didn't like it. And it's like, yeah, that's how life works. You know, I'm 30 now. I'd like you to stop bringing up that I couldn't actually learn how to unicycle. You sold it at a tag sale. Okay. You got your money back. Got your money back. Okay. (laughs) But that was the next thing. And then obviously, yeah, cars. I didn't get my first car until I was 24. I just couldn't afford to have one. But my sister's first car is the one that I tried to learn how to drive in. She had a 96 Mazda Protégé. It was all beat up. It was full of sand when we got it because it had been through a hurricane in Florida. Uh, oh. it, was, it was a real mess of a car and it was a uh, standard. So she learned how to drive stick. When it was my turn to learn how to drive, she tried to teach me and I was just dreadful at it. I couldn't get the coordination of not looking down at the shifter to like see where you were going, but you can't look away from the road. So I just could not get it. It was one of those, it was too much at all at once for being a new driver, I feel, because I was absolutely not comfortable on the road at that point anyways. And then you're telling me that I have to use this like fucking magical st- like stick shift and you got to use both feet. And it was, it was madness. It was absolute madness for me to try and learn all that at once as a 15 year old, right? So I never did get the hang of driving stick shift, but then I learned how to drive in my mom's car. I think at that time she had a Nissan Sentra. She had a lot of cars over the years, some of which were very nostalgic. She got this Oldsmobile when I was seven that had three seats in the front. So my mom's oh, sister and I could all sit up front and I adored that car. The bench it was seat. just so cool that we could all be up front together. We're going through the drive through like that type of stuff was awesome. She later on had like a Saturn view. And these are just the the brands that I miss. You know, Saturn dealerships gone, Pontiac yeah, gone. gone. Um, and just the specific dealerships she bought the cars at. You know, a lot of them are just out of business now in my hometown. So those memories of her getting that Oldsmobile, that dealership is now a Dollar General. It is not oh. even there anymore. So things like that are just very nostalgic to think back on. My current car, which I will, I'm a little sad to be considering replacing it, but it's time. Uh, it's a 2017 Honda Fit. I adore that car. It's, you know, it, it doesn't have the most get up and go, but it's peppy. It's it's fun to drive. Easiest car in the world to park because it doesn't matter if some asshole took up half the space, your car still fits in it. It's just one of those, I really do like the car. It's yellow, which just makes me happy. My number one thing buying a new car is I have to have a fun color. So I was looking at, you know, Colin and I were talking about what kind of car do you want to get? And I I wanted a Subaru. That was like my first choice anyways. But then he's like, well, did you look at, just to compare, did you look at anything by Mazda? Did you look at any of these other brands? And the number one thing though was they don't come in fun colors. I'm like, (laughs) yeah, the Mazda CX-3 is cool, but it only comes in black and white and silver. Like, who wants that? Yeah, like, boring colors. Well, that's the thing. I'm like, yeah, this, you know, I did not actually want it, but it's like, yeah, this Audi wagon is nice, but you can get white, black, or silver. Like, that sucks. Very I'm not conservative. Mom yet. Yeah, very conservative. I, I yeah. just, uh, I want a nice, bright color. If it doesn't come in like blue or orange or yellow, I don't want it. And so that was just one of the things of I like a car that looks fun. Also a car that's easy to find in a parking lot, uh, being on the shorter side of things, you know, oh. getting on my tiptoes. It's a lot easier to spot my yellow car. I only need to see like a little tiny bit of it to, and then be like, there it is. It's over there because it's usually the only yellow car. Yeah, in you could see that thing from a mile away. Micah, your current car, your Honda Fit, that yellow, that bright yellow, do you know what the factory is? color name is. I'm fascinated with what cars, what car manufacturers call their colors, oh. but that's got to be something fun. I would think. I, I it's actually like a yellowish don't even with a think it is. Thing. I think it is just called yellow. I'm Googling it now, it but really? I, I think it was just called yellow because I, yeah, like Subaru, the one that I want is Oasis Blue Pearl is the right. name of the color. Pretty but color. when I bought this, yeah, it is just listed as 
yellow. In 2016, they listed it as mystic yellow. Mystic. But the 2017 that I'm looking at here just says yellow. Oh, and I believe that's what it says on just like on the title. Okay. Um, but yeah, it, that was actually funny because a lot of people think it's green. A lot of people always tell me it's like a, like a highlighter green color. It's got a instead. tinge, but it's but It it's does. But it is because it's, it's not like that Camaro yellow. It's not a dark yellow. Right. It is like a lemony, bright yellow. And so I do love it. I'm going to miss it when it's gone. I was hoping that Subaru was doing orange this year, but they didn't except for the cross track. And it's not an orange. It's not a, like the bright pumpkin-y orange. It's like a, the like a shiny, like burnt orange kind of. Um, okay. Okay. But yeah, when it comes to cars... I, I have only owned this one. I'm going to be sad to see it go because this car and I have so many memories. I mean, that's the number one thing I thought of with Gene's topic was this car and I have gone on such an adventure together, you know, being able to drive down to Virginia uh, back and forth when I was still living in Mass and Colin and I were dating long distance, for example, you know, driving home to see family. It really is like this car and I have done a lot together. And also getting over like a fear of driving those long distances, getting over, you know, being anxious about doing a road trip like that by yourself type deal. It was a really big step for me in gaining like independence, just being able to say, yeah, I can do this nine hour drive by myself and it's going to be OK. You know, that was a huge deal. That's and a so big thinking, drive. Yeah, <laughs> that's a big one. And, you know, it's the other side of it is. uh Part of why we want to get a new car is just get something that's more comfortable for Colin to be in because my car is tiny and mm -hmm. anyone over like 5'11 is going to be a little cramped in there. It's perfect for me. I have the seat as far forward as it'll go. But for someone uh, a little bit taller, it's not an ideal ride. So we just want to get something with a little more space, a little more leg room. Uh, Gene talking about travel. This is the most I've traveled in my life, having done our trip to Boston a couple weeks ago, trip to New York, and then next month going on a road trip to a wedding. Yeah. Usually in my adult life, I've done no more than like one or two trips in the entire year. Where's so the having, like, this is crazy. South having, Carolina, Gene. Oh, oh yeah, that's yeah. Right, yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So having these three trips all like in the first quarter, you know, it's like pretty wild for me. It's a lifetime of travel. These places. Well, right. Colin and I were actually counting out how many times I've flown. And because I think our trip to New York might have been like my 10th flight in my life. Okay. And, and I just mean like in the overall trips, not coming and going. That would be oh, okay. more like 20, right? Right. But this was only like my 10th trip by plane, which is... It's it's we're adding on to them very quickly with all this these things we're doing, but I am starting to get burnt out on it. Uh, planes freak me out, anyways. The airport is just an annoyance, you know. But their alternatives from here aren't great. I'd rather fly than drive, for example. That's a given, depending on how far it is, because at the end of the day, driving is just you have to be alert the whole time. You have to be on the whole time. When you're flying, you get to the airport, it's a hassle. But once you're on that plane, it's somebody else's job. You're going to land at your destination. You're going to be good to go. When you're driving and it's a nine-hour drive, you're just stuck doing that the whole way. And you got to be on the whole time. So that's just a different level of stress, really. And having totally. to with that. Yeah. But I don't really want to see an airport again anytime soon. We still haven't taken a honeymoon. And I honestly That's am right. so burnt out on travel. I don't even know if I want one <laughs> at this point because I just feel like I've done so much already this year and we're planning future live shows. And I'm like, man, oh man, the introvert in me is just like turned into a raisin and I'm just ready to shrivel up and, and disappear. Yeah, but maybe you guys take one of the live shows. Like I'm thinking of the next one that you guys are proposing. And you just tie that in with a with a with a little honeymoon, or maybe like just a honeymoon starter. It doesn't have to be the actual honeymoon, but just going away for a few days. Tag it, you know, just kind of put them together. See yeah, how that goes. That know? is a consideration because yeah. all I wanted as well, like what I was planning for a honeymoon, anyways, was just a weekend in Vegas. Like just give me three days away. I've never been to Vegas as an adult. That was really all I had in mind, anyways. I am not equipped to do like some big trip like we're going to italy for two weeks that's just not 
what I want to do. But that is a consideration Colin also had of maybe one of these live shows, we will actually hire the dog sitter for a couple extra days and just stay a few more days in whatever city we get to. Yeah, why not? That's the easy way to do it. I do have to mention too, though, we went to went to New York for the live show. It was my first time ever being in a taxi, like a real taxi, not an Uber. But the taxi that we took from the hotel to the airport on the day we were leaving, the man would not stop farting. And no. it was, and he had the window down, but it was not helping. Colin wasn't really getting as much of it as I was because I was sitting behind the driver. What? He was just farting the whole 30 minutes. What do you do? I just he knew you guys anything. knew the whole thing. It was just out in the open. Well, they were silent, but it it fucking stank. Oh, in there, they were silent. Like, it That's... was so gross. It was clearly. It, he was him. old. All right. He was old, speaking French and farting. <gasps> oh, the whole French way. And okay. I was just like, I can't, I, I was like, I never want to be in a taxi ever again. This is bullshit. I mean, it was funny. He's making a case for Uber. Like what's happening? I know the Uber to... driver has never farted in the car, I've but this old man anymore. taxi driver was just letting him rip. You know, he's on oh, the phone dude. the whole time speaking French to his wife or whoever it was. It was just like, as soon as we got out of the taxi and Colin was like, well, New York taxi, what do you think? I was like, he wouldn't stop farting. And he wasn't getting any of it because of the way the, the crosswinds oh. were going, I suppose. The guy had both front windows down, but it was funneling it to me. All right. Holy it really wasn't shit. helping at all. But so Colin, Colin didn't, didn't even know. Single whiff. No. Oh, my God. So Colin didn't even know. Yeah. I mean, you, you, we're fighting for the medallion right now. The yellow cab is dying. This guy's out there just kind of putting money in Uber and Lyft's pocket by, you know, acting by farting. <laughs> from from <laughs> Manhattan to LaGuardia. Did you guys fly out of LaGuardia? Yeah. So that's a little bit of a trip. It was. It was like 30 minutes. Yeah. The other thing too was Colin was like, do you want to hail the taxi? And I said, no, because that looks scary and I don't want to do that. And then of course, so Colin's standing at the curb with his arm out, whatever. I don't want to do it because every, he makes fun of me. Every time I try to practice hailing a cab, I look like I'm like signaling Hitler. And I don't, I don't know what you're, I don't understand the nuance of sticking an arm out and it doesn't look Hitlerish. I, I don't know how to do it. Though. I don't I love have it. Practiced. And that was why I was like, I'm not doing it because it still looks Hitlery when I do it. But so he sticks his arm out at the curb and this guy who is like at a red light, you know, several cars away, he's waving to us from the taxi. So Colin's like, we got to go. And he starts booking it with the luggage. And like, we're just in the middle of all these cars trying to get in the cab before the light turns green. And I'm just like, I hate it. I hate it here. Everything about the city, everything about this situation. I don't like it. I don't want to be here. And then the man started farting. So So it really, it started off like I already didn't like it. And then the man was like, if you you don't like that, get ready for this. And then he was just like, that was my whole ride to the airport. I had never been so happy to be in an airport because it meant I was no longer in that taxi. Oh, man, that sounds like a night. I'm sorry that was your first experience. You know what, Micah? (laughs) My kids had a first experience, like really negative experience with a New York yellow cab two years ago when they were little. We got in a cab with them. I don't know. It was like a day in the city going to the Natural History Museum and stuff. And I said, much to Helene's chagrin, like, let's just hop in a cab. And this was still when Uber was relatively new, like ride sharing was a new thing. So Helene reluctantly gave in. We got in this cab and it was like angriest cabbie I've ever seen. Like he was so, I don't know what he was upset about. He was clearly having a bad day and he was just racing to every red light and stop sign and just jamming on the brakes. Oh, the, no. I had to hold the kids back. Like it was such a violent, aggressive <laughs> ride to the point where I, I had to say to him, I was sitting in the front. They were in the, they or I was in the back. Helene was in the front. I was with the kids sort of in the middle, holding them back. Had to say to the guy, listen, can you like calm down a little bit? This is the first time the kids were in. You know, they were like four and seven or three and six. Like they were little, you know. And the guy wouldn't stop. He wouldn't relent. And we were oh, going okay. like 40 blocks. Mm-hmm. It was the, I was like, never again. I think that's the last time I ever had my kids in a cab. So not as, not as, not as unappealing as the farting guy, but the angry cabbie. Yeah, man, that was, uh, there is a very, I don't know if you got this, Micah, you spent, that's a pretty long trip from Manhattan to LaGuardia. There is that Seinfeldian thing of feeling like you're in a movie, like the guy is driving so dangerously. Maybe your seatbelt's on, maybe it's not. 
but you almost feel like you're watching. It's at a body. Like if this guy gets in, an, it's almost like watching a movie. Like you're not really in that, in that cab racing through those yellow lights and stuff. Did you get yeah. that? Oh, th- this guy drove like a maniac, which, you know, when we got out of the cab, Colin's like, that guy was a really good driver. I felt, you know, confident. And I had said, it's not that I was like not confident in his abilities because the man was like, literally, he's like stopping on a dime. He's weaving through traffic. You know, people. he's like weaving around pedestrians who are jaywalking like he was not waiting for them. He was just like, get out of my way. I was confident in his abilities, but man, that was a scary ride. It felt like I was at Six Flags for those 30 minutes because it just was like, I am a defensive driver, but I'm not weaving around cars. I'm not, I'm not like that type of driver at all. And there's no attempt to be smooth. There's no attempt to be elegant. No, that's the thing. Like it was no, he did not care. He's like slamming on the brakes constantly. Like, it just was no. It was quite the ride, and part of why we ended up taking a cab was because when we landed in New York, we tried to get an Uber, and mm. we could not get one. Mm. You know, it was just we we got one guy assigned to us. We waited five minutes. He never moved. Cancel oh. that. Get another one. Wait five minutes. Car did not move. They're like there was just, and it's it yeah. was just like all right. So then we just end up going to the cab stand. First cabbie, pretty decent. No farts. The second cabbie was the one who. Drove like a maniac, stunk up the whole joint, but it was, I felt, I did feel safe relatively because I'm like, this guy does this 24-7. Yeah. Oh, he yeah. doesn't want to get in an accident, sure. all right? It's, it's the same feeling as when I'm afraid on a plane and I'm like, the pilot doesn't want us to crash, except for the Malaysia, you know, airlines guy, that guy wanted to crash. But the pilot, generally speaking, does not want us to crash. He's going to do his best. That's all I got to tell myself to feel better is the cabbie doesn't want us to crash. He wants to do his job and just get me the hell out of here. Sure, but sure. I'm not a fan of it by any means. I, But I also didn't want to drive myself through New York oh. City traffic. I mean, my only experience driving in New York is I have gone over the George Washington Bridge because that's on the course from going from Mass to Virginia. That's George a biggie. Washington Bridge. So I've done that a few times, but that yeah. is the extent of me driving through New York. I've never driven through like downtown Manhattan or anything. And I certainly don't want to. These people I think you could do it. Maniacs. Micah, you did the George Washington, which means you were on the, th- you were on the major Deegan, is that? But you were on the connective tissue between the George Washington and New England, like 80, 86, whatever that is, right? So no, you were on the Cross Bronx Expressway. Like that's one of the most hazardous um, like segments of road in New York. I think you could handle Manhattan. I mean, it's I'll not take, as bad as you think. You just have to go slow. That's what I don't like. I'll take highway over city driving any day. Like I hate going down to Richmond for anything mm. because it's full of one way streets. They it don't is. wrap around back. You miss your turn. You got to go down like five other streets to get back. I can't stand that. Yeah. Driving on the highway, much more comfortable. I mean, like anything that's highway driving is easier than, to me than dealing with city driving. I That's that. just a, a dislike for sure, but I'm not used to it. I'm used to highway driving back home, but city driving is completely something I haven't hardly experienced at all. And yeah. so my few trips to Richmond around here, having to do various things, it's always a, I hate it. I always, as soon as I enter the city, I'm like, oh, I don't like it here. The intersections are weird. There's pedestrians everywhere. That's the mindset you got to get into. Yeah. You're white knuckling it. Yeah. It is true. You're right. I mean, it's a different ball of wax, high speed versus, you know, constant red lights and stop signs and foot traffic and that sort of thing. I mean, you know what you reminded me of, Micah, (laughs) with the unicycle? Do you guys remember, have you ever seen pictures of those old timey tricycles with the giant front wheel? Oh, penny farthings. I hate them. They're horrifying. But I have a recurring bad dream where I'm on one of those things. And it's probably really hyperbolic. Like I feel like I'm on one of those, but I'm like two, two to three stories up and I can't figure out how to get off of it. So I'm like trying to lean against a building and hop down onto a like a garage roof like i have this recurring dream where it's like the logistics of trying to get off one of these and um i don't even know where it came from but those things what was the i don't know if it was the, was that like an actual proper form of transportation or is that some carnival thing 
I'm not clear I don't on know. that. I mean, there's so much there's enough old timey pictures of it that it seemed like people actually bought these unironically, like, yeah, it's my bicycle. But why? <laughs> why? Why? Though they're terrifying looking, first of all. And then just the practicality of it. Why does the bicycle need to be so big? It's ridiculous. I don't know. I have no idea. Yeah, was it like well, you talk about stilts too. It seemed like if you watch an old movie like, I don't know, Gangs in New York or something. There was definitely something about the fashion, especially men's fashion back then, where they seemed to be, the clothes were tailored in such a way to make the guys look like they had very long legs. Like that was the look. That was very now, like combined with probably like shoes that made them taller, but the it, the, the high hats, right? Like the, I guess you would call it, what would you call that? Not a derby, like a you know, whatever, like a magician's cap type of oh, thing. Oh, like so, a top hat? Yeah, like a top hat, you know? And everything was tailored to make it look like they were short-waisted, but had these great long legs. So maybe it was something like that. Like there was a lot of weird shit going on in the 1800s. That tricycle is one of them. The other thing you reminded me of, Micah, is driving stick. From the time I started learning how to drive, my dad insisted. I don't know why, because he didn't do it to the other kids. But he insisted that I learn on a standard. And I did. And it took me, it was painful, but it took me like a day or two to get my sea legs. And then I got better over the course of a week or whatever. But I remember having to buy my first car once Helene and I got married. And I was so resentful having to go buy an automatic transmission because we had to share a car. We didn't really have to. We've always had our own, his and hers. But her thing was like, we should be able to share both cars. So you have to go and buy an automatic and it was my first one and I, I remember feeling so like oh my god because i love it's, a, it's just a little more driving experience driving the standard with the clutch with the stick you know it's just a little more i like to drive here's the thing about driving love to drive if it was just me and the open road i would i would never stop driving it's just driving with other people i just don't want anybody else out there you know what I mean? Like I want a world where it's just Dagan, my machine, the Autobahn, and every like a zombie apocalypse. Like no one else. I don't want yeah. anybody else. You know? That's the thing. I love to drive. It's just that people, they're driving. I mean, aggravates me is I mean, my road rage is a lot better than it used to be. You mellow with age, but it scares me because I love Gene picking this topic. It's almost like he knew. I was just telling Micah before we started the show today. My daughter, our daughter, our oldest, just turned 17. She got her license. She has her first car. So this is on my road, my on my mind constantly. You know, it's really because now she's independent. She's got her own wheels. Here's the thing that we were, this was in the offing and we changed it at the last minute, which feels better because my first car was, let's see, it was a 1987 Plymouth Horizon. I was like Gene. I was a late bloomer. So I was like 19 when I got my license. The car cost 800 bucks, had a bad transmission, and I think it was missing like two hubcaps. Cosmetically, this thing was a mess. It was just a rusted out, just, just a shell of a car, but it was functional. And I was just thinking that was my first car. And then they incrementally, as I got older and made a little more money and stuff like that, got a little better and better. So I was... I guess the way things were going, sort of the the trajectory was that I was going to give my daughter my car, which is an Audi. Now, it's not a top of the line Audi. It's eight years old. But the thing about it is it's an Audi. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like It's my first German car. I'm ready to move on and get another car. But I was like going to give her this car. And not only, it's not the fact that it's an expensive car. It is a relatively expensive car, but it's also... I lovingly, I took care of this thing lovingly. And I love my daughter, but she's not going to care for it like I did. I just know that from the outset. The second thing is very low mileage on it. Like I bought it around the time I started working remotely. So I never really put a lot of mileage on this thing. So it has a high trade-in value, especially now with the used car market. Used cars are very, nice used cars are very desirable. So I was like, I don't know, like where, if I give her this car, it's kind of like half my pleasure to do so. But the other half of me is like, where is earning this? Where is starting at the bottom? Where is driving a hoopty? You know what I mean? And just, you know, eventually kind of upgrading. Like, 
a normal thing. So I always felt a little weird about it. And then at the last minute, my in-laws swooped in and were like, we're going to give her one of our cars because they're getting older. They really don't need two. And it's ironic. It comes full circle what Gene said. It's like a 2015 Hyundai Elantra. It's a nice car. Um, very nice car for a first car. But they kind of they kind of stepped in and saved me for having to spoil my kid rotten because I didn't really she she's in a weird one. I don't know what you guys think of this. She's gonna be going to school next year. So she's got another year of high school. She's almost certainly going to school in Georgia. We already know that. She's not gonna bring a car down there. She's gonna be in Savannah. So it's like, do we get her a car now just to sit in the driveway? You know what I mean? Can we keep it to two cars? Do we get the third car, but just get something used? So my in-laws stepped in and sort of answered our questions for us. Now, it was expensive to insure, but we didn't have to pay for the car. So it worked out. And it also saved me. For, it saved my Audi because I was a little worried about it. And it really kind of, I, I think it's a little too entitled to like step into a car that's you know what I mean? That nice. I think you gotta, you kind of got to get there. I mean, she's not even that. She's still learning how to drive, right? I mean, she just got her license. So it worked out fortunately. But yeah. And, and you know what? She's a good driver. She's really, she's really good. I just, you know, she's, she thinks it's fun. She wants to go pick up her friends. She wants to blast the music, right? She, she has to decorate the car. It's all stickers and baubles and things hanging from the rear view mirror and the, the pink steering wheel cover. She's having fun. But it's just like, all right, but you got to you gotta kind of double down on just be responsible, you know, be alert. And I tell her, not everybody's a good driver like you. You kind of got to drive for everybody when you're out there. Got Like Micah said, you got to be defensive. Got to be a defensive driver. So that's the one thing. The other, other thing, Gene, that I was thinking about with transportation was back kind of when I was on my hiatus, I had a car be- before college. Sold it when I went to college and then kind of got back, got wheels again after I graduated from college. But college was my time where I didn't have a car. And my I lived downtown. I lived in Philly in a big city. So my skateboard was not just for my entertainment, but it was for it was my primary source of transportation. And I remember, dude, it's so crazy to look back how how much mileage I put on that those skateboards. Um, you know, it's just a plank of maple and four urethane wheels and a few bits of hardware. It's like that thing. I remember being like in Philly, if you know the city, down on like Front Street, like down on Delaware Ave, Penn's Landing, and being on one side of the skyscrapers. And then I lived in the art museum area up north. So I would have to get home and I would skate, you know, whatever that was, four miles from Penn's Landing to the art museum on the other side of Ben Franklin Parkway in about 25 minutes. And I remember being home, being back home at my apartment complex and looking and being on the other way on the other side now of those skyscrapers and doing it all on this little thing, on this little plank of wood with rubber wheels. Like it was, it was insane how, I mean, I wish I had an odometer over that four year period to see how many miles I put on my various skateboards. It was pretty incredible. And I remember like being that age, being 20, 21 years old with my board and feeling like a great sense of accomplishment. Like skate, I just covered four miles and whatever was a half hour and crossed this city on this little toy, essentially. You know, it was like, it was pretty incredible. And it was a cool part about what you guys were saying too, about living in the city, what Cog was saying about living in New York, where it's almost inhibitive to have uh, have a car in a place like that. You have to park it. You pay a great cost to have it in a parking lot or a garage, right? On the street in New York, it's opposite opposite side of the street rule. So you're constantly moving it around so you don't get ticketed. It's just better. It was cool. In other words, it was cool to have that period of time where I wasn't kind of saddled by having a car. But I like, I kind of enjoyed that period of time, but I really do like having a car. It's just, it's just crazy out there with the way people drive, you know, and it's not just in a big city. You see it everywhere. There's something about driving, which is just like, do you got, the other thing is before I turn it back to Eugene, I love this topic. I think about this all the time to, to a weird degree. I think like I, I was saying, we took our son about an hour away to go shopping yesterday. So it was an hour there. And then, you know, a few hours at the spot and then an hour back 
So the whole journey, this trip, like 30 miles away, took like an afternoon, you know, but I was thinking on the way home, and I think about this constantly, like what did people do if, if I had to walk this, if I had to do this journey on foot that I just did over the course of like, let's say five hours, it would have taken me two days. And then thinking like, what the frig did people do before the car came along? Like think about people used to go from Richmond, Virginia to Boston in a horse-drawn carriage. You know what I mean? I don't even want to go from Philly to Boston going 85 miles an hour. Now you're going 15 miles an hour in this uncomfortable buggy being pulled by a horse. Like it's it, it's mind-blowing. I think about it all the time. Like c- the convenience of a car, having a car, it, or even if you don't have a license, having a bus or ride-sharing services or you know planes, trains, all that kind of thing. It's incredible. Like I can't, I almost want to travel from like, let's say New York to Boston in a horse drawn cart, just to see what the hell that is like. Like it's something that our minds can't even fathom. And I think about it constantly. Like what, what if I had to do this on foot? You know, what if I had to do this on horseback? It's like, it's crazy. I'm like really fascinated with it. And you know what the other thing is? I never rode. I never I don't think I've ever rode, like ridden a horse, like just I, learned how to I ride. I haven't, no. No, I've never done that. I've, I have. You have? <laughs> yeah. That's I a guess, big uh, thing on Hawaii, in Hawaii, isn't it? It is, it is. Yeah. Well, well, my former PR, when I was a PR, uh, PR executive or whatever, my, one of my former clients was Turtle Bay Resort, which is a hotel uh, featured in Forgetting Sarah Marshall. That's right. Um, just and, watching uh, that. We do have horseback riding on the beach, so that would always be like an ideal date uh, to bring. You know, like hey, let's go more, let's go north and, and ride some horses on the beach. You know? it, it looks like hard, Gene. Did you, you ever go, get Micah, good at it? You, right? It looks difficult to me. Would you go, Micah? If I if I asked you out, if someone if, if some handsome if called and asked you out on a date and said, hey, you want to go horse riding? So I am afraid of horses. I have been for many years. Are you? Call- oh, terrified of horses. They're so scary. But Colin recently, so our dog sitter works at a horse farm and Colin has ridden horses in the past. And he said, we should see if they do just like any little trail rides around here. Yeah. That would just be a fun afternoon. And I said, I would try it once. I I, yeah. I would try it. I don't want to completely swear off horses because I think that they mm. are beautiful like intelligent creatures but they're so fucking scary at the same yeah, time yeah. horses to me are sharks i think they're really cool all right mm. but they're also i don't want to be near one but i don't want to completely <laughs> write off that experience i i admit that in my 30 years i have not done very much i'm not an adventurous person so that mm. was it colin just asked me last week would you go horseback riding if they have that around here like for people to just go for an afternoon i said yeah yeah, that's something we could try. So it's a maybe. We're going to see if any of the local go. horse farms either do trail rides locally or if you can just, you know, pay a fee to just ride around a little corral for an hour or whatever. Yeah, honestly, but- you should just do that. You should just do that because that that's fun and it will make you real, feel real comfortable. Uh, that's where the horses are comfortable too. So that that's where they would be most at peace. Uh, there's no, you know, surprises that might speak out your horse or whatever. <laughs> Um, and, and of course, you'll also have the, 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 the trained professionals nearby, too. And I think that's a good way to kind of like get your feet wet, I guess, in terms of riding a horse. I haven't ridden a horse in years, so I don't, I don't even know what I'm talking about either. So I, I'm only saying that because, because I've been around professionals who, who made me feel comfortable uh, riding a horse. So I mean, I've played enough Red Dead Redemption. I really yeah, exactly. should be comfortable riding a horse. However, mm-hmm. I had many incidents where my horse got hit by a train. So mm. reality, I wasn't a very good horseback rider. Even in video games, I always cut it too close. <laughs> mm. And there's also there's also in Ghost of Tsushima where uh, the the attack button is the is usually to get on the horse button. So most people who play Ghost of Tsushima always slash at their horse. That's yeah. unfortunate. Uh, which is unfortunate. <laughs> Um, yeah, great topic. I'm glad to he- to hear from everybody. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about other forms of transportation. I, I mean, I've written, I've written because because I'm from the Pacific Islands. I've done a lot of boats, you know, oh, from canoes, never a boat. canoe. Oh yeah, so many boats, uh, oh, ca- canoes man. to kayaks, uh, so as small as that, on like on a river to all the way to a U.S. Coast Guard cutter. 
which is awful oh, uh, wow. because because uh, they're they're like football shaped at the bottom, so they're meant to be they're kind of swaying back and forth all the time, which is awful. It just that it must just be hard. feels so terrible. That that was the most sick. I never got seasick, but that but I actually got seasick then on a U.S. Coast Guard cutter, small tiny ship, terrible. I've been on fishing ships. Uh, I haven't been on a cruise liner, but I have been on uh, on a uh, nuclear powered uh, navy aircraft carrier. I spent three nights on the USS Ronald Reagan. Which wow! Is a great time, great time. It's it's basically a city in, in an ocean. Um, it's got it's got a food court. It's got a museum of Ronald Reagan inside of it. Um, really fun stuff. But, were yeah. you out at sea on that ship, Gene? I was out at sea. We, we, wow. we were doing we were doing war games. I was not part of the navy. Uh, don't want to have stolen valor here. Uh, I did put I did join the navy GROTC, but remember I covered the military, so I was cover right. I was covering war games out in the pacific um and i i was basically able to just join along and just watch them uh, just you know f- fly planes out i got to land on the air i i fl- I, fl- I i didn't get on the aircraft carrier we had to fly onto it which is crazy wow you know? via so plane or helicopter it was via plane yeah so wow. we, we, we were quote unquote cat launched off 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 a runway so it's like a big rubber thing that launch like like launches the plane like like fast and then you land on the aircraft carrier and like it'll catch you like like as you're going in too that's so you incredible. really you really gotta you really gotta like strap in like really really tight and like hold tight otherwise Holy because you're, you're going from like zero to like 300 miles per hour like immediately you know it's yeah. like literally breakneck speed so holy watch out. shit that Good is stuff. amazing and that was yeah. a con- like a uh, carrier is never by itself. So you were part of a convoy of other ships. Exactly. There, there were there were other carriers around. Exactly. So That's it, incredible. It, yeah, th- 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 these were war games. They they were practicing uh, uh, going to war basically out in the Pacific wow. Ocean, and I got to join along. That's cool. China's right shit. there. China China's right there. Yeah. So you know, um, but yeah, oh I, I haven't been on a fighter jet. No, I don't want to be on. I don't want to be on one. I don't I think, know if I can handle. I'm good on that. I, think, I feel like I'm pretty good on that one. Yeah, I um, hear you on that. It would be thrilling, but the claustro. If the, if somehow the cockpit could be open, yeah. I'd be cool with it. The claustrophobia, I could. Yeah, it's just way too small. I could yeah. not do a fighter no jet type of thing. Um, <laughs> I've been on a helicopter, but I, I but I certainly didn't like the experience. No. Um, yeah, it's 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 fucking scary to be on a helicopter. Yeah. Is it? I never been. Helicopter yeah. was an absolute no. When we were planning the wedding, uh, our venue has a, a helicopter pad, and they're like, "That's one of your options for your grand exit. If you want to book a helicopter, they can land it here, and they'll take you to because we were going to stay at the Jefferson. They're like the Jefferson's one of the places they could stop at. Oh, wow. And Colin's like, "That sounds really cool." And I was like, "Absolutely not. There's no <laughs> way." I will ever be on a helicopter. Like that's too much. We're how not much doing that. We're gonna get a town car. Did you did you even ask how much was it? Or did you I did, didn't I didn't even the, inquire. The, like that. The conversation is not, didn't even go that far. No. <laughs> you just knew. My fear of helicopters comes from as a child watching ER. There's the episode where the doctor gets his arm like chopped off by a helicopter. It Ooh. started there. Okay, mm-hmm. that's where it started. I was way too young to be watching ER. I shouldn't have seen that. But then, of course, just being afraid of heights, it's one thing when you're on a plane and you're much more insulated away from the mm-hmm. reality of what you're doing. Mm-hmm. A helicopter with all the glass and you can just see everything like there's mm-hmm. just no reality. Yeah, it's a panoramic yeah, helicopter. The, the helicopter reminds you that, that you are uh, you are in a chair in the sky. Bro. Exactly. You know? Like. <laughs> on the plane, I can put the window down and exactly. almost forget what I'm doing. It so long as it's a smooth enough ride, you really can just like I'm just in a room. Mm-hmm. We happen to be in the sky, but it's a big yeah. room in the sky. Helicopter, there's just no way You're, that I can square are, I'm that just up. Sitting in a chair, and I am up in the air. Yeah, that yeah. Makes no, at sense. night. And you know at what? Night. I have I have to be honest. Because I tell myself this with a lot of different things. If rich people can't get this right, I certainly can't. I think Kobe, Bryant, Kobe come on. that's right? the thing. Yeah. I think yeah. of helicopter accidents for rich people, and I'm like, they had the best of the best pilot. I'm just hiring some random guy from Richmond. Are you fucking serious? <laughs> like Kobe Bryant's helicopter pilot biffed it, and I'm going to trust Dave from <laughs> Richmond? It's just like, it's not... Because it comes up when I I talk to Colin about the prevalence of like plastic surgery in our area. I'm just seeing now moms who have clearly had work done like at the grocery store and stuff. And I'm like, it's not looking good. 
And my rationale with that has always been, if they couldn't get it right for Tara Reid and these various celebrities, I don't Mm. trust some random dude from my state to get this right. Celebrities can afford the best of the best. And Madonna, look, Madonna looks terrible right now, you know? Dude, Madonna, oh, yeah. Top, that. Mickey Rourke. These Mickey people Rourke, could afford yeah. the best of the best, and they still got yeah. all jacked up. There's yeah. no way I'm going to trust some random dude from Virginia. That is exactly, <laughs> that is like, exactly no what, I'm, what I'm thinking. <laughs> too. I, I almost got into a helicopter uh, at the Turtle Bay Resort again, right? Because uh, I was doing the full experience the visitor experience right so we rode horseback we, we ran around in segways you know just like in final Fantasy seven um and then we we're going to do the helicopter tour and then i walk up to the helicopter and i see our dave of, of hawaii and he's just pushing the the, the rotor at the back and he's just going beep, beep, beep. And he's like i don't think we're gonna fly today I'm, that sounds good <laughs> that sounds good and i'm not gonna we're not gonna do it so oh my god yeah and you pretty yeah that, that's ex- when kobe crashed i was like yeah i'm not gonna get on a helicopter that's again, ever, you know? uh, the, why why didn't he have the best helicopter you know <laughs> things go wrong uh and and yeah and kobe bryant is fucking dead that's insane that shouldn't be that shouldn't have happened but it's yeah nuts yeah, that's the worst case for helicopter. I mean, that you, have you guys ever seen Uncut Gems? That has the best helicopter no. pilot character in it. If you want to see like a real character, but that's what it essentially is. Even in that movie, it's like a private business. You know, it's expensive, but it's it's just a guy who owns a helicopter and who's licensed to operate it. You know, any anything could go wrong. It's just like any other business. But that, that's you know what, Micah. I'm curious about that though. From your reception venue to downtown Richmond, I wonder how long that would have been in the oh, helicopter. At least I twenty minutes, know. I would think. It was well. It was twenty minutes by car. Okay. So I don't. I don't oh, know so how shorter. fast the helicopter goes. I don't know if they're pushing it like they are in an airplane. Like I have no idea how fast a helicopter would be. But no traffic, I assume. Uh, <laughs> you're not making a big like they're not making a big case for taking the helicopter like i understand like the rich like the jet set that lives in manhattan and wants to get to the hamptons quick and fly over all the traffic okay you're saving it's a two-hour drive helicopter it's 25 minutes whatever but a 20 minute drive to take the helicopter, it's okay i'll get this, i'll take the 20 minute drive you know yeah this was strictly about the the optics of it this was strictly for the looks of you're going to step into the helicopter in your finery and take off and none of that was appealing to me in the first place oh, you gotta be like a specific drama. person that's the oh, thing like it's about the drama, drama. of it all yeah. i was fine just we're gonna get in our town car and drive away that was a-okay that but was I, I totally can imagine the type of person who'd be like yes i want the most elaborate exit possible then you know what have the helicopter already in the air we're gonna climb a rope ladder up to it like those people would exist as well shockingly i'm not one of them so yeah because <laughs> because i i don't want to fly, fucking fly in a helicopter so yeah helicopters it seems like a technology that's no longer necessary <laughs> i i understand the vertical takeoff and landing i understand the convenience you know especially for medical you know like airlifting people to hospitals and stuff but Otherwise, it seems like an old timey. I don't know. There's just something weird about it. You know, well, something have you that seen, seems dated. When you talk about like life flight, have you seen the video? It was a couple of years ago. They, this woman is in like strapped onto like a stretcher, you know, and like wrapped in a tarp or whatever. And the helicopter picks her up and something happens where she just starts violently spinning. And like they couldn't do anything about oh. it. They just the helicopters had to fly away to the hospital. And oh the woman God. ended up with like, you know, vertigo. She was fine. But then they landed at the hospital. She was like all out of sorts because the imagine? fucking stretcher was just spinning like crazy in the sky as they're trying to fly her to the hospital. It, it was just watching it. It was that feeling of just like claustrophobia and like, oh, my God, I pictured myself in that scenario. And yeah, there's I just hope, nothing you can do. <laughs> I hope I forget about it in this podcast. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. It's just like kill me at that point. <laughs> just kill me. <laughs> just drop me. Just just cut the drop. rope and drop me because it would be better than what <laughs> hell I'm in right now. <laughs> For real. Yeah, just drop me. I'm like, that's it's, it's over. Yeah. 100%. You know what? The, the only other thing I'll say is there was a period because like Gene, I got my driver's license a little later. So there was like that two or three year period where my parents were like, if you don't want to get your driver's license, we're kind of, we're we're finished, like figure it out. And I had to ride my bike 
everywhere way too far in some cases. And that was part of the reason that I don't really like riding bikes anymore. And also realizing like, okay, this is incentive to actually get a set of proper wheels, you know, like an internal combustion engine. So I don't have to ride my bike. Sometimes I remember I had to ride my bike to work sometimes and it was probably like six miles. And I was just like, this is, and I did that for like a year instead of getting a driver's license. Like it was idiotic at that point, you know, but yeah, that was one of the reasons. And I still, to this day, I'd rather hop on a skateboard than ride a bike. It's very, uh, it really put me off bicycles actually. Yeah. Not, not a big fan of the bikes. Um, Gene, what do you think, man? Did we do your topic justice? Yeah. More than justice. Thanks so much, guys. All right. That was fun. All right, guys, I'm going to close this one out. I'm going to bring up the rear with a little, um, my topic today is martial arts. I've thought about this one a lot. And like we were saying the cog earlier, I think you could parse this into several different topics, but I just want to throw it to you in a broad sense. It's kind of an interesting one because I think with Mart, when I think martial arts, I think of two distinct sort of ways you could go. Right. You could have the practical experience. Did you grow up as a kid like a lot of us did taking martial arts classes, whether it was karate or taekwondo or jujitsu or any of the kung fu, whatever kind of thing you were into? Or there's, of course, the pop culture, nerd culture aspect of martial arts. Video games, of course, a big one for LSM. TV, movies, our introduction to martial arts as kids, what we thought was so cool about it. And did we have any practical experience growing up as kids or as adults getting into actually practicing the various martial arts? And then there's there's, a, there's so many different other ways you could take it with the popularity of MMA and all that kind of thing. Before I toss it over to you guys, I'll tell you that as a kid, I have, I, I still to this day as a 50-year-old have no practical martial arts experience at all. I was kind of interested as a kid, but there just always seemed to be something else that was taking up that bandwidth, you know, something else I was into. Although I was always sort of, there was always that part of me that felt like, oh, I would love to get into this. And I grew up in the 80s, so it was like a good 50% cross-section of my friends took some form of martial arts. Usually back then it was Taekwondo or karate. And I was always really interested. In fact, one of my best friends growing up's little brother, who I guess was like five to six years younger than us, became a black belt when he was 12, I think. He was the youngest black belt I had ever seen up to that point. And I was always fascinated with that. It's like, wow, like this this little guy, this little sibling of one of my friends, like had the endurance and the grit and the, the fortitude to like achieve this crazy thing. Like when you're a kid, you think black belt. It's like, oh my God, black belt. That's, that's incredible. It's like a movie, you know, that type of thing. And then I kind of always had this respite as an adult. I was like, all right, when I have kids, I never really got into martial arts and I always kind of regretted it. Maybe if one or both of my kids are into martial arts, we could kind of jump into it together. But neither my daughter or my son ever really got interested, although I would prompt them every so often like, oh, you know, East, you know, we had a couple of different karate schools, both independent and some chains. And I'd be like, oh, East West Karate, they're opening up a location right here. Like, are you interested? Maybe we'll go check out like a trial class and see if it kind of moves you at all. And they were always like, nah, not really interested. So I never really got a chance to get into it myself, but I always thought it was so cool. And I just think like when martial arts came on my radar as a kid, there was always that cool fantasy aspect. Of course, you know it's a real thing, but it just looks so neat on TV, right? Like I grew up with Channel 9 in New York with Sunday afternoon, that was Kung Fu Theater. So it would show all the old Shaw Brothers martial arts films and sometimes the Japanese stuff and sometimes the stuff from Korea and a lot of times the stuff from China. And you would get a taste of the various things like Kung Fu and karate. Sometimes a ninja would pop up. And then by the mid eighties, right? It was all ninjas. Like there was a ninja episode of everything. It was like, there would be a ninja episode of Miami Vice. There would be a ninja episode of Knight Rider. There was a ninja episode of the A-Team. There was probably a ninja episode of the Love Boat. Like it was just like ninjas (laughs) everywhere. So it was like ninjas are like, Ninja episode of the Golden Girls, like whatever, like ninjas were so 80s. And that was like my, that was like my dial into like Ninja Turtles. 
Ninja Turtle. By the time Ninja Turtles came about, ninjas were already so big that it was just everywhere, you know. And I was always so drawn to how cool it was and the mysticism and the talent and the physical prowess and all that kind of thing. But I never got into it. But I was always a fan, and you know, vis a vis comic books and like Gene saying TMNT and video games, Shinobi and Ninja Gaiden and discovering like all the Kung Fu theater, like growing up with Jet Li and Gordon Liu and just how cool it always looked and wondering too, like uh, these guys make it look so easy, right? Like you see these guys in the films, whether it's those, you know, low budget Shaw Brothers films or the high budget Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. It's like, oh, there's just some, there's something so cool about it and magnetic about it. And I also think from the West, it really has that exotic Eastern flavor. You know what I mean? It's it's sort of emblematically not a Western thing. It feels like something very exotic. So I was always really I was always really into it. And I still to this day think the the idea of a ninja is one of the coolest things ever. I mean the idea of like this cloaked masked assassin with all these exotic weapons. So cool. So I want to turn it over to you guys. Michael, we'll go ladies first with this. Martial arts, there's various ways you could tug, various strings to tug on for this. But um, primarily, I want to start with you and you take it in any direction you want. Have Did you ever grow up doing, practicing any martial arts yourself? No. So I always wanted to do like karate classes. It was always just one of those things you'd see on sitcoms, for example, but we weren't allowed to do those classes being Jehovah's Witnesses, you're not allowed to do anything violent. So we weren't allowed to do Taekwondo or karate, but it it was one of those things that I always did look, I was jealous of the kids in my class who, you know, they'd be getting ready for after school. So like at the end of the day, you know, here comes Gary out of the bathroom wearing his gi or whatever it's called. And he's ready to go to, you know, Taekwondo afterwards. And wow, it's like, you know, usually this kid's kind of a, kind of a nerd, but right now he's looking pretty fresh. But or they'd be talking about, oh, I'm, I'm going to get my blue belt with yellow stripe on it next. And like, wow, yeah, the collector in me was always jealous of these kids for collecting all their belts. And they had the rack in their room. You could hang all the different belts on that you got. Like I was always jealous of those kids, half of it just being the collector side of me who just wanted to rack up all these like visible points, essentially these little trophies that you could get. But um, as an adult, obviously, I love anime. I love fighting anime, especially. So Naruto, ninjas, of course. Um, As a kid, watching some movies with my dad, which I don't remember specific ones, but I remember being mesmerized by the movies where they'd have people like jumping through the trees, for example, and thinking in my head, wow, like, what if you really could do that? That was something that really sparked my imagination. And me playing in the woods myself as a kid and pretending I was jumping from tree to tree like they were in my dad's cool movies, for example, like that was a thing that really did just get my imagination going and saying, I wish this was real. Of all the things I saw in movies, that was the one I wished was real was these people jumping from treetop to treetop because it just looked so cool. So cool. But I also loved the comedies and the one that we rented the most was Kung Pao Enter the Fist. I brought it up on Wikipedia because I couldn't remember. It came out in 2002. We rented this so many times from Movie Gallery. This, If you haven't seen this movie, it's hysterical. Part of the charm of it is that it uses footage from a very old martial arts film from the 70s. And so they're using that footage with just a completely unrelated manufactured story on top of it. It's silly. They just had the dialogue is over the top. It's a ton of fun. And that's a movie that we rented countless times from Movie Gallery. Uh, And it was just if the new release that we wanted, oh, it's unavailable. Well, we'll go get that one. You know, it was just like a family favorite. No one was ever unhappy to see that movie come home with us. (laughs) And it was just something that, you know, in the realm of growing up a Jehovah's Witness, there's a lot of things that are off limits. And then there are these gray areas. So we're not allowed to do Taekwondo classes as little you know, kids, but we're allowed to watch this movie about martial arts. Oh. It, it was one of those things of like, there are always gray areas for certain parents of what they yeah. would allow, what they wouldn't. And that was one of the ones that because my mom just loves comedies so much, this movie was always allowed. We could always watch it. 
And it was just an absolute favorite that I still, my sister and I like still quote occasionally. Like, it's just one of those things that we, I always think of it fondly. It never got old. It wasn't something that one day I put it on and said, ah, I actually don't want to watch this. It never happened. And as an adult getting into anime like Dragon Ball Z and Naruto and just other, you know, fighting shows, like one of my favorite, it's just like a mini series called Bento. And it's about kids who are, you know, living in like a boarding school. They can't afford to get the bentos while they're like full price. And so every day there's essentially like a massive brawl to get the half price bentos when they're I marked down at the end of the night. What? And it's like a fight club situation of this. you got to be the best of the best if you want to get that half price bento, right? It's a really great little show. And Is it an anime series, Micah? A short? Yes. Yeah, oh, I watched I it on Funimation back in the day, which it. I assume now is all getting merged into Crunchyroll, I believe. Mm. But that's I really just enjoyed these fighting shows. Now, of course, not martial arts, but I was a big wrestling fan as well. But when you talk about like MMA, like UFC, that is where it's too real for me. I don't like that stuff one bit. I think those people are cool for what they do, for the way they like put themselves on the line. But God, I don't want to watch it. You'll never catch me watching a UFC fight or anything like that because I respect the craft and what they're doing, but it is, it's too real. It's hard to watch. I do not like it one bit to actually see it in real life. Yeah, it's completely different than the movie screen. It's completely different than the anime. There's nothing about watching Ronda Rousey get like punched in the face that I'm like, oh my God, I want to see that again. I, I don't I don't like it one bit. It, it's too real for me. Mm. Yeah, that's where I draw the line, honestly, is I enjoy martial arts in the entertainment and fiction sphere, but in real life, I respect what they do, but I don't want to see it. Like it's it's too much. And I like sanctioned martial arts like karate competitions different they're not actually like trying to knock each other out those can be cool to to see but then it's almost a little too sterile of it's like you know the guy like he hits the other guy in the arm like point stop reset you know then it's almost not exciting because it's so technical and you have to have a really deep understanding of what they're doing to appreciate that side of it so when it comes to real life martial arts, I've taken my nephew to his Taekwondo class before. Adorable. Watching the little kids, you know, doing their little punches and roundhouse kicks. A little scary when you realize, wow, that seven-year-old could have just kicked me right in the chin. That's a little, <laughs> a little off-putting. Maybe a reason to not put your kids through martial arts classes. But it was neat to see these kids experiencing that, how much fun they were having with it relive a little bit of my own childhood in a way to watch my nephew take this class and you know it just seeing him excel at something was cool too feeling pride in that like that one's my nephew you know like it, it was a cool feeling to to witness that because I'm obviously not a parent so I don't have much experience with after school activities and bringing children places but that was a cool one I've brought him to his, his class a couple times now and it is always neat to see the kids progression as well. Like, you know, you'll notice you'll be like, that kid kind of sucked a few months ago, but look at him now. He's really good. So uh, I I applaud the children of the world who are trying martial arts and putting their nose into it because it's intimidating for sure, especially given the different size ranges of children, even in the same age group. Some of them are so tall, so fast. Some of them are still shorter it's interesting to see the way that the instructors kind of try and pair them off in fair ways, you know, but that that's really my experience with it between anime, uh, comedies and, and, you know, watching them with my dad, the random movies he'd rent from the library over the years. It did really catch something in my imagination when I was a kid. And it, it, it is something that's like you said, Dagan, exotic even though we all know exactly what, you know, we all seen karate classes and all those various things, but it still has a, an air of mystery to it. There is something still just, it's very not American and we really love it. Yeah. I mean, that it's well said. I mean, there is a cool blending of fantasy and reality with martial arts. I think in, you know, our current era, that's kind of unlike anything else. As you were talking to Mike, I remembered one of my daughter's best friends is a black belt like many times over. I think she received her black belt much earlier in her teens. 
And you forget because she's so unassuming and you would never think, but they're also taught to be unassuming. You know what I mean? Like it's all, it's all part of the mantra and the philosophy of, I think, humility, but also the, you know, the whole thing of know, knowing something without having to have it on display all the time. You know what I mean? That whole thing. It's a very, there's something really like I felt like, I still feel like I missed out on because I love that. I love the kind of philosophy behind the whole thing. It's not just the physical, it's, it's, the, it's everything they're taught mentally and, and with balance and all the kind of things they're supposed to include in this kind of training. We're really kind of a mindset, right? It's not just a, a weekly or a biweekly class. It's like everything you're supposed to embrace as a human being. It's, it's super cool. Gene, I want to turn this over to you. You know what the other, other thing, I don't know if you guys could speak to this. And, you know, I think it goes along. It may even go along with the the popularity of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I remember when my kids were little, there was some school doing a demo. I'm not even, I want to, I wish I knew what style of martial arts it was. But one of the selling points was to this specific school or this specific movement was that once you get a certain amount of experience and once you get to a certain level so like once you get to a black belt but maybe like a black belt with so many tips you could then start your weapons training so if you want to learn kendo if you want to learn the katana the staff the sai whatever maybe nunchucks was a part of it i'm not sure about that but it was very in step with ninja turtles and it was it was a selling point it's like once you get to a certain point you could be donatello it felt like they were saying that like once you get to a certain point you could be Raphael. So that was a, always a very cool, and even it had me hook, line, and sinker in my twenties. You know, it was like, oh shit, I want to be, I want to be like Donatello. I want to be like Leo. You know, that type of thing, which was which was kind of cool. But definitely, kind of probably, I would imagine it was always like that. But with the popularity having a pop culture tether to it, they could then say, oh, like kids are going to dig this because they love watching turtles or reading the comic books or whatever. Now, Gene, I know you have a little practical experience with martial arts, although I don't know the details. So I'm excited to turn it over to you. Give us, uh, give us your whole your whole Gene Park take on martial arts. Yeah, well, as most pretty much all of you should know, I am Korean, so I did take uh, very early on. Uh, I think when I was in the second grade, about when I was seven years old, I took Taekwondo classes mm. uh, and. Taekwondo. I wish Cog, I wish Cog was still here because he can talk about like the fighting game characters that do do Taekwondo. Because a lot of them are in Tekken now, but they were also in King of Fighters uh, and Fatal Fury. Kim Kapawan is uh is, is kind of a, a hero to us, a, a Korean character. And oh, that's also, awesome! Uh, I didn't realize that character was Korean. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, well, he's Kim. Kim is the last Kim, name. Kim. Yeah, that would make yeah. sense. Um, so Kim Kapawan, you know, I mean, my name would be Park Eugene, right, or Park Jean, uh, stylized in Korean. So, uh, yeah, I took Taekwondo. I only went up to, I think, a green belt. Um, and for those who don't know, Taekwondo is very kick heavy. It's not even very spiritual. It's just very, it's just much, very much about fighting, you know, and about kicking people. And, 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 uh, I, I did, I did katas even. I even, I, I remember practicing katas where, where we, we, we called them forms. So we called them form of something, something. And, uh, these would just be basically memorized, uh, of movements. Um, just basically kind of a choreo- choreographed dance, right? Um, and we would have to remember them. But gosh, I remember uh, it was absolutely probably the strongest I've ever been <laughs> as a human being when I was seven years old. Uh, I used to be pretty strong. I used to break wood all the time. Oh, wow. Um, you know, it was very kick heavy. I used to be very, very flexible. I used to be able to completely do the splits. I can't even touch my toes right now. Um, but I used to be able to just completely do the splits, just like completely, just like my legs would just be completely uh, like, like vertical, you know, cause I, I, would be just like a master of like doing the high kicks and everything, but you know, you know, you're young and you're just flexible. Yeah. Um, it's also when I had my first beer, um, cause, cause, uh, that, that was the, you know, we would have our parties, uh, we would have our parties right after class and it would just be like. 10 year olds and we just have like coolers and we just have beer in, 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 in there. So we just been drinking beer after class, you know, I, I started drinking very, very early at a very, very early young age uh, to the point where I honestly don't remember uh, uh, when my first drink was. Um, but yeah, did Taekwondo and I, and then after I, I got bored of Taekwondo and I did uh, karate Kempo for a bit. 
um, and that one was more um, fist heavy, a little bit more, a little, little bit of judo mixed in. Uh, that one I didn't get very far. I think I only made it to the second level. I don't even remember the color of it too. Uh, but uh, man, I distinctly remember the gyms that I used to go to. Um, my old uh, sabunim, the, the 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 which we would call the take our our sen- basically sensei in, in Korean sabunim. Uh, you know, was pretty toxic. You know, I, I wore watches, and he'd be like, and he would call me like a homophobic slur. You know, he would be like, <laughs> like oh, only only this kind of person would, would be wearing watches. Why are oh, you wearing what? a watch? Where is the wearing a watch? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, it doesn't. It didn't make any sense. He, he, what, he is just he wanted Amish? to dress. Uh, I don't know. He was Korean. He was just he was just dressing us down and, and kicking our ass. Amish martial arts is something um, I need to see. <laughs> Yeah, like right I, I remember. I remember doing. Uh, <laughs> I remember uh, sparring. You know, uh, that was always fun. That was always something to look forward to. Actually, I, I actually really, really enjoyed it. You know, I remember winning some. I remember losing some, but it it it, it definitely felt. I definitely felt like I was a martial artist at some point, you know, because because I because you're you're trying to block and you're trying to like anticipate movements. It was so much fun. Um, I never really messed with any kind of weaponry. Um, uh, we, we did have bows and nunchucks at, at the Kempo class, but I didn't really mess with any of them. Um, and I think that's about it. That's, that, that's really about it. Uh, as I got older, I got busier and I just stopped going. Um, you know, uh, I kind of replaced a lot of that with Navy and JRTC in high school. Um, so a lot of like the physical training and the kind of sort of discipline, disciplinary uh, training that you would get. Um, there wasn't a lot of that in the martial arts that I got. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't a very spiritual practice. It was definitely more to learn how to fight, uh, even in karate. Um, we didn't really mess with any of that stuff. Uh, so that's why any kind of mysticism that, that you were talking about, it wasn't any of that. It was we were we were just learning how to fight. Um, there was more mysticism in the Navy ROTC, you know, in terms of, in terms of trying to make, <laughs> in, in terms of trying to make sure that you know that we're that our that, that our shoes were clean, our our, our hair was high and tight. And uh, you know, like all of our belt buckles are, are clean and everything like that. There was just definitely more uh, in terms of making sure that there was more discipline there. Um, and then I, I, and then I was fairly fit too. Uh, you know, you know, we used to do push-ups every morning and go running every every day too. And I, I did field training exercises as well. Um, and then shotguns too. And that was always fun. But um, yeah, that was basically my the, the limits of uh, the martial arts. Always got into fighting games afterwards. Um, Hell yeah! You know, dude. Uh, but 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 my interest in martial arts predated pretty much everything. You know, it, it was just it was it, it's like a piano lesson. A piano lesson. You just get a piano lesson. You get a martial arts. You know, it, it was before Ninja Turtles. I mean, it's part of why I got into stuff like Ninja Turtles or Street Fighter too, because they they were into martial arts. But I was already kind of familiar with that stuff already. So like when I saw like the the the, the movements in Street Fighter Two, I was like, oh, I used to be able to do that. You know, the the high kick for for that that Ryu does when he when he kicks like completely vertically, that was the kick I did. You know, that's so, so cool. The, so, and that's why Street Fighter is very much like a mixed martial art kind of, uh, kind of thing. You know, um, and that's why you're you know. Uh, uh, what's his face? Bruce Lee. <laughs> what's his face? Bruce Lee uh, <laughs> was able to, to basically become the creator of martial, mixed martial arts because he he's able to mix Taekwondo because uh, Taekwondo is very limited. You don't really use your arms a lot. You know, right. It's, it's kind of closer to soccer. Um, and you definitely, you even defend with your feet too, you know. Um, and then when I lived in Hawaii when I was growing up, I did, I was pretty close to the mixed martial arts scene because we have a pretty big MMA scene there uh, with BJ Penn uh, who is a very, very prominent and uh, well-known champion of, of the UFC. Uh, he's from there, and he had a gym there. So I used to hang out with a lot, a lot of the guys there. I'm actually f- uh, friends with uh, the Spider Kendall Grove from UFC as well. Um, and yeah, I used to go to like MMA tournaments and, and, and just watch that stuff just passively. I wasn't really, I wasn't really following any of it. It just, I just like to be around people fighting, you know? Uh, and it, it's just, it's just cool to be around, but other than it's that, so though, cool. like the, you know, my, my, my experience is, is more than you, you guys, but that, 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 that's how far it goes. So. Yeah. But you, you're right though, Gene, you admire it. Like you admire any other professional athlete with that level of talent. I love that you remembered to bring up Bruce Lee because that's such an important tether for generations to introduce, mm-hmm. you know, he's one of the main components of introducing, I would say the larger, 
idea of yeah, karate yeah. in the West. He is the guy that introduced martial arts to the world. You know, he really he, did. He made it. He made it cool. He made it look look cool in the movies, and he did <sighs> tournaments and and exhibitions to show how cool it was. Is there and anyone cooler it, than know? Bruce Lee? I mean, yes. honestly, Jackie he's like, Chan. No, <laughs> no, Jackie Chan's no, no, Jackie Chan's a weirdo. Remember, uh, he, no, he's, but, he's, he's he's kind of a misogynist. Oh, For is that, is that age, what's happened? Though, is he canceled? Like, Oh, uh, basically, he, but he, 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 he was like, that. he was like, I don't want my daughter to do this or that or no, blah blah blah. He's like, like very, very like tra- tra- trad man. Oh no, yeah. guy, you know. But oh, for Jackie. people my age, because as you were talking to you, I remembered as a kid, whenever Jackie Chan would pop up in some random kids show or something, we'd yeah. get really excited. Like it's Jackie Chan, sure. And yeah. I had to look up the year. It was in two thousand that yeah. Jackie Chan Adventures came out, mm-hmm. which was the animated series about an archaeologist and martial arts expert, Jackie Chan, yes. uh, who <laughs> opposes e- evil forces while hunting down artifacts. And that was just, I remember actually buying, I think it was like a box of Cheerios and it came with a free like episode of Jackie Chan Adventures on a DVD that mm-hmm. we got. It was you know, just random stuff they used to do like that of like trying to get kids hooked on everything. It's like here's free toys eBay. in the cereal, free yeah. DVD in the cereal. But Jackie Chan, uh, regardless of how uh, he's perceived these days, when I he was a kid in the, the early two thousands, yeah. like, 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 you he, couldn't he, avoid he is, him. He, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, no. he's he's an incredible world world class talent, of course. You know, uh, and he's so influential. I mean, the, like you know, every, Dragon Ball is inspired by Jackie Chan. Oh, hundred percent, you know, dude. And even Akira Tar- Tariyama was like, if anyone was going to play Goku, it, it, it would have to be Jackie Chan. But we missed that boat already, you know, because that, that's not going to happen anymore. But a young Jackie Chan would have been the perfect Goku. You know? Yeah, definitely um, Jackie Chan, Bruce Lee. I would put Gordon Liu in that same thing. Jet Li, like Gordon these are the Liu, ambassadors. Course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned it, the Shaw Brothers movies, of course, right? Sure. So, oh, dude. Yeah. The, the the ambassadors. I mean, first of all, the log line for you just you just said for that Jackie Chan cartoon it's 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 Indiana Jones with karate like hello like th- yeah they should have become trillionaires many times over like somebody should have thought that was of a that good decades. show I did I did re- I really I did really love that show it was it was so much fun that's incredible I have to find yeah, that. I used to watch that and James Bond Jr all the time oh, oh I, I don't remember, remember that. that one you don't remember James Bond no. Jr oh my god I'm looking that yeah, up yeah, James Bond's kid you know <laughs> I mean, how many kids, guys, like over generations via Naruto, Dragon Ball, Street Fighter, all the video games were like to karate to be like, sensei, when do we learn fireballs? Like when is fireballs yes. going to be the, it's like, when do we do the disappearing? When do we do yeah, the fireballs, yeah. smoke bombs? Surprisingly. Yeah. Surprisingly. Again, like I, like my, my education predated all of that. Right. So it was, it was pretty cool. Like I it even predated me reading Dragon Ball, which is very, very early. But again, like I read Dragon Ball because I was like, Oh, martial arts, you know? Um, and also I remember you, you talk about black belts. I, I, I was not a black belt, but I definitely remember looking at the black belts. I'm like, Holy, oh, shit, dude, black look, at, look, look at those, look at those high level dudes. You know, they're, they, they are, they're level 99 right now and I'm level 15. That's crazy, you know, and they weren't that much older. And these are just kids, too. These are probably like 14, 15 year old kids. But for my seven year old ass, they were like basically adults, you know, they were basically senior people. Yeah, Which dude. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these were the kids in the lunchroom who were like, oh, like registered his hand as a deadly weapon. Like, don't mess with that guy. He's a black belt. <laughs> like black belt was like up here. Like you were on a yeah. pedestal. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it does yeah, mean yeah. something. But when you're a kid, it means like. That guy's there, was like, a, there was this kid I really Bruce fucking Lee. hated, uh, who was also a, a black belt. Also, and I really, I, I maybe I'm trying to re- remember whether I joined martial arts to try to beat him, beat his ass because I just really didn't like him, you know. And he because he was also smart, and then and then here he is also being a black belt in martial arts. I was like, come on, dude. Oh, that's not fair. All. Yeah, it's not fair. That's it's, too it's much. ridiculous. You know, he, he has he has everything handed to him in his life. Did the ladies love him as well? Because that's just uh, unthinkable. Not really, because right. he ended up marrying his his high school like girlfriend. So oh, okay. He just didn't like. He just really didn't do anything. He just he just you know that kind of guy. Just okay. All right. Live the oh, life. And just, yeah, that guy sounds you know, annoying. I don't like him. He's, he's, really <laughs> he's really annoying. We all the, hate the, fact, him. the fact that I still think about him to this day is fucking crazy. So. You know. <laughs> I keep talking about I I, I, I I still know what he's doing, you know. I know exactly what he's doing, you know. <laughs> you see him on Facebook, you could ch- kind of chart him on Facebook. Uh, yeah, Facebook no, no, he's he's on my Instagram and Facebook. I know exactly. Uh, I'm I'm more successful than he is to be to be quite clear. That's so so matters. so so there's that. Gee, the, you the, won. The, I eventually outlapped him, but it took a minute. So. Okay, but you won. 
I don't know if I'm happier than he is. But, <laughs> <laughs> but where, is, where does happiness fall in the grand scheme of things? Anyways? Exactly. Who needs to be happy when, 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 when you look good? So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the appearance of happy is more important. Just keep purporting that you're happy and it, yeah, it'll exactly. be fine. Well, you know what? You bring up a good point, Gene. I can't understate the importance of my generation of Karate Kid. Like the first Karate Kid movie, mm-hmm. the franchise right, yeah. to a certain degree, but the first film, you know, about, you know, basically not only karate yeah. and tying in the mysticism and the fantasy with reality, but it, it becomes was Karate a Kid that thing did that. Yeah, over. Karate Kid was really, really the one that did and, and Three Ninjas. I love that movie too. Oh, great movie. Oh, uh, great movie. Yeah. Yeah, probably, that's probably the film that took up the baton from Karate Kid. There probably wasn't much in between there that was. Live about kids, doing, kids doing martial arts yeah, yeah there's not a lot yeah not a lot not a lot more animated more video game but not you know and of course anime but we we really weren't hipped into a lot of the anime until that until the 80s if you were even lucky so yeah man martial arts i mean it's interesting i still probably look at it the same way i remember in just becoming a huge martial arts film buff Kind of getting a little older and noticing there was a distinction between certainly the Korean and the Japanese, which you already knew from growing up, but between Chinese Kung Fu and Japanese Karate and just identifying Kung Fu and and being alert of the differences that it was so elegant and fluid and it just looked so cool. And Karate I remember thinking- more, Karate and Taekwondo are just more, more rigid. I mean, we're all just copying Kung Fu. I mean, See, Kung Fu is the originator. Kung, right? Kung, Kung Fu is- We all come from China. That's where Everything's really born out of that. Stuff. Yeah, everything's, everything's born. born out of China. Yeah, which is which is interesting, and you could China, see China it. is our Africa for Asians. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a great way to put it. Why did I never think of it like that? I mean, I'm, I'm sure they came from Africa too, but it, but but after that, though, you know, the culture is born out of that. Place. Yeah, a lot of it come. A lot of it comes from China. So but I look so Chinese. Beautiful. A lot of people think I look Chinese. Uh, you know, Koreans think I look Chinese. You know, Koreans do. I would say I would my family think thinks I look Chinese. You know, they're like they're, 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 my family looks at me. They're like, "Why do you look so Chinese?" What they might be trying to tell you something, Gene. Yeah. But, and but, you know what, Gene? By contrast, here's how not diverse the place that I grew up was. I had someone say to me once, "Are you Korean?" There's nothing about me that looks Korean. Wow. I don't believe. And I, I was just like, no, That's I'm crazy. black. Like it was, <laughs> it was one of those things of like, just being literally the only non-white employee at this entire department store. You know, I think there were two of us at the time that weren't white. And it was just having someone be like, are you Korean? That's it's like, incredible. Yeah, like, I really had a moment of like, she, I don't. I mean, she can't be black. In my head, I was like, I don't think there's anything about me that looks remotely Korean. That is really odd. So like this person has not left the county, I don't think, in decades. They just didn't know what they were looking at. They're like, this woman here is so exotic. <laughs> you, know, exo- you know, it's really funny you say that, though, because the, the, the consistently, and I say this, I hear this from strangers all the time, but consistently, the person that I am always, the celebrity that I'm always compared to be looking like yeah. is Wesley Snipes. <laughs> Wesley yeah. Snipes? Yeah. Because we have like similar like like bone structure. Like, it like works if you, though. If, if you look at our cheeks and our and our chin and our like our nose, because I, I have a pretty big nose, then you, can, look at you, you kind of see it. Obviously, I'm not black, but you I'm know. Bring up a picture of Wesley. Well, bone, Gene, the, you, know. you, you got the swagger. You have the unexaggerated, the, no, the exaggerated swagger, the exaggerated of, a swagger black of a black teen. teenager. <laughs> Gene, you know what? I see it. I see it a little bit. I would never thought right? this. I do see it too. I was like, you're crazy. And then I looked at it. I was like, actually, you know what? Like, I, when I totally he has started. glasses on and I have a yes. picture of him right here with yes, glasses. He's also glasses. A giant Just imagine time. if he's, he, he's a little bit more, you know, like <laughs> yellow skinned and then, yeah. I see <laughs> it. Good looking guy, by the way. He's a, good, he's a handsome fan. He's, he's a, aging he's well. Dude. Yeah. He's not that old anyway, really. Um, yeah. Oh, but with Kung Fu, when I started to get interested, and I had a couple of friends in martial arts, jujitsu mainly, and I, I would tell them like, oh, you know, like I'm kind of interested in Kung Fu. I love how elegant it is. I love it's different. It's a little more specialized. You certainly see it a lot less. They all told me to a person like Kung Fu, not only because it's it's a little more rare, there's a little less places to do it. But a lot of places won't take you on unless you speak the language. So unless you speak Chinese relatively fluently, you won't really get they 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 won't take you on as a pupil. And I still to this day don't know if that's true. So if there's anyone out there listening that knows about this stuff, can I as an American, English speaking, 
ignorant human being be able to take, can I take Kung Fu classes at, you know, again, it's, it seems like Taekwondo and karate are still the big things out here. Now, Jiu Jitsu seems pretty big too, but you don't see a lot of Kung Fu, although there's one out here in the suburbs, not too far away. But if you guys know about that, let me know, because I always found that interesting. I know it's a little more rare here, but I would like to think that somebody interested who doesn't speak the language, doesn't speak some form of Chinese could still take it. But I was always told that. You know what I mean? If you're in the United States or North America and you want to take Kung Fu, good luck. They're not going to take you on unless you speak, you know, Cantonese or Mandarin or whatever. I so, mean, if John Cena could learn Mandarin, Dagan, I'm pretty sure know you it? could too. What, wasn't there that video of him like fluently was like apologizing in Mandarin? Like, he, I, have to look, it, I don't know. About and that him. man's been hit in the head so many times. Really so has. if he can do it, Dagan, really I'm sure has. that you can too. There's hope. I like. I like it. I like that. There's hope. Yeah. What do you, What do you guys think? You have any parting shots on uh on martial arts and all things martial arts? I mean, shout out to the ninja man. I mean, is there? It's so it's so freaking cool. And, you know, if there was a you know what gave me hope when I was a kid? Remember those American ninja movies? I don't remember the name of the actor, but it was basically a white ninja. He was a Caucasian ninja. And it was the first time I, it gave me hope as a, as a white man, you know, that, that we, could, we could be cool too. <laughs> well, here's the thing. There was the, the, you know the video game Sifu, right? Uh, it, was, it, it was a martial arts game from an indie, in, indie French company, right? I gotta look and there up. was a bunch of journalists who a really good game, really really difficult game though, very very okay. difficult. So don't even try it if you if you're into if, if you're into not difficult games. <laughs> uh, but uh, Sifu uh, was made by a French indie company, uh, really really great game. But then there were some journalists who wrote about, hey, this is cultural appropriation. Like, what, what why aren't uh, you uh, talking to a Chinese uh, martial artist or or whatever, right? And it's like, but they did talk to a martial artist. He was a black belt and he's a master in France. Uh, yes, he's French, but that's not the, the point of martial arts is not to make sure that the that the only that we're only talking to the Chinese guy. The point of martial arts is to proliferate it. You know, when when we see white people become masters, that's excellent. That's that's the best way to that's the best way to go about it. Yeah, that's it, the, the whole point is to be for it to be appropriated by other cultures. You know, um, which I was like. This is clearly not written by a martial artist because, like, you know, like if we're, if we're supposed to be celebrating the fact that there is a master of that level in France that that, that they they can access to to be able to teach, and he is given he was given the, the permission to put to 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 be the proponent of martial arts. You know, sure, he's literally yeah. given permission. He has the license to do it. He has a black belt, and he is a sensei. Isn't he is that meant enough? to teach other white people how to do this. You know. So, so what is that? Is that like, gatekeeping? I, I, like, is that like, gatekeeping or something? You know? That's why it's like, you know, all, all of these articles about representation are like so surface level. It's like, dude, like just think about it for a little bit more than other than, you know, just looking at the surface of it, you know? Oh, sure. Yeah, because Gene, wasn't it? Do you remember there was that like, I think it was a PlayStation event and they had this man playing yeah. some instrument the and they were basically upset that he wasn't Asian. But it mm -hmm. turns out that this man is one of the few people in the world that is a master of this instrument. And yeah. it's like, so what? We just think he we shouldn't have him out here at all. It's like yeah, this guy yeah. is master of this rare instrument. And we're just going to be like, well, we can't have him. Exactly. It, it was like silliness. Like the, honoring the craft is what's important and exactly. not who was behind it. It's like this guy is one of the few people in the world that can play this thing. The, the, yeah, dude, has, <laughs> the dude has paid his dues. You know, uh, he, he is a master and respected in Japan. And and he comes here, and then we just have all this nonsense. Like we try to apply all this nonsense to to it. Ridiculous, you know. Like, can we just like take a couple of seconds to calm down and just think a little bit before we before we hit publish? That's all I'm asking. Never. <laughs> that's all. I'm, that's all I'm asking, folks. You know. Stay Anyways. angry. I say stay angry. I like yeah. all this stuff. This I have more. To, I have more to say about about a, a similar topic next week. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> My Food this Sifu game schedule. looks amazing. I don't know how oh, it never crossed already. my yeah. radar. But the only problem is in the West, it sounds too much like seafood. I think people could mistake this name as seafood. You got to be careful. It's not seafood. It's Sifu. Well, it's pronounced Shifu. So. Shifu. Yeah. All right. I like it. Well, listen, that was fun. I think I think there are different ways we could 
tackle this topic later. And who knows? Maybe I'll start my Kung Fu classes and uh, I'll let you guys know how that's going. <laughs> Thanks. You know, I could pretend to be, the, you know, you'll be like, I'm bringing my niece with me to class. I'm short enough. All right. And we'll just take the classes together. If I have no makeup on. Yeah. All right. And I wear like my Hello Kitty outfit. I, I could pass for 12. You could, you could pass as like a little 14 year old girl for sure. Oh, man. Yeah. I, sickly Victorian girl. child. That's my look. I can handle yeah. that. I'm very it. tiny. So <laughs> I love that idea. Well, let me ask you guys this. Is it too late? As an adult, is it too late to go, go in and start a martial it. arts class? Do it. No, do it. no. Do beat it. up those kids just like Kramer would. We're all at you the same skill I, level. You know what? Maybe even <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking about it, you know? This has been on my I, mind I, for longer than most things. Right. As a kid, as a 10 year old, I was like, why am I doing karate as a 20 year old? The same thing. Every decade. It's like, why am I not? It's I'm interested. Exercise, yeah, but don't that's don't get it for thing. self-defense. Uh, for that, I'm going to buy a gun. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's that thing too, right? It's yeah. like, it's like Indiana Jones fighting the swordsman. It's like, he just pulls out the gun. Yeah, you know, but it's not for that. That's what you got to remember. It's not you're not doing no, 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 no. For that. It, it, it is a, the kind of, well, well, what you talked about earlier. Just kind of this, the, the the ability to be able to kind of center yourself spiritually. You know, through Love through it. training, through exercise. You know, it works absolutely. Yeah, I could use that like, just for that balance, just just for balance, and just a hobby, just an outlet. And now what's good is a, is a good thing. So to, yeah, and, and to have a goal to attain to. Imagine trying to be, become a black belt now, you know, and, and imagine imagine getting that now, how good that would feel. That's a great yeah. point, Gene. Yeah. Yeah, that accomplishment. Yeah, yeah, you know how many 10-year-olds I had to beat up to get this thing? <laughs> <laughs> well, Gene, you know, I know you That's were the thing. Like, like, when I When I got paired against other people, they always made sure that it was like like body and like age appropriate. So, you know, uh, I, I would fight like the other, like there there were like yellow belts that were older, but I didn't have to fight them. So, so they match you up. Yeah, or they, they match me up with other kids. Up. So. Well, it's been a long time for you, but do, do you remember anything from it? Can you recall or use anything? Like if Gene gets surrounded at the nightclub, can you pull out the Taekwondo? I could pr probably bust out like a move or two, but that's about it though. Okay. Um, <laughs> like, I, I, so I vaguely cool. remember some of the forms, the katas. Um, if I watch a video again, I could, I could probably just do it pretty easily. But, but then the issue is the kicking. I can't, can't, I can't kick that high anymore. Um, and not in jeans, that's for sure. I mean, in, what, depending on the outfit of the day, I yeah. mean, that's just half of it. Yeah, not in hard pants. Not a, no. not even in. It's a good excuse not to wear hard pants, though. Absolutely. So over hard pants, can't do it anymore. I have to go back to work in on site next week. I have to not only wear hard pants, I have to dress like business, prof you know, like congratulations. Business yeah, congratulations, by the way, Dig. Oh, I thanks, mean, dude. I know. appreciate it. It's going to be, it's a, uh, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. It's been a long time. It's been, yeah. since I was in the office that frequently, it's been at least five years, four days a week. But yeah, that's the biggest thing is the clothes. It's like, yeah, you, you got to put pants on. <laughs> <laughs> And button down shirts. Oh, it's a whole thing. Listen. Yeah, me too. I, since I've gotten better, I've been going back to the office and I've been like, oh, I should probably like diversify the clothes that I wear as opposed to like the same three shirts that I've been wearing for the, since 2020, you know? Well, what's your ratio home to office right now, Gene? What are you doing? What's your day? What's your weeks look like? I go in whenever I feel like it. Which okay. Is, which, is nice. like once or, which is like once or two, twice or three times a week. Um, okay. I, I go in often enough that they're not wondering where I am. So there's that. That's smart. Yeah. It's yeah. nice that they give you the autonomy and then you take the responsibility to show up three times. Well, right I'm now. also an employee there for nine years. If I was a newer employee, then I'm sure they'd be on my ass more. But, you know, because I've been around, I have a little bit more carte blanche to yeah, you earned fuck, it. Around, fuck around and do what I want. So I love it. You know. I love it. Gene Park, fuck around and find out. I don't know. That's just saying. I'm, I'm just, just old, I'm just an old head. That's, that's I'm just becoming <laughs> I'm, I'm just becoming institutionalized myself. That's what that's what's become, you know. Who is it? Who is it? Listen. I'm satisfied. We we spent hours and it was, I mean, the time goes so fast. I hope it goes so fast for the listeners too. That should just about do it for this episode of Constellation. Dad will be back imminently. We got to get the house in order, cover our tracks, get the Ferrari back in the garage. I had an awesome time as always. Let me kick it around to our esteemed guests once more for parting shots and goodbyes. Micah, make sure to turn the thermostat down, fill those vodka bottles up with water. Colin will be checking. <laughs> Goodbye, my friend. Goodbye. I want to part with this came up this morning 
from my hometown, uh, the police scanner, report of large beaver chasing cars. And somebody called that in to the cops. That's the type of small town shit <laughs> that I miss back home. Just getting all sorts of random things coming up on the scanner. But large beaver chasing cars takes the cake. That, I mean... Can you hear, is it just me? Am I just a pervert or can you not hear the word beaver and think of the other beaver? Can't. You can't. can't. (laughs) It's completely ruined. Poor beavers. I mean, they deserve better, but like, so was that like a Bart Simpson thing or was was there really a large beaver running around? Oh, 100% legit. They're a problem back home. You used to not be able to touch them, by the way. They used to be like, you conservation wise, you weren't allowed to get rid of them. They've oh. changed those laws because they became such a nuisance. But yeah, beavers are a problem back home. So from the funny side of it, you're like, yeah, but also terrifying to think about <laughs> it because they are they are very real. Yeah, they're weird. You never and you never see them. They're very secretive. Like they're they they're like foxes. You don't see you don't see a lot of beavers, but they're out there. And big ones, yeah, that's kind of gross with the floppy tail. I don't know. There's just something about beers I don't I don't dig. I just don't dig them. Gene, thank you for being Gene Park. We love you. The audience loves you. In fact, look, it's enough already. Stop being so goddamn appealing. How do you expect any of us to even compete? Gene, thank you for being on the show with us. I'm a little bit like Colin. I'm I'm very competitive. I I I, I'm, I want to I want to destroy anyone who's not cool. You know. So <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, thanks so much, guys. Uh, to, to, this will be coming out Monday, right? Um, yes. Yeah. So uh, on Monday, I have a really really uh, great story. So today, check out my my great story. It's a story that I've been working on for the last six months, and it's a story that um some I'm very very proud of. I actually turned it out really really well <laughs> and i don't say that often about my own work but but i'm really really proud of the story and i'm really really excited to, to see it published so check it out on monday or today but uh i'll see you guys around go read gene's story gene is the best we love him listen that's our cue constellation faithful as always we appreciate you thanks so much for joining in on the conversation hey patreon.com slash last stand media for that good good early ad free access you can pick up some fresh merch at laststandmedia.store level up that fit if you look good we look good thanks so much again for micah gene cog we miss him already and myself dagster moriarty thanks for being part of our family we'll see you next time sayonara constellation is a product of last stand media and collins last stand llc and is proudly recorded in the usa The show was conceived by and is directed and hosted by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-host is my brother, Dagan Moriarty. The show is produced by Last Stand's executive producer, Dustin Furman, and is edited by associate producer, Ben Smith. All Last Stand theme music is by Ramon Narvaez, and all of our graphics and logos are by Dagan Moriarty. As you know, all of Last Stand Media's podcasts, including Constellation, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest support tier, and we're infinitely grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. 